Attorney General William Barr is set to go before Congress and the American public for the first time since the release of the 448-page report by special counsel Robert Mueller about Russian interference in the 2016 election. Barr is expected to take questions about both the report itself and his own handling of the investigation, including the story The Washington Post broke last night that Mueller objected to the way Barr represented the special counsel's findings before they were made public. Good morning, I'm Emily Heil. You're watching live coverage from The Washington Post. We'll be bringing you the hearing uninterrupted. It's scheduled to start at 10 o'clock Eastern time. Here to set the stage is my co Washington Post colleague, Devlin Barrett, who has been covering the Mueller investigation since the very beginning and delivered a tremendous scoop last night. Devlin, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So walk us through the last 24 hours. Has the ground shifted before Barr's testimony today? This was al already going to be a high stakes appearance by the Attorney General. The stakes just got a lot higher in the last 24 hours because he's now not only going to have to answer a lot of questions about uh, what we already know, which is you know what the report says and, and what his letter says, but the new thing we know, which is that Mueller complained privately to him about how he felt his findings were not being fully represented uh, in the weeks that during which you know the people knew the report had, fi had been filed but it wasn't public yet. So he's going to face a lot of questions about that. Already the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee is calling on uh, the Attorney General to resign, to step down. Uh, that's unlikely to happen just because a chairman calls for it, but it shows the stakes of this now and it shows the intensity with which this hearing is getting underway. And what will Democrats be asking? Will they be focusing on that letter about what other contacts the two of them had? I think there's going to be a lot of questions about the letter. I think there's going to be a lot of questions not just about the letter, but also the subsequent phone call that both that, that the Attorney General and Mueller had to talk about what Mueller said in the letter. Mm -hmm. um, that's been described to me as, as not a particularly tense conversation, or at least maybe not as tense as the wording in the letter itself, but still evidence of how far apart those two guys are on this incredibly important question of how do you investigate the president and then how do you explain to the public what happened with the investigation of the president. And is Congress's concern here, is it th th that this uh, in some way contradicts what William Barr had told them before or is it just the substance that it happened at all? It's really what Democrats have been saying for weeks has is that Barr's public statements misrepresented in some fashion or downplayed in some fashion uh, what Mueller actually found. And this letter is the first sort of tangible evidence that Mueller may think they have a bit of a point. Um, <clears throat> now, senior Justice Department officials say that a lot of what the two talked about when they spoke by phone was actually a disagreement about, you know, Mueller's concerns that the coverage, the press coverage of this, of this report, when it still wasn't out, wasn't that accurate and wasn't that good a description of what Mueller had done. But wasn't that because it was being shaped by the letter? Well, right. The, presumably the only way you would have that concern about the perception is based on the reporting about Barr's own letter. Mm -hmm. um, so I think these two things are inextricably tied together. Um, but obviously one is a, is a, let's call it a gentler reading for Barr mm -hmm. than the other. And I think you know what we'll probably see today at this hearing is Barr trying to explain how he took Mueller's words and what Mueller said when they spoke directly after that. And one question I had reading your reporting is, is it unusual uh, to, to, memorial to memorialize your thoughts for, uh, for the special counsel to, to write a letter instead of just calling up uh, William Barr, which I know he did later, but to put those thoughts in a letter, um, I think is it, that unusual? I think it is unusual in, in a couple of senses. One, if, if the special counsel is going to write a letter like that, you know that that will someday become public in one form or another because you're essentially disagreeing with your boss's handling of your case. That's that's what that letter basically says. Um, so that I think is pretty significant that, that he wants to memorialize this disagreement. Um, two, I think it's important because um, what you're seeing is Mueller is, is leaving a sort of a record of his own view for a guy who never talks about anything. Um, memorializing it is important mm -hmm. and that that makes a big difference um, and so I think that's part of the reason why you know 
uh, people responded the way they did to the story. Uh, you say he never talks. Is there a chance that he'll he'll actually testify before Congress? I know there are calls from Democrats. They want um, not just William Barr, but Robert Mueller in the seat in front of them. I think given the letter, there's almost no scenario in which Mueller doesn't testify eventually. The only question is when and how. Mm -hmm. so for example, Mueller is still an employee of the Justice Department. Um, as long as he's an employee of the Justice Department, is he going to testify? That That's unclear. But I think there's no way in, I can't imagine a scenario in which Democrats do, you know, give up on the notion of talking to Mueller. And look, Democrats control the House. They have subpoena power. They can make Mueller come testify. So I do think that will happen. It's just a question of when. And is there sort of a, a sort of a crisis right now, a, a clash between the administration and Congress, with President Trump saying that you know members of his administration should ignore subpoenas, they should ignore calls to testify, it, given this letter and given the new calls for you know for Mueller to testify, is that a new clash? It is, and it, it sort of it, it's the backdrop of all this, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if if. Barr was just dealing with Congress in terms of the Mueller report, that would be one thing, and certainly it's very important. But this particular confrontation today comes amid this larger fight over a bunch of documents and a bunch of areas related to the president. And, you know, people's backs are up. People are, you know, on, certainly on the Democratic side, people are, you know, itching for a fight. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think that's how this these two forces will come together today. Oh, we're going to take a listen uh, to a tape. Um, adding to the drama of today's testimony is the disconnect between Robert Mueller and Barr during his previous testimony on Capitol Hill. Uh, Barr was asked directly about any friction between him and the special counsel. Let's take a listen to that exchange. Um, reports have emerged recently, uh, General, that members of the special counsel's team are frustrated at some level with the limited information included in your March 24th letter uh, that it does not adequately or accurately necessarily portray the report's findings. Do you know what they're referencing with that? No, I don't. I think, I think, uh, I suspect that they probably wanted, you know, more put out. But uh, in my view, uh, I was not interested in putting out summaries or trying to summarize, because I think any summary, regardless of who prepares it, uh, not only runs the risk of, you know, being under-inclusive or over-inclusive, uh, but also, you know, would trigger a lot of discussion and analysis that really should await everything coming out at once. And now, Devlin, now we know that at that point when he was testifying that he had that letter in hand. Right. And so, Already you see Democrats arguing that that proves that he's being, dis at, at a minimum, disingenuous with the committee. Um, I do think, however, that, you know, what Barr, now Barr is a very smart lawyer. I do think if Barr is asked, you know, why did you say that and answer that question, I suspect his answer today would be something like, well, I laid out what the tension was. Uh, you're right, I didn't mention the letter, but I described fairly coherently what the tension point was between us and, and those and, and those folks in the office. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, you know, you, whenever you talk about Bill Barr and Bob Mueller for that matter, you have to remember these are very smart lawyers right. and they choose their words very carefully. But that goes to the question of um, accurate versus misleading. Correct. Which Absolutely. Is, which is Robert Mueller's problem with uh, the way his work is being presented. Not that it wasn't accurate to a letter, but right. rather that it was misleading. Right, and that's the whole question, you know, does it capture the spirit of the thing as opposed to the technical letter of, of, of the thing? Um, and that's going to be, a, I think, a big focus of this conversation today at the hearing. I think there, I, you can already see lawmakers accusing Barr of being disingenuous and misleading in his answers, even while being technically accurate. Mm -hmm. um, frankly, there's a lot of lawyers who make very good money doing just that right. for a career. Um, but is that but is that necessarily the way you want the attorney general to conduct himself uh, in 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 public settings like this and in big issues like this? I, I think Barr's main defense of himself is going to be something along the lines of, "Look, we put out a a very lightly redacted version mm -hmm. of 448 pages." You know, and, and according to the regulations, in Barr's mind, arguably he shouldn't have put out any of this. Um, and he, in his mind, you know, he sided in the, in the cause of transparency. I, I don't know how well that argument will fly with Democrats. I suspect not well, mm -hmm. because again, 
they look at, at Mueller's letter and see and see in their minds, well, this is it. This is the proof that Barr's le even Mueller didn't think Barr's letter was representative of his work. Hmm. Well, we're going to go to Capitol Hill now. We have correspondents up on Capitol Hill this morning for a look at the anticipation there. Let's go live to the Post. Rhonda Colvin. Rhonda? Emily, that's right. We are near the hearing room, Dirksen 226, where the hearing will take place in about 30 minutes from now or less than 30 minutes from now. What we can expect today is a typical hearing. We've heard from the committee that this is going to follow the, the same guidelines that we've seen before, where there will be an opening statement by the chairman, Lindsey Graham, and then each member is going to get about seven to ten minutes to question uh, William Barr today. I'm joined uh, by my colleague, Paul Kane, who is our senior congressional correspondent here on the Hill. Paul, given Given the news yesterday that Barr was contacted by Mueller and he complained that he didn't feel that the Attorney General had characterized the breadth of this investigation properly, how does that change this hearing today? Uh, I think it changes it dramatically. There's lots of times there'll be some sort of last minute thing that one side or the other leaks out to try to shape a hearing. But this was this was the special counsel saying that Barr himself had created public confusion uh, about his report. And that is going to set the stage for almost all of the Democratic line of questioning because they believe the Attorney General was intentionally trying to skew the whole findings in the President's favor. And now you have the special counsel documenting this in a letter. That's very unusual, and that gives Democrats a big opening to try and push in terms of what exactly. Why did Barr do the things he did? Why did he say things the, the way he did? Why did he keep saying no collusion, no collusion, in, a, in an echo of everything that the president yeah. has been saying? We've thought that this might be a friendlier hearing than the one potentially tomorrow with the House, given that the majority uh, here on the Senate side are Republicans. Do you see any potential areas that there may be clashes uh, throughout this hearing today? Oh, definitely, especially as you get further down the dais on the Democratic side. You've got a couple presidential contenders in Kamala Harris and Cory Booker um, who, you know, are going to look at this as a moment where they can they can draw attention to themselves and criticize the president. So I think you're going to see some serious clashes there. And this is the highest profile hearing that Lindsey Graham has ever chaired. Uh, he made a big splash in the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings um, in his sort of cross-examination of Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, but that was, he wasn't a chairman. He wasn't in charge. He wasn't trying to sort of guide the hearing. Uh, Lindsey Graham's never done anything this big. So it'll be interesting to watch him today. Do you feel that this is going to be more political theater? Usually these hearings that we've been covering where uh, Trump appointees have come and uh, been in front of Congress, they follow the same patterns where it's a lot of theater. Do you see that happening today? Uh, that's, that's a $64,000 question. There are many fact-based questions that Democrats really could and should ask and need to ask to draw out why the Attorney General made the decisions he made. Um, so hopefully they will do that, um, but oftentimes they start to get a little bit repetitive and you don't get the answers that we're looking for, um, but there are plenty of questions, plenty of things that they can do that will, that will answer some of the questions we've all been trying to get at. Paul, thank you very much for joining us. And it's also important to note that on the House side, at the same time that this hearing is going to take place, the House Judiciary Committee is also going to vote on the proceedings for tomorrow. That is uh, when Barr is expected, or maybe not, will uh, come to the House Judiciary Committee and address them. One sticking point that he has had there is that he does not want to be questioned by the committee's lawyers. So today at 10 o'clock, the House Judiciary Committee will vote on the proceedings for tomorrow. They say they're going to go ahead with a meeting, whether bars there or not. So that's a developing story that we will continue to talk about throughout the day. And back to you, Emily. Thanks so much, Rhonda. We'll check back with you later. That's right. Uh, Barr could be in for not one, but two days of testimony on Capitol Hill. What would that mean if he went before both committees? Well, it's really interesting because there has been so much tension and argument about whether that House hearing tomorrow, scheduled for tomorrow will even happen. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, this whole issue of the Mueller letter only raises the stakes of that hearing as well. So the fight there has been about uh, whether or not uh, Barr will be questioned by committee staff lawyers. Mm -hmm. Typically in most hearings, uh, 
witnesses are questioned by the lawmakers themselves. That often for a, for a smart and practiced uh, witness like Barr, uh, that often works to the witness's advantage because the questions become too scattershot and not focused and you don't sort of like hone in on particular points and facts. Um, in the old days, frankly, Congress did more questioning by committee staff lawyers. Uh, and, and what the Justice Department has said is, the Attorney General is not going to come to your hearing if he's going to be questioned by committee lawyers. And so far, the committee's response has been, uh, he doesn't get to set the terms of this, of this hearing. And if we want to use committee staff to question him, you know, that's our prerogative. And he doesn't, he doesn't get to decide that he can't come. Now, if that doesn't get resolved, um, you know, then it would probably move forward to the, one, the hearing would probably wouldn't happen, and then two, uh, you'd, ha you'd get into the question of, okay, is the committee now going to subpoena the Attorney General to come talk to them? But look, there's also like an interesting reason now for the committee to maybe think twice about do they really want to um, not have bar this week? When this letter issue is front and center, you know, there's going to be a whole set of, a whole set of answers right now, today, from Barr. And I assume there will, a lot of Democrats will want to ask follow-up questions after they digest some of his answers. Um, so it, it'll be an interesting sort of political calculus, I think, for both sides to decide how much do they really want to risk canceling tomorrow's hearing when, they, when the Democrats could have another crack at Barr um, over this issue of, you know, committee staff. Mm -hmm. And what, what does he fear from that committee staff attorney, just that he's going to get pinned down on a point that he doesn't want to be pinned down on? That's certainly the Democrats' accusation, that, that this is about Barr not wanting, you know, a tough questioning. Now, that, that's a little bit of an odd accusation for lawmakers to make mm -hmm. because they're essentially saying our staff are better at this than we are, <laughs> uh, the elected officials and the chairman and, you know, all, all those folks. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think, I think part of the argument that the Justice Department officials have been making privately is, look, you know, we're two co-equal branches of government. It should be, you know, lawmaker to principal. And if the staff wants to question somebody, they can question Justice Department staff. Um, that's a fine argument to make. Uh, it's frankly, it has been the past practice a long time ago that staff would question senior officials, and that wasn't a big deal. It's only become an issue now because lawmakers have gone away from that model. And frankly, I think to the lawmakers' detriment. You know, I think a lot of lawmakers want their five minutes mm -hmm. on live TV, and they're willing to sacrifice actually learning anything or helping the public understanding for their own personal... Um, Viral social me media moment. Right, they get or, clips out yeah. of it. Right. Well, one thing is sure to come up uh, today in uh, today's hearing, Attorney General Barr discussed releasing Mueller's report during a press conference just hours before it was made public. Let's take a listen. Finally, the special counsel investigated a number of links or contacts between the Trump campaign officials and individuals connected with the Russian government during the 2016 presidential campaign. After reviewing these contacts, the special counsel did not find any conspiracy to violate U.S. law involving Russian-linked persons and any persons associated with the Trump campaign. So that's the bottom line. After nearly two years of investigation, thousands of subpoenas, hundreds of warrants and witness interviews, the special counsel confirmed that the Russian government sponsored efforts to illegally interfere with the 2016 presidential election, but did not find that the Trump campaign or other Americans colluded in those efforts. That clip is sure to come up today. Devlin, right. what do you make of that? Um, so obviously, he was always going to be questioned about this press conference. Mm -hmm. This press conference angered a lot of Democrats and angered a lot of people who were already suspicious. Even before they read or Correct. knew of the Mueller well letter. Before, well before the Mueller letter, this, this, angered, uh, this press conference angered folks. So the letter basically pours fuel on that fire as well. And look, I, I, I would love to see him give a more fulsome explanation of the thought process behind that press conference. Because at the time he's speaking, you know, we haven't seen the report. And he's sort of, you know, filling a space that, that can't be fact-checked, can't be, you know, uh, held up against the written word versus the spoken. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a challenge when you're trying to, you know, explain the most accurate way possible what happened. Um, so I think he's going to get a lot of questions about that press conference because 
the letter only underscores the concerns that some people already had about that press conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're looking now live. This is uh, live pictures from the Senate Judiciary Hearing Room where Attorney General William Barr will be testifying later. The committee room seems to be open. You can see members of the media filing in. Uh, William Barr will be sworn in uh, shortly, and the hearing will begin. Um, right now, we're going to go to Capitol Hill. Uh, for Democrats, the question of how to respond to the Mueller report is a complicated one. For more on that, we're joined by The Washington Post, Joyce Coe on Capitol Hill. Joyce. Well, Emily, Robert Mueller uh, laid out numerous instances where President Trump may have obstructed justice, but he left the question up to Congress of what to do with all of that information that he gathered. Now the ultimate question facing Democrats is whether or not they're going to pursue a, uh, impeachment proceedings against the president. And when asked about this, Democrats have really given a large range of answers, indicating that their party is still struggling to find consensus on this issue. Now there was a Washington Post ABC poll done recently that showed the majority of Americans object to uh, starting the impeachment process. Only 37 percent of Americans support the move, and it could be really in indicative of why Democrats have been slow in their messaging, really cautious. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi saying several weeks ago that she thinks that impeachment proceedings could be extremely divisive for the country. And that's certainly what we're hearing from other Democrats who I've talked to uh, really quick to say that they want to uh, proceed with investigating this further, but stopping just short of saying anything about impeachment. It's certainly what I heard from Maryland Senator Ben Cardin when I spoke to him shortly after the full redacted Mueller report was released. Take a listen. We have a right and a responsibility to evaluate what the president did. What that leads to is a separate issue. So I would not want to comment on that. I think it's just not the right moment. Let's understand the facts, look at the different alternatives that are available, try to understand the circumstances better, and then determine whether we have constitutional responsibilities to take further action. Now, there are some Democrats who are taking a much more aggressive line, of course. One of those being Senator Elizabeth Warren, who's running for president in 2020, saying that she does think that there was enough evidence in the Mueller report to uh, proceed through a path of impeachment. And while she isn't on the committee today, there are three Democratic presidential hopefuls who are, those being Senators Amy Klobuchar, Kamala Harris, and Cory Booker, who we will be watching to see uh, whether their lines of questioning can give us any information into whether or not they think uh, impeachment is the right answer, or really the question surrounding impeachment. Emily? Thanks so much, Joyce. We'll be checking back in with you. Devlin, I want to ask you, we've been focusing so much on the process questions, which are not small, <laughs> but, we, but what about the substance of the Mueller report? Um, I know that Senator Amy Klobuchar said that one thing she really wants to delve into is, you know, not just uh, Barr and Mueller and how they interacted, but about the Russian interference in the 2016 election itself. Um, is that something you expect to be uh, a big issue before this committee today, or has it gotten so overtaken by, by process? Boy, I think... I think before we knew about the letter, maybe there would be some significant discussion of what this means for the next election. Because certainly within the government, there's a lot of agencies, the FBI, um, chief among them, who are very focused on trying to protect uh, the, the process going forward. But I also think, realistically, this fight, which is really about the obstruction question. So the, the disagreement Mueller and Barr are having throughout this process is really about the obstruction part of the investigation. Not the collusion. Not the collusion. However, you know, talk to anyone who works in the cybersecurity field or in the government uh, election field, and they'll tell you they're very worried about how this looks going forward and how much worse it could get. Um, because one of the things that uh, the Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein said in a speech last week was that what's known publicly about Russian interference in the 2016 election is just the tip of the iceberg, to use his words, hmm. um, suggesting there's a lot more activity um, and, you know, perhaps not rising to the level of illegality, but certainly meddlesome and worrisome and um, alarming to officials trying to, you know, just oversee a fair election. Um, so I think that is a thing, uh, an issue that's going to come up, but I, I, I really, I expect today's hearing will really be overwhelmingly on this issue of what did Barr do, what did Barr and Mueller say to each other, and to the degree that Democrats can drive some of these points home, 
possibly try to paint Barr as uh, essentially a bad faith actor in this process. Uh, now, one part of this is sort of a human drama that I find so fascinating is that Barr and Mueller are, are were friends, yes. had a close personal relationship. How does uh, what's transpiring very publicly change that, or does it? Uh, you know, Barr has said it won't. You know, Barr uh, told a story, um, you know, about meeting with the president, how he said, you know, Mueller and I are friends and we'll be friends. Um, you know, and I think in Barr's mind, whatever their disagreements are right now, that will not affect their friendship and, you know, fondness for each other. The two of them worked together in the Justice Department in the early 90s, and they worked on some pretty huge cases, uh, uh, an airliner bombing over Lockerbie, Scotland that, that killed more than hundreds of people. Um, and so, you know, in their minds, I think they're still having a lawyerly argument. But look, this is a lawyerly argument, uh, you know, on steroids. This is, this is about politics. This is about power. Um, it's not just a lawyerly argument. So it'll be interesting to see if that relationship holds up under the pressure it's, it's coming under, because I don't think this pressure is going to go away anytime soon. Uh, tell me, why was Robert Mueller so um, concerned about the public perception of his report? You know, if the report was going to come out anyway, or at least, right. you know, in some lightly redacted form, why was he so concerned about the way it was framed and not just, you know, the content? In his letter to the Attorney General, M Mueller makes something very clear that he's worried about losing the public's confidence in the process. And that fits with what we know about Bob Mueller uh, as in his time as an FBI director. Mueller always spent a lot of time thinking about it's not just good enough to do the work well. The public has to believe you've done the work well, and you have to to the degree that it's possible in law enforcement setting, which is not always possible, but be able to show the public that you did the work well and fairly. Um, and so it's pretty clear that Mueller is, is writing that letter out of concerns that, you know, if we keep arguing about Barr's description of this, we are going to lose the public confidence in our work, and that would be bad. Now look, there's another sort of nerdy legal element to this, right? I don't know many lawyers who would enjoy seeing their 448-page document reduced to four. Um, I think even if it was the best, four, best written four pages on earth, um, the lawyer who wrote the 448-page version would, you would think, out you left out all the important parts. Right. Um, what about my footnotes? Right. So I, I, take, I, I take that as partly being what's going on, but look, there's a far larger issue here, right? Because if you're investigating the president, as Mueller says in his letter, the public has to believe this was done right. And he, what he's expressing in the letter is, I think the public is losing some confidence that this was done right, and so we need to fix that. Hmm. And, and tell me a little bit more about that decision uh, by Robert Mueller not to come to a conclusion. Right. And, and then Barr's decision to do just that. And to hear Barr and those close to him tell it, uh, they're still not completely sure of exactly Mueller's legal rationale. They just know it involves a longstanding Justice Department policy that you cannot indict, you should not indict a sitting president. And Mueller concludes from, in part because of that policy, that it would also be wrong to accuse a sitting president, even privately, because then the accusation would have a similar effect on the ability of the government to function. But what Mueller doesn't really ever speak to in the letter, and, and I, think, I think it puzzles a lot of people, not just Barr and, and not just people at the Justice Department, is does that mean then that Congress should look at this and make its own decision? That would obviously open the door for impeachment hearings. Or does that mean, as, as one part of the letter suggests, that maybe some future prosecutor once the president is out of office, some future prosecutor should look, review all this evidence and decide if the president should be charged once he is no longer president. Mueller really doesn't answer that question, although he hints at both possibilities without ever really saying the words. Um, and so that's another area in which Barr and Mueller are very far apart, because Barr's argument is the Justice Department is a prosecuting agency. We make prosecuting decisions. We don't decide not to decide. Well, but what, how will that play out in Congress? I mean, will members of Congress say, you know, maybe that is our role. He left this open. How will that play out today? Right. I assume that a number of Barr's critics will make the argument that Mueller is clearly suggesting we need to pick up the ball and run with it if it's going to go anywhere. 
And frankly, I don't think Barr shares that view. I think Barr's view is it is our decision to, it is our job as the Justice Department to make a call. Mueller decided he wouldn't make the call, so I, as the head of the Justice Department, will make the call. Um, that's going to be a point of contention, obviously, because there's a bunch of folks, uh, certainly among Democrats, who think that was inappropriate and maybe even the wrong and maybe even the wrong call. But inappropriate is just the, the process function of, of what Barr's role is and all that. Uh, but what would that look like going forward? How could Congress step in? How could they assert that authority? Well, then it yeah. would be up to the House Judiciary Committee to decide whether to start holding hearings about impeachment. Um, so far, they've been fairly noncommittal about that. The, the general, the Democrats seem kind of split on that subject, and it seems so far as if party leadership is not very enthusiastic about going down that road, but some of the younger uh, members and newer members in the House are more enthusiastic about going down that road and seeing what happens. And so what we're left with right now is that the chairman of the Judiciary Committee in the House is basically just keeps saying whenever he's asked the impeachment question, just says, we'll see. Mm -hmm. Now, we've talked a lot about questions that Democrats might have. What about Republicans? How, will they be a friendlier audience for the Attorney General? Oh, certainly. And I think, you know, the Republicans, I think, are... Okay. And actually, sorry, Devlin, I'm going to cut you short there. It looks like uh, Attorney General William Barr is being seated right now. We're looking at live pictures from the Senate Judiciary Committee room. And um, so he'll be sworn in shortly. Um, Lindsey Graham is the chairman of this committee. Um, I was just asking you about Republicans. Right. What kind of reception would he get from Republicans? I think, you know, Republicans may be his uh, island of safety in this hearing today. And, and I, I expect a lot of the Republicans will be asking questions about a point that Barr made a, a few days ago, which was he said that there was spying that went on against the Trump campaign by the, gov by the government. Um, and that he's doing his own review of the appropriateness of that and what, what was done properly or improperly in that. And I think a lot of Republicans seized on those remarks when he made them, and I expect Graham and others will uh, ask him to expound on that, and he may, he may say something further on that. I don't know, but, you know, he's been willing to talk about this to some degree, um, so I think Republicans will, will try to draw more, of, more out on that point. Devlin Barrett of the Washington Post, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm sure we'll have many more questions for you. Um, we're going to go live now to the Senate Judiciary Committee room. You see uh, Attorney General William Barr seated there. He'll be sworn in shortly, and he'll be testifying today before the committee. Um, we're going to take you live for uninterrupted coverage of this hearing. Um, we'll be back when the committee breaks with more reporting and analysis by my Washington Post colleagues. First order of business is to try to cool the room down, so we'll see if we can do that. But the Attorney General will be testifying here in a bit about the Mueller report. Now I want to thank him for coming to the committee and giving us an explanation as to the actions he took and why he took them regarding the Mueller report. And here's the good news. Here's the Mueller report. You can read it for yourself. It's uh, about 400 and something pages. Can't say I've read it all, but I've read uh, most of it. There's an unredacted version over in the classified section of the Senate, a room where you can go look at the unredacted version, and I did that, and I found it not to change anything in terms of an outcome. But a bit about the Mueller report. Who is Mueller? For those who may not know, I don't know where you've been, but you may not know, that Bob Mueller has a reputation in this town and throughout the country as being an outstanding lawyer and a man of the law. He was the FBI director. He was the deputy attorney general. 
He was in charge of the criminal division at the Department of Justice. He was a United States Marine, and he has served his country in a variety of circumstances long and well. For those who took time to read the report, I think it was well written, very thorough. And let me tell you what went into this report. There were 19 lawyers employed, approximately 40 FBI agents, intel analysts, forensic, forensic accountants, and other staff, 2,800 subpoenas issued, 500 witnesses interviewed, 500 search warrants executed, more than 230 orders for communication records so they records could be obtained, 13 requests to foreign governments for evidence, over $25 million spent over two years. We may not agree on much, but I hope we can agree that he had ample resources, took a lot of time, and talked to a lot of people. And you can read for yourself what he found. The Attorney General will tell us a bit about what his opinion of the report is. In terms of interacting with the White House, the White House turned over to Mr. Mueller 1.4 million documents and records, never asserted executive privilege one time, over 20 White House staffers, including eight from the White House Counsel's Office, were interviewed voluntarily. Don McGahn, Chief Counsel for the White House, was interviewed for over 30 hours. Everybody that they wanted to talk to from the Trump campaign on the ground, they were able to talk to. The President submitted himself to written interrogatories. So to the American people, Mr. Mueller was the right guy to do this job. I always believe that Attorney General Sessions was conflicted out because he was part of the campaign. He was the right guy with ample resources, and the cooperation he needed to find out what happened was given in my view. But there were two campaigns in 2016. And we'll talk about the second one in a minute. So what have we learned from this report? After all this time and all this money, Mr. Mueller and his team concluded there was no collusion. I didn't know. Like many of you here, on the Republican side, we all agreed that Mr. Mueller should be allowed to do his job without interference. I joined with some colleagues on the other side to introduce legislation to protect the special counsel, that he could only be removed for cause. He was never removed. He was allowed to do his job. So no collusion, no coordination, no conspiracy between the Trump campaign and the Russian government regarding the 2016 election. As to obstruction of justice, Mr. Mueller left it to Mr. Barr to decide after two years and all this time, he said, Mr. Barr, you decide. Mr. Barr did. There are a bunch of lawyers on this committee, and I will tell you the following. You have to have specific intent to obstruct justice. If there's no underlying crime, it's pretty hard to figure out what intent might be if there was never a crime to begin with. The president never did anything to stop Mueller from doing his job. So I guess the theory goes now, we don't, okay, he didn't collude with the Russians and he didn't specifically do anything to stop Mueller, but attempted obstruction justice of a crime that never occurred, I guess is sort of the, the new standard around here. We'll see if that makes any sense. To me, it doesn't. Now there's another campaign, it was the Clinton campaign. What have we learned from this report? The Russians interfered in our election. So can some bipartisanship come out of this? I hope so. I intend to work with my colleagues on the other side to introduce the Deter Act and to introduce legislation to defend the integrity of the voting system. 
Senator Durbin and I have legislation that would deny anyone admittance into the United States a visa through the immigration system if they were involved in interfering in an American election. I'm working with Senator Whitehouse and Blumenthal to make sure that if you hack into a state election system, even though it's not tied to the internet, that's a crime. I would like to do more to harden our infrastructure because the Russians did it. It wasn't some 400 pound guy sitting on a bed somewhere. It was the Russians and they're still doing it. And it could be the Chinese, it could be somebody next. So my takeaway from this report is that we've got a lot of work to do to defend democracy against the Russians and other bad actors. And I promise the committee we will get on with that work, hopefully in a bipartisan fashion. The other campaign. The other campaign was investigated, not by Mr. Mueller, by people within the Department of Justice. The accusation against the Clinton, Secretary Clinton, was that she set a private server up somewhere in her house and classified information was on it to avoid the disclosure requirements and the transparency requirements required of being Secretary of State. So that was investigated. What do we know? We know that the person in charge of investigating hated Trump's guts. I don't know how Mr. Mueller felt about Trump, but I don't think anybody on our side believes that he had a personal animosity toward the president to the point he couldn't do his job. This is what Strzok said on February the 12th, 2016. Now, he's in charge of the Clinton email investigation. Oh, he's, Trump's, abysmal. I keep hoping the charade will end and people will just dump him. February the 12th, 2016. Page is the uh, Department of Justice lawyer assigned to this case. March 3rd, 2016. God, Trump is a loathsome human being. Struck. Oh, my God. Trump's an idiot. Page, he's awful. Struck. God, Hillary should win 100 million to nothing. Compare those two people to Mueller. March 16th, 2016. I cannot believe Trump is likely to be an actual serious candidate for president. July the 21st, 2016. Trump is a disaster. I have no idea how destabilizing his presidency would be. August the 8th, 2016. Three days before struck was made Deputy acting uh, in charge of the counterintelligence divisions of the FBI. He's never going to become president, right? Page to struck. No, no, he won't. We'll stop him. These are the people investigating the Clinton email situation and start the counterintelligence investigation of the Trump campaign. Compare them to Mueller. August the 15th, 2016, struck. I want to believe the path you threw out for consideration in Andy's office, that there's no way he gets elected, but I'm afraid we can't take that risk. It's like an insurance policy in the unlikely event you die before you're 40. August 26, 2016, just went to the Southern Virginia Walmart I could smell the Trump support. October the 19th, 2016. Trump is a fucking idiot. He's unable to provide a coherent answer. Sorry to the kids out there. These are the people that made a decision that Clinton didn't do anything wrong and a counterintelligence investigation of the Trump campaign was warranted. We're going to, in a bipartisan way, I hope, deal with Russia. But when the Mueller report is put to bed, and it soon will be, this committee is going to look long and hard at how this all started. We're going to look at the FISA warrant process. Did Russia provide Christopher Steele the information about Trump that turned out to be garbage that was used to get a warrant on an American system, citizen? And if so, how did the system fail? Was there a real effort between Papadopoulos and anybody in Russia to use the Clinton emails 
stolen by, stole by the Russians, or is that thought planted in his mind? I don't know, but we're going to look. And I can tell you this, if you change the names, y'all would want to look too. Everything I just said, just substitute Clinton for Trump. And see what all these people with cameras would be saying out here about this. As to cooperation in the Clinton investigation, I told you what the Trump people did. I'll tell you a little bit about what the Clinton people did. There was a protective order for the server issued by the House, and there was a uh, request by the State Department to preserve all the information on the server. Paul Cambetta, after having the protective order, used a software program called BleachBit to wipe this email server clean. Has anybody ever heard of Paul Cambetta? No. Under protective order from the House to preserve the information, under a request from the State Department to preserve the information on the server, he used a bleach bit program to wipe it clean. What happened to him? Nothing. 18 devices possessed by Secretary Clinton, she used to do business as secretary. How many of them were turned over to the FBI? None. Two of them couldn't be turned over because Judith Casper took a hammer and destroyed two of them. What happened to her? Nothing. So the bottom line is we're about to hear from Mr. Barr the results of a two-year investigation into the Trump campaign, all things Russia, the actions the president took before and after the campaign, $25 million, 40 FBI agents. I appreciate very much what Mr. Mueller did for the country. I have read most of the report. For me, it is over. Senator Feinstein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Attorney General. <clears throat> On March 24th, you sent a letter uh, to Chairman Graham and the ranking member of this committee providing your summary of the principal conclusions set out in Special Counsel Mueller's report. This letter was widely reported as a win for the president and was characterized as confirming there was no conclusion. Following this letter, the White House put out a statement declaring the special counsel, and I quote, the special counsel did not find any collusion and did not find any obstruction, end quote, and that the report, quote, was a total and complete exoneration, end quote, of the president. However, last night, the Washington Post reported that Special Counsel Mueller sent you a letter in late March where he said uh, your letter to Congress failed to, quote, fully capture the context, nature, and substance of his office's work and conclusions, end quote, and that he spoke with you about the concern that the letter threatened to undermine the public confidence in the outcome of the investigations. That's in quotes as well. Then on April 18th, you held a press conference where you announced repeatedly that the Mueller report found no collusion and no evidence of a crime. An hour later, a redacted copy of the Mueller report was provided to the public and the Congress. And we saw why Mueller was concerned Contrary to the declarations of the total and complete exoneration, the special counsel's report contained substantial evidence of misconduct. First, special counsel Mueller's report confirms that the Russian government implemented a social media campaign to mislead millions of Americans, and that Russian intelligence services hacked into the DNC 
and the DCCC computers, stole emails and memos, and systematically released them to impact the presidential election. Your March letter stated that there was no evidence that the Trump campaign, quote, conspired or coordinated with Russia, end quote. However, the report outlined substantial evidence that the Trump campaign welcomed, encouraged, and expected to benefit electorally from Russia's interference in the election. The Mueller report also details how time and time again, the Trump campaign took steps to gain advantage from Russia's unlawful interference. For example, President Trump's campaign manager, Paul Manafort, passed internal campaign polling data, messaging, and strategy updates to Konstantin Kalimnik, a Russian national with ties to Russian intelligence. The Mueller report explains how Paul Manafort briefed Kalimnik in early August of 2016 on, and I quote, the state of the Trump campaign and Manafort's plan to win the election, end quote, including the campaign's focus on the battleground states of Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Minnesota. Next, the Mueller report documents the Trump campaign's communications regarding Secretary Clinton's and the DNC's stolen emails. Specifically, the report states, and I quote, within approximately five hours of President Trump calling on Russia to find Secretary Clinton's emails, Russian intelligence agency GRU officers, quote, targeted for the first time Clinton's personal office, end quote. The Mueller report also reveals that President Trump repeatedly asked individuals affiliated with his campaign, including Michael Flynn, quote, to find the deleted Clinton emails, end quote. These efforts included suggestions to contact foreign intelligence services, Russian hackers, and individuals on the dark web. The report confirms that Trump knew of WikiLeaks releases of the stolen emails and received status about status updates about upcoming releases, while his campaign promoted coverage of the leaks. Donald Trump Jr. communicated directly with WikiLeaks and at its request publicly tweeted a link to emails stolen from Clinton's campaign manager. Second, in your March letter to Congress, you concluded, and I quote, that the evidence is not sufficient to establish that the president committed an obstruction of justice offense, end quote. However, Special Counsel Mueller methodically outlines 10 episodes, some continuing multiple actions by the president to mislead the American people and interfere with the investigations into Russian interference and obstruction. In one example, the president repeatedly called White House counsel Don McGahn at home and directed him to fire Mueller, saying, quote, Mueller has to go. Call me back when you do it. Then later, the president repeatedly ordered McGahn to release a press statement and write a letter saying the president did not order Mueller fired. The Mueller report also outlines efforts by President Trump to influence witness testimony and deter cooperation with law enforcement. For example, the president's team communicated to witnesses that pardons would be available if they, quote, stayed on message, end quote, and remained, quote, on the team, end quote. In one case, the president sent messages through his personal lawyers to Paul Manafort that he would be taken care of and just, quote, sit tight, end quote. The president then publicly affirmed this communication by stay, stating that Manafort was, quote, a brave man, end quote, 
for refusing to break. Similarly, the Mueller report stated, the president used inducements in the form of positive messages in an effort to get Michael Cohen not to cooperate, and then turned to attacks and intimidation to deter the provision of information or undermine Cohen's credibility. Finally, while the March letter to Congress and the April press conference left the impression there were no remaining questions to examine, this report notes several limitations Mueller faced while gathering the facts that Congress needed to examine. More than once, the report documents that legal excuse me, conclusions were not drawn because witnesses refused to answer questions or failed to recall the events. In addition, numerous witnesses, including but not limited to Jared Kushner, Sarah Sanders, Rudolph Giuliani, Michael Flynn, Steve Bannon, and John Kelly all stated they could not recall events. The president himself said more than 30 times that he could not recall or remember enough to be able to answer written questions from the special counsel. The special counsel also recounted that, quote, some associated with the Trump campaign deleted relevant communications or communicated during the relevant period using applications that featured encryption or do not provide for long-term retention of data, end quote. Based on these gaps, the Mueller report concluded, and I quote again, the office cannot rule out the possibility that the unavailable information would have shed additional light on or cast a new light on events described in the report, end quote. And contrary to the conclusion that the special counsel's report did not find evidence of communication or coordination between the Trump campaign and Russia, the Mueller report explicitly states, and I quote, a statement that the investigation did not establish particular facts does not mean there was no evidence of those facts. Volume two, page two. Let me conclude with this. Congress has both the constitutional duty and the authority to investigate the serious findings contained in the Mueller report. I strongly believe that this committee needs to hear directly from Special Counsel Mueller about his views on the report in his March letter. I also believe senators should have the opportunity to ask him about these subjects in questions directly. I have requested this to our chairman to authorize a hearing with Special Counsel Mueller and I hope that will happen soon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Before uh, we receive your testimony, uh, Mr. Barr, we have the letter that Mr. Mueller sent to you on March 27th, 2019. I'll put that in the record now. Uh, the floor is yours. What, what, gotta swear again, sorry. <laughs> Salome. You do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, except you got it. Yes. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member uh, Feinstein, members of the committee. During my confirmation process, uh, there were two concerns that dominated, as I think you will all agree. The first was whether I would in any way impede or curtail uh, Special Counsel Mueller's investigation, and the second, whether I would make public his final report. As you see, Bob Mueller was allowed to, to complete his work as he saw fit, and as to the report, even though the applicable regulations require that the report is to be made to the AG and is to remain confidential and not be made public, I told this committee that I intended to exercise whatever discretion I had to make as much of the report available to the public and to congressional leaders as I could, consistent with the law. This has been done. 
I arrived at the department on February 14th. And shortly thereafter, I asked to, it to be communicated to Bob Mueller's team uh, that in preparing the report, uh, we requested that they make it so we could readily identify 6E material uh, so we could quickly process the report. Could you tell the public what 6E is? 6E is grand jury material that uh, cannot be uh, made public. It's prohibited by statute. And I wanted that identified so we could redact that material and prepare the report for public release as quickly as we could. When I arrived at the department, I found, and, and was eventually briefed in on the investigation, I found that the Deputy Attorney General and his principal associate deputy, Ed Call O'Callaghan, were in regular uh, discussions with the counsel's office, had been, uh, and uh, they communicated uh, this request and had discussions about the, both the timing of the report and the nature of the report. On March 5th, uh, I met with Bob at the suggestion of the deputy and the principal associate deputy, Bob Muller. I met with Bob Muller uh, to, to get a, a readout on what his conclusions would be. Um, on March 25th, and, and, and at that meeting, I asked, I, I reiterated to, to uh, Special Counsel Muller that in order to, sh to have the shortest possible time before uh, I was in a position to release the report, uh, I asked that uh, they identify 6E material. When I received the report on March 22nd, and we were hoping to, to have that easily identified, the 6E material, unfortunately, uh, it did not come in that form. And it uh, quickly became apparent that it would take about three or four weeks uh, to identify that material and other material that have to be redacted. So there was necessarily going to be a gap between the receipt of the report and getting uh, the full report out publicly. The deputy and I uh, identified four categories of information that we believe required redaction. And I think you all know of them, but they were the grand jury material, the 6E material, information that the intelligence community advised would reveal sensitive sources and methods, information that if revealed at this stage would impinge on the investigation or prosecution of related cases, and information that would unfairly affect the privacy and reputational interests of peripheral third parties. We went about redacting this material in concert with the special counsel's office we needed their assistance to identify uh, the 6E material in particular. The redactions were all carried out by DOJ lawyers with special counsel lawyers uh, in consultation with intelligence community. The report contained a substantial amount of material over which the president uh, could have asserted executive privilege but the president made the decision not to assert executive privilege and to make public as much of the report as we could, subject to the redactions that we thought required. Now, as you see, the report has been lightly redacted. The public version has been estimated to have only 10% redactions. Almost uh, the, the vast uh, bulk of those redactions relate to, are in volume one, uh, which is the volume that deals with collusion and it relates to existing ongoing cases. Volume two has only about 2% redactions for the public version. So 98% of volume two dealing with obstruction uh, is available to the public. We have made a version of the report available to congressional leaders that only contains redactions of grand jury material. For this version, overall redactions are less than 2% for the whole report and for uh, volume two, dealing with obstruction, they are less than one-tenth of one percent. So given the limited nature of redactions, I believe that the public, publicly released report will allow every American to understand the results of the special counsel's work. By now, everyone is familiar with the special counsel's bottom line conclusions about the Russian attempts to interfere in the election. 
In volume one, the special counsel found that the Russians engaged, uh, engaged in two distinct schemes. First, the Internet Research Agency, a Russian entity with close ties to the Russian government, conducted a disinformation and social media operation to sow discord among Americans. Second, the GRU, Russian Military Intelligence, hacked into computers and stole emails from individuals affiliated with the Democratic Party and Hillary Clinton's campaign. The special counsel investigated whether anyone affiliated with President Trump's campaign conspired or coordinated with these criminal schemes. They concluded that they, there was not sufficient evidence to establish that there had been any conspiracy or coordination with the Russian government or uh, the IRA. As you know, volume two uh, in, uh, of his report uh, dealt with obstruction, and the special counsel considered whether certain actions of the president could amount to obstruction. He decided not to reach a conclusion. Instead, the report recounts 10 episodes and discusses potential legal theories for connecting the president's actions to elements of obstruction offenses. Now, we first heard that the special counsel's decision not to decide the obstruction issue at, a meet, uh, at the March 5th meeting when he came over to the department, and we were frankly surprised that, that they were not going to reach a decision on obstruction. And we asked them a lot about the reasoning behind this and the basis for this. Special counsel Mueller stated three times to us in that meeting in response to our questioning that he emphatically was not saying that but for the OLC opinion, he would have found obstruction. He said that in the future, the facts of a case against a president might be such that a special counsel would recommend abandoning the OLC opinion, but this is not such a case. We did not understand exactly why the special counsel was not reaching a decision. And when we pressed him on it, he said that his team was still formulating uh, the explanation. Once we heard that the special counsel was not reaching a conclusion on obstruction, the deputy and I discussed and agreed that the department had to reach a decision. We had the responsibility to assess the evidence as set forth in the report and to make the judgment. I say this because the special counsel was appointed to carry out the investigative and prosecutorial functions of the department and to do it as part of the Department of Justice. The powers he was using, including the power of using a grand jury and using compulsory process, exist for that purpose, the function of the Department of Justice in this arena, which is to determine whether or not there has been criminal conduct. It's a binary decision. Is there enough evidence to show a crime? And do we believe a crime has been committed? We don't conduct criminal investigations just to collect information and put it out to the public. We do so to make a decision. And here we thought there was an additional reason, which is this was a very public investigation. And we had made clear that the results of the investigation were going to be made public. And the deputy and I felt that the evidence developed by the special counsel was not sufficient to establish that the president committed a crime. And therefore, it would be irresponsible and unfair for the department to release a report without stating the department's conclusions and thus leave it hanging as to whether the department considered that there had been criminal conduct. So the Deputy Attorney General and I conducted a careful review of the report with our staffs and legal advisors. And while we uh, disagreed with some of the legal theories and felt that many of the episodes uh, uh, discussed in the report would not constitute obstruction as a matter of law, we didn't rest our decision on that. We took each of the 10 uh, episodes and we uh, assessed them against the analytical framework uh, that had been set forth by the special counsel and we concluded that the evidence developed during the special counsel's investigation was not sufficient to establish that the president committed an obstruction of justice offense. Let me just talk a little bit about this March 24th letter and, and uh, Bob Mueller's letter I think on the 20, which I received on the 28th. When the report came in on the 22nd and we saw it was going to take a great deal of time to get it out to the public, uh, I made the determination that we had to put out some information about the bottom line. 
the body politic was in a high state of agitation. There was massive interest in learning what the bottom line results of uh, Bob Mueller's investigation was, particularly as to collusion. Former government officials were confident, confidently predicting that the president and members of his family were going to be indicted. There were people suggesting that if it took any time to turn around the report and get it out, it would mean that the president uh, was in legal jeopardy. Uh, so I didn't feel that uh, it was in the public interest to allow this to go on for several weeks without saying anything. And so I decided to simply state what the bottom line conclusions were which is what the department normally does, make a bi binary determination. Is there a crime or isn't there a crime? We, we prepared the letter for that purpose, to state the bottom line conclusions. We used the language from the report to state those bottom line conclusions. I analogize it to announcing after an extended trial what the verdict of the trial is pending release of the full transcript. That's what we were trying to do, notify the people as to the bottom line conclusion. We were not trying to summarize the 410 uh, page report. So we released that, I, I offered uh, Bob Mueller the opportunity to review that letter before it went out and he declined. Uh, on Thursday morning, I, rece I received, it probably was received at the department Wednesday night or evening, but on Thursday morning, I received a letter from Bob, the letter that's just been put into the record. And I called Bob and said, you know, what's the issue here? Are you and I asked him if he was suggesting that the March 24th letter was inaccurate, and he said no, but that the press reporting had been inaccurate and that the press was reading too much into it. And I asked him you know, specifically what his concern was. And he said that his concern focused on his explanation of why he did not reach a conclusion on obstruction. And he wanted more put out on that issue. Uh, he wanted, uh, he argued for putting out summaries uh, of each volume the executive summaries uh, that had been written by his office. Uh, and if not that, then other material that focused on the issue of why he didn't reach the obstruction question. But he was very clear with me that he was not suggesting that uh, we had misrepresented his report. Uh, I told Bob that I was not interested in putting out summaries and I wasn't going to put out the report piecemeal. I wanted to get the whole report out and I thought summaries by very definition, regardless of who prepared them, would be under-inclusive and we'd have sort of a series of different debates and public uh, discord over each tranche of, of information that went out and I wanted to get everything out at once and we should start working on that. And so the following day, I put out a letter explaining the process we were following and stressing that the March 24th letter was not a summary of the report, but a statement of the principal conclusions and uh, that people would be able to see uh, Bob Mueller's entire thinking when the report was made public. So I'll end my statement there, Mr. Chairman. And Glad to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, as to the actual report itself, was there ever an occasion where uh, you wanted to, something was redacted from the report that Mr. Mueller objected to? I, I, I wouldn't say uh, objected to. My understanding is uh, the categories were defined by uh, me and the, and the deputy. Uh, I don't think that, uh, I have no, uh, bel you know, I don't Did believe Did you work that. with him to redact the report? Right. The, those categories were executed by DOJ lawyers working with his lawyers. I think there were maybe a few judgment calls, very few, uh, 
as to whether or not something as a prudential matter should be treated as a reputational interest or something. So there may have been some occasions of that, but, but as, as far as, as I'm I understand aware, it, you did not want to hurt somebody's reputation unless it really affected the outcome, is that correct? Correct. So was there any disagreement about 6E material? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Any disagreement about uh, classified information? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. So <clears throat> the conclusions in your four-page summary, you think, accurately reflect his bottom line on collusion. Is that correct? Yes. And you can read it for yourself if you got any doubt. As to obstruction of justice, were you surprised he was going to let you decide? Uh, yes, I was surprised. I, I, uh, I think the very perp the function he was carrying out, the, the prosecutive, investigative and prosecutive function, is performed for the purpose of making that How many people did he question. actually indict, do you know? I can't remember off the top of my head. It was a lot. Yeah. So he actually has the ability to indict if he wants to. He's used that power during the investigation, is that correct? That's correct. And the other thing that was confusing to me is that the investigation carried on for a while as additional episodes were were looked into, episodes right. involving the president. And so my question is, uh, or was, why were those investigated if at the end of the day you aren't going to reach a decision on them? So did you consult uh, Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein about the obstruction matter? Constantly, yeah. So was he in agreement with your decision not to proceed forward? Yes. I'm sorry, the, the agreement what? Not, not to proceed forward uh, right. with obstruction. Right. right. Okay. So very quickly, give us your reasoning why you think it would be inappropriate to proceed forward on obstruction of justice in this case. Well, um, generally speaking, an obstruction case uh, typically has two aspects to it. One, there's usually an underlying criminality. That's Let's being, stop right there. Yeah. Was there an underlying crime here? No. So okay. usually there is. Usually. But it's not, it's not necessary, but right. the, the typical case, sort of the paradigmatic case is right. there's an underlying crime, and then uh, the person implicated or people implicated concerned about that criminality being discovered take an inherently malignant act as, as the Supreme Court has said, to, to uh, obstruct that investigation, so such as destroying documents. So that what? people were worried about that he fired Comey to stop the Russian investigation. That's one of the concerns people had. Well, let me tell you a little bit about Comey. I do not have confidence in him, Comey, any longer. That was Chuck Schumer, November the 2nd, 2016. I think he, Comey, should take a hard look at what he has done, and I think it would not be a bad thing for the American people if he did step down, Bernie Sanders, January the 15th, 2017. The president ought to fire Comey immediately, and he ought to initiate an investigation. That is uh, Congressman Nadler, November the 14th, 2016. Did you have a problem with the way Comey handled the Clinton email investigation? Yes, I said so at the time. Okay. So, <clears throat> given the fact that a lot of people call me should be fired, did you find that to be a persuasive act of obstructing justice? Uh, no. Uh, I, I think even the report at the end of the day came to the conclusion, if you, if you read the analysis, that uh, the, the, a reason that loomed large there for his termination was his refusal to tell the public what he was privately telling the president, which was that the president was not under investigation. As to where we go forward, as, as to how we go forward, would you recommend that this committee and every other committee of Congress do our best to harden our infrastructure against future Russian attacks? Absolutely, yes. Do you think Russia is still up to it? Yes. You think other countries may get involved in our elections in 2020? Yes. So you would support an effort by Congress working with the administration to harden our electoral infrastructure? Yes. Is that one of the takeaways of the Mueller report? Yes. Uh, do you share my concerns about the FISA warrant process? Yes. 
Do you share my concerns about the counterintelligence investigation, how it was opened and why it was opened? Yes. Do you share my concerns that the professional, lack of professionalism in the Clinton email investigation is something we should all look at? Yes. Okay. Do you expect to change your mind about the bottom line conclusions of the Mueller report? No. Do you know Bob Mueller? Yes. Do you trust him? Yes. How long have you known him? 30 years, roughly. You think he had the time he needed? Yes. You think he had the money he needed? Yes. You think he had the resources he needed? Yes. Do you think he did a thorough job? Yes, and I, I think he feels he did a thorough job and, and, and had uh, adequate uh, evidence to make the calls. Do you think the president's campaign in 2016 was thoroughly looked at in terms of whether or not they colluded with the Russians? Yes. And the answer is no, according to Bob Mueller. That's right. He couldn't decide about obstruction. You did. Is that correct? That's right. You feel good about your decision? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Chairman, Mr. Attorney General, the special counsel's report describes how the president directed White House counsel Don McGahn to fire special counsel Mueller and later told McGahn to write a letter, quote, for our records, end quote, stating that the president had not ordered him to fire Mueller. The report also recounts how the president made repeated efforts to get McGahn to change his story. Knowing that McGahn believed the president's version of events was false, the special counsel found, and I quote, substantial evidence, end quote, that the president tried to change McGahn's account in order to prevent further scrutiny of the president towards the investigation. Special counsel also found that McGahn is a credible witness with no motive to lie or exaggerate given the position he held in the White House. Here's the question. Does existing law prohibit efforts to get a witness to lie to say something the witness believes is false? Uh, yes. And lie, lie to the government, yes. And, and what law is that? Obstruction statutes. The obstruction statute. And you, you don't have it, I guess, before you. Well, I'm not sure which, which one they were referring to here. It was, it, it was probably 1512C2. So these things, in effect, constitute obstruction. Well, you're talking in general terms. You're not talking... Uh, what I'm talking about specifically, yes, you're, you're, you're correct in a sense that the, substantial, the, the special counsel in his report found substantial evidence that the president tried to change McGahn's account in order to prevent, and this is a quote, further scrutiny of the president toward the investigation, and quote. The special counsel also found McGahn is a credible witness with no motive to lie or exaggerate. So what I'm asking you then, is that a credible charge under the obstruction statute? We, we, felt that, we felt that that episode, the government would not be able to establish obstruction. The, if you go back and you, if, if you look at the, um, the episode where uh, McGahn, uh, the president gave McGahn an, obstruction, uh, an, an instruction, McGahn's version of that is quite clear in, in each time he gave it, which is that the uh, instruction said, go to Rosenstein, raise the issue of conflict of interest, and Mueller has to go because of this conflict of interest. So there's no question that, that, that the, whatever instruction was giving McGahn had to do with conflict of, Mueller's conflict of interest. Now, the president later said that what he meant was that the conflict of interest should be raised with Rosenstein, but the decision should be left with Rosenstein. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, it appears that McGahn felt it was more directive and that the president was essentially saying, push Rosenstein to invoke uh, uh, a conflict of interest to push Mueller out. 
wherever it fell on that spectrum of interest, the New York Times story was very different. The New York Times story said flat out that the president directed the firing of Mueller. He told McGahn, fire Mueller. Now, that, there's something very different between firing a special counsel outright, which suggests ending the investigation, and having a special counsel removed for conflict, which suggests that you're going to have another special counsel. So the fact is that even under McGahn's, uh, and, and, and then as the uh, report says and, and recognizes, there is evidence the president truly felt that the Times article was inaccurate and he wanted McGahn to correct it. So we believe that it would be impossible uh, for the government to establish beyond a reasonable doubt that the president understood that he, that he was instructing McGahn to say something false because it wasn't necessarily false. Moreover, McGahn had weeks before already given testimony to the, uh, to the special counsel, and the president was aware of that. And as, as the report indicates, it could also have been the case that, what he, that he was primarily concerned about press reports and making it clear that he never outright directed the firing of Mueller. So in, ter so in terms of the request to ask McGahn to memorialize that fact, we do not think in this case that the government could show corrupt intent beyond a reasonable doubt. Just to finish this, but you still have a situation where a president essentially tries to change the lawyer's account in order to prevent further criticism of himself. Well, that's not a crime. So you can, in this situation, instruct someone to lie? No, it has to be, well, to be obstruction of justice, the lie has to be uh, tied to uh, impairing the evidence in a particular proceeding. McGahn had already given his evidence, and I think, uh, I think it would be plausible that the purpose of McGahn memorializing what the president was asking was to make the record that the president never directed him to fire. And there is a distinction between saying to someone, go fire him, go fire Mueller, and saying, have him removed based on conflict. And what would they that, have different results. What would that conflict be? Well, the, the difference between them is if you remove someone for a conflict of interest, then there would be a, another, presumably another person appointed. Yeah, but wouldn't you have to have it in this kind of situation, an identifiable conflict that made sense, or else doesn't it just become a fabrication? Well, this, now we're going to shift from the issue of writing the, the, the memo or somehow putting out a release uh, later on and the issue of the, the actual direction to McGahn. So the question on the direction to McGahn has a number of different levels to it. Uh, and first, as a matter of, of law, I think the department's position would be that the president uh, can uh, direct the termination or the replacement of a special counsel. And as a matter of law, the obstruction statute does not reach that conduct. Putting that aside, the next question would be, even if it reached the conduct, could you here establish corrupt intent beyond a reasonable doubt? What makes this case very interesting is that when you take away the fact that there were no underlying criminal conduct, and you take away the fact that there was no inherently malign obstructive act, that is, the president was carrying out his constitutional duties. The question is, what is the impact of, of taking away the underlying crime? Um, and um, it's not, as the report suggests, that one impact is, well, we have to find some other reason why the president would obstruct the investigation. But there's another impact, which is if the president is being falsely accused, which the evidence now suggests that the accusations against him were false, 
if he, and he knew they were false. And he felt that uh, this investigation was unfair, propelled by his political opponents, and was, and was hampering his ability to govern. That is not a corrupt motive for replacing an independent counsel. So that's another, another reason that you know, we would say that the government would have difficulty proving this beyond a reasonable doubt. My time is right. Thank Senator Grass. <clears throat> uh, Senator Johnson and I wrote you about uh, text messages between Peter Strzok and Lisa Page that appear to show the FBI may have tried to use counterintelligence briefings for the Trump transition team as intelligence gathering operations. I hope uh, you will commit to answering the letter in writing, but also providing committees the requested briefing. That's my question. Yes, Senator. Uh, have you already tasked any staff to look into whether spying by the FBI and other agencies on the Trump campaign was properly predicated? And can Congress expect a formal report on your findings? Uh, yes, I do have people uh, in the department helping me review uh, the uh, activities over the summer of 2016. Okay. Uh, uh, I suppose it depends on what conclusions you come to, but is there any reason why Congress wouldn't be briefed on, on your conclusions? Uh, you know, it's a little early for me to commit completely, but I envision some kind of uh, reporting at the end of this. Uh, the Clinton campaign and the Democrat National Committee hired Fusion GPS to do opposition research against candidate Trump. Fusion GPS then hired Christopher Steele, former British intelligence officer, to compile what we all know as the Steele dossier that reportedly used Russian government sources for information. The Steele dossier was central to the now debunked collusion narrative. Now, here's the ir irony. The Mueller report spent millions investigating and found no collusion between Trump campaign and Russia. But the Democrats paid for a document created by a foreign national with reported foreign government sources. Not Trump, but the Democrats. That's the definition of collusion. Despite the central status of the Steele dossier to the collusion narrative, the Mueller report failed to analyze whether the dossier was filled with disinformation to mislead US intelligence agencies and the FBI. My question. Mueller spent over two years, $30 million, investigating Russian interference in the election. In order for a full accounting of Russian interference attempts, shouldn't the special counsel have considered on whether the do Steele dossier was part of a Russian disinformation and interference campaign? Uh, I, I don't... Uh, you know. Special Counsel Mueller has put out his report, and I have not yet had anyone go through the full scope of his investigation to determine whether he did address or look at all into those issues. One of the things I'm doing in my review is to try to assemble all the existing information out there about it, not only from Hill investigations and the OIG, but also to see what the special counsel looked into. So I really couldn't say what he actually no. looked into. But but you think, uh, in other words, if you had looked at all that information right now, you're telling me you could have said yes or no to my question. If I had looked at it. Yeah. And you're going to, you're going yes. to attempt to find yes. some of this information yes. if it's available. Yes. Uh, similarly, shouldn't the special counsel have looked into the origins of the FBI's investigation into alleged collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia? The, the or, origins of that narrative? Yes. I, I, I don't know if he, he viewed his uh, charter that broadly, and I don't know whether he did or not. That's something that 
I am reviewing. And again, we'll look at whatever the special counsel has developed on that. Yeah. In volume two of the report, the special counsel declined to make a traditional prosecutorial decision. Instead, the special counsel laid out 200 or so pages relating to a potential obstruction analysis and then dumped that on your desk. In your press conference, you said that you asked the special counsel whether he would have made a charging decision or recommended charges on obstruction, but for the Office of Legal Counsel's opinion on charging sitting presidents and that the special counsel made clear that was not the case. Uh, so, Mr. Barr, is that an accurate description of your conversation with the special counsel? Yes, he, he reiterated several times in a, in a group meeting that the, he was not saying that but for the OLC opinion he would have found obstruction. You know, if the special counsel found facts su sufficient to constitute obstruction of justice, would he have stated that finding? If he had found that, then I uh, think he would state it, yes. Okay. Was it Special Counsel Mueller's responsibility to make a charging recommendation? Uh, I think the Deputy Attorney General and I thought it was. But, but, but not just charging, but to, to determine whether or not conduct was criminal. The President would, would be charged uh, could not be charged as long as he was in office. Do you agree with the reasons that he offered for not making a decision in volume two of his uh, report, and why or why not? I'm not really sure of, of his reasoning. I, I really could not recapitulate his analysis, which is one of the reasons in my March 24th letter, I simply stated the fact that he did not reach a conclusion and didn't, didn't try to put words in his mouth. Um, I think that if he felt that he shouldn't go down the path of making a traditional uh, prosecutive decision, then he shouldn't have investigated. That was the time to uh, pull up. Okay. There have been a number of leaks coming out of the Justice Department and FBI during high profile investigations. The Inspector General found that during the department's investigation of Hillary Clinton for mishandling highly classified information, there was a culture of unauthorized media contacts. During the Russian investigation, the leaks continued. Leaks undermined the ability of investigators to investigate. Further leaks to the papers while Congress's questions to the department go unanswered is unacceptable. Why, what are you doing to investigate unauthorized media contacts by the department and FBI officials during the Russian investigation? We have multiple criminal leak investigations underway. Thank you. Senator Lay. Uh, thank you, Attorney General. Uh, I'm somewhat troubled by your, your testimony here and in the other body. You appeared before the House Appropriations on April 9th. You were asked about media reports that portrayed the special counsel's team as frustrated that your March 24th letter didn't adequately portray the report's findings. When the congressman, I believe this congressman, Chris, asked if you knew what those members of the special counsel's team were concerned about. You testified in response, no, I don't. You then said you merely suspected they would have preferred more information was released with a letter. Now we know, that contrary to what you said on April 9th, that on March 27th, uh, Robert Mueller wrote to you expressing very specific concerns that your March 24th letter, remember you're testifying on April 9th, that your March 24th letter failed to capture the, to quote Mr. Mueller, the context, nature, and substance, close quote of his report. And what, I, what really struck me, Mr. Mueller wrote that your letter threatened to undermine a central purpose for which the department appointed the special counsel to assure full public confidence in the outcome of the investigation. Why did you testify on April 9th 
that you didn't know the concerns being expressed by Mueller's team, when in fact you had heard those concerns directly from Mr. Mueller two weeks before? Well, as I said, I talked directly to, to Bob Mueller about his letter to me and, and specifically asked him, what exactly are your concerns? Are you saying that the March 24th letter was misleading or inaccurate, or what? He indicated that it was not. He was not saying that, and that what he was concerned about. That wasn't my question. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the question, which is the question from Christ was, reports have emerged recently, press reports, that members of the special counsel's team are, fr are frustrated at some level with the limited information included uh, in your March 24th letter in that they don't adequately or accurately portray the report's findings. I don't know what members he's talking about, I don't, I, I, and I, and I no, certainly no. am not aware of any challenge That's to the accuracy of the findings. Mr. Barr, you seem to have learned the filibuster rules even better than senators do. My question was, why did you say uh, you were not aware of concerns when weeks before your testimony, Mr. Mueller had expressed concerns to you? I mean, that's a fairly simple Well, I answered thing. a question, and the question was relating to unidentified members who were expressing frustration over the accuracy relating to findings. I don't know what that refers to at all. I talked directly to Bob Mueller, not members of his team, and even though I did not know what was being referred to, and, had, uh, and, and, and Mueller had never told me that, that, my, that the f expression of, of the findings was inaccurate, but I did then volunteer that I thought they were talking about the desire to have more information put out. But it wasn't my purpose to put out more information. Well, Mr. Barr, your, yes. I feel that your answer was purposely misleading, and I think others do too. Uh, let me ask you another one. You said the president is fully cooperating with an investigation, but his attorney had told a defendant he'd be taken care of if he didn't cooperate with the investigation. Is there a conflict in that? I'm sorry, could you just repeat Both that? Both Mr. Manafort and Mr. Cohen were told by Trump's personal attorney they'd be taken care of uh, if they uh, did not cooperate. You said that the president was fully cooperating. Is there a conflict there? Yes or no? No. Okay. Do you think it's fully cooperating to instruct a former aide to tell the attorney general to unrecuse himself, shut down the investigation, and declare the president did nothing wrong? Uh, I don't think, uh, well, obviously, since I didn't find it, it was obstruction. I felt that it, the evidence could not support an I'm obstruction. I'm asking if that's fully cooperating. Yeah. I'm not asking if that's obstruction. Is that fully cooperating? Yeah, he fully cooperated. So by instructing a former aide to tell the attorney general to unrecuse himself, shut down the investigation, and declare the president did nothing wrong, that's fully cooperating. Where is that in the report? That is on um, pay, uh, volume two, page five. On June 19, 2017, the president dictated a message uh, for Lewandowski to yeah. deliver to Sessions. The message said the Sessions should publicly announce the notwithstanding his recusal from the Russian investigation. The investigation is very unfair to the president. The president did nothing wrong. Right. That's, okay, that's so. Cooperating. Well, f firstly, asking Sessions to unrecuse himself, I, we do not think is obstruction. And, and declare the president did nothing wrong. I'm not asking you if it's obstruction. He's uh, cooperating. Well, I, I don't know if that declares the president did nothing wrong, although the president, in terms of collusion, did nothing wrong. Isn't that correct? Well, collusion is not a crime. It's the uh, obstructing. But is that fully cooperating to, to say that? Well, I don't see any conflict between that and fully cooperating with the investigation. The uh, president, of course, declared many times publicly in tweets and that and campaign rallies and all that he would testify fully what he never did testify correct uh, as far as i know well, i think you know whether he testified or as not. far as i know he didn't testify 
and uh, Mr. Mueller found the written answers to be inadequate. Is that correct? Uh, I think he wanted uh, additional, but he never sought it. And the president never tested. Well, he he, he never he never pushed it. The president never tested. Um, does the fact that uh, Mr. Mueller found the Trump campaign was receptive to some of the offers of assistance from Russia, or the fact that the Trump campaign never reported any of this to the FBI, does that trouble you? What would they report to the FBI? That they were receptive to offers of assistance from Russia. What do you mean by receptive? I think the report says, uh, you know, obviously, uh, well, they obviously they were they were expecting to benefit from whatever the Russians. Page 173, the uh, volume one the report says, in some the investigation has have multiple links between Trump campaign officials and individuals tied to the Russian government. Those links included Russian offers of assistance to the campaign. And in some instances, the campaign was receptive to the offer, whereas others, they were not. Well, I, I, that doesn't bother you at all. Well, I have to under, understand exactly what that refers to, what, what, what communications that referred to. Well, you have the report. I just gave you the page for the report. And I, I know my time is up, and I'm making the chairman no, nervous. No, no, just very well done. <laughs> Senator Cornyn. General Barr, the chairman has pointed out that after the Hillary Clinton email investigation, there were a number um, at Mr. Comey's press conference, I think it was July the 5th, roughly 2016, there were a number of prominent Democratic members of the Senate who said that Comey should be, uh, should resign um, or be fired. Um, I believe you said that you've concluded as a matter of law that the president, as the head of the executive branch of government, has the right to, to fire executive branch employees. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That's right. In this case, the president was relying, at least in part, on a recommendation by the deputy attorney general, uh, Rod Rosenstein, arising out of uh, Rod Rosenstein's critique of uh, Mr. Comey's conduct uh, in holding that press conference, releasing derogatory information about Secretary Clinton but then announcing that no reasonable prosecutor would bring charges against her. Is that right? That's right. You started your career, I believe, uh, in the intelligence community and then moved on, of course, to the Department of Justice. And uh, thank you for agreeing to serve again <laughs> as Attorney General and help restore uh, the department's reputation as an impartial arbiter of the law and not as a political arm of any administration. I think that's very, very important that you and Director Ray uh, continue your efforts in that regard, and I'm grateful to you uh, for you. that. But I do believe that we need to uh, ask the question, why didn't the Obama administration do more uh, as early as 2014 in investigating Russian efforts uh, to prepare to undermine and sow dissension in the 2016 uh, election. Uh, Mr. Mueller's report does document that the uh, 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 Russian government through the intelligence, uh, through their intelligence agencies and their internet research, or IRA I think it's called, uh, began as early as 2014, began their efforts to do so. And we know they met with uh, some success. Is it any, um, surprise to you based on your experience that the Russians would try to do everything they can uh, to sow dissension in American political life, including uh, in our elections? No, not at all. I mean, uh, I think the, the internet uh, creates a lot more opportunities to, to, to have a, you know, to have that kind of covert effect uh, on American body politics. So it's getting more and more dangerous, but the Russians have been at this for a long time in various different ways. But the point you made about uh, Bob Mueller's efforts on IRA, that's one of the things that struck me about the report. I think it's very impressive work that they did in, in moving quickly uh, to, get into the, uh, to get into the IRA and also the, the, the GRU folks. And I was thinking to myself, if that had been done 
in 2000, you know, starting in the beginning of 2016, uh, we would have been a lot further along. For example, we've heard a lot about the Steele dossier. Um, Mr. Steele, of course, is a former British intelligence officer hired by, uh, to do opposition research uh, by the Hillary Clinton campaign on, um, on her political adversaries, including uh, President Trump or candidate Trump at that time. How do we know that the Steele dossier is not itself evidence of Russian disinformation campaign, knowing what we know now that basically the allegations made in, therein were secondhand hearsay or unverified? Can uh, we state with confidence that the, Russian, that the Steele dossier was not part of the Russian disinformation campaign? No, I can't state that with confidence, and, and that is one of the uh, areas that I'm reviewing uh, I'm concerned about it and, it, and and I don't think it's entirely speculative. Well, we know that uh, from published reports that uh, the head of the, uh, the CIA, Mr. Brennan, the, um, uh, went to President Obama and brought his concerns about initial indications of Russian involvement in the campaign as early as the late of July, late July 2016, and instead of doing more during the Obama administration to look into that and disrupt and deter Russian activities that threatened the validity and integrity of our campaign in 2016. It appears to me that um, um, the Obama administration, Justice Department, and uh, FBI decided to place their bets on Hillary Clinton and focus their efforts on investigating the Trump campaign. But as you have pointed out, thanks to the general Thanks to the special counsel, we now have confidence that no Americans colluded with the Russians in their effort to undermine the American people. Uh, we now need to know, and I'm glad to hear what you are telling us about your um, inquiries and your research and your investigation. We now need to know what steps the Obama, FBI, Department of Justice, and intelligence community, what steps they took to undermine the political process and put a thumb on the scale in favor of one political candidate over the other, and that would be before and after the, um, the 2016 election. What's the, a defensive briefing that uh, in a counterintelligence investigation? Well, you could have different kinds of defensive briefings. Um, if, if, if you learn that somebody is being targeted by a hostile intelligence service, uh, then one form of in defensive briefing is to go and to alert that person to the risks. I think Attorney General Lynch has said it, would, it is routine in counterintelligence investigations. Would you agree with her? Yes. Do you know whether a defensive briefing was ever given to the Trump campaign by the FBI based on their counterintelligence investigation? Did they ever tell the president before he was um, January 2017 what the Russians were trying to do and advise him to tell people affiliated with this campaign to be on, on their guard and be vigilant about Russian efforts to undermine public confidence in the election? My understanding is that didn't ha happen. That would be an ex that failure to pr provide a defensive briefing to the Trump campaign that would be an extraordinary or notable uh, failure. Would you agree? I think under these circumstances, it's one of the things that I can't fathom why it, why it did not happen. If you're concerned about interference in the election uh, and you have you know, substantial people involved in the campaign who were former U.S. attorneys, you had three former U.S. attorneys there uh, in the campaign, I, I don't understand why uh, the Bureau would not have gone and, and uh, given a defensive briefing. Thank you. Senator Durbin. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, General Barr. I've been listening carefully to my Republican colleagues on the other side, and it appears that they are going to work together and coordinate the so-called locker-up defense. Uh, this is really not supposed to be about the Mueller investigation, the Russian involvement in the election, the Trump campaign, and so forth. It is really about Hillary Clinton's emails. Finally, we get down to the bottom line. Uh, Hillary Clinton's emails and questions uh, have to be asked about Benghazi along the way. What about Travelgate, water, Whitewater? There's a lot of material we should be going through today according to their response to this. 
that is totally unresponsive to the reality of what the American people want to know. They paid a lot of money, $25 million for this report. I respect Mr. Mueller and believe he came up with a sound report, though I don't agree with all of it. But I find, General Barr, that some of the things that you've engaged in uh, really leave me wondering what you believe your role as Attorney General is when it comes to something like this. Listen to what, uh, since it's put in the record, let me read it. Listen to what you received in a letter on March 27th from Bob Mueller. The summary letter the department sent to Congress and released to public late in the afternoon, March 24th, did not fully capture the context, nature, and substance of the office's work and conclusions. We communicated that concern to the department on the morning of March 25th. There is now public confusion about critical aspects of the results of our investigation. This threatens to undermine a central purpose for which the department appointed the special counsel, to assure full public confidence in the outcome of the investigations. I cannot imagine that you received that letter on March 24th and could not answer Congressman Chris directly when he asked you whether there were concerns about representations being made on these findings by the people working for Bob Mueller. You said, no, I don't know, after you received this letter. What am I missing? Well, I, as I explained to, uh, as I explained to uh, Senator Leahy, uh, I talked directly to Bob, and Bob told me that he did not have uh, objections to the accuracy Attorneys of don't put things in writing unless they're pretty serious about them. Well, There's an old rule in politics, a good politician doesn't write a letter and doesn't throw one away. Okay. So I've got to ask you, if he puts it in writing of his concerns or your representations on March 24th, you couldn't recall that when Congressman Chris asked you that question a few days later? No, I'm saying that this was, uh, the, the, uh, the March 24th letter stated that Bob Mueller did not reach a conclusion on obstruction. And it had the language in there about not exonerating the president. Uh, my view of events was that there was a lot of criticism of uh, the special counsel for the ensuing few days. And on Thursday, I, I got this letter. Uh, and when I talked to the special counsel about the letter, my understanding was his concern was not the accuracy of the statement of the findings in my letter, but that he wanted more out there to provide additional context to explain his reasoning on why he didn't reach a decision on obstruction. I'll just say this, uh, Mr. Barr. If you received a letter from Bob Mueller a few days after your March 24th letter, it was clear he had some genu genuine concerns about what you had said and done to that point. Can we move to another topic? Yeah, his concerns was he wanted more out. And I, I would analogize it to this. My, you know, after, after a you know, months-long trial, if, if, if I wanted to go out and get out to the public what the verdict was pending preparation of the full transcript, and I'm out there saying, here's the verdict, and the prosecutor comes up and taps me on the shoulder and says, well, the verdict doesn't really fully capture all my work. How about that great you know, cross-examination I did? Or how about that third day of trial where I did that? This doesn't capture everything. My answer to that is I'm not trying to capture everything. I'm just trying to state the verdict. No, you just absolutely used the word summarize, though, in your letter. Summarize the principal conclusions. Principal conclusions, which most people would view as a summary. But l let me move to another topic, if I can, for a minute. The Office of Legal Counsel's decision as to whether or not you can prosecute a sitting president, you had some pretty strong feelings of that, and they were reflected in your volunteered memo to the Trump defense team, uh, your 19-page memo. Did I, did I discuss that? You certainly discussed whether or not a president should cooperate with an investigation. You said at one point in, in summarizing the findings of Mueller that the White House fully cooperated. We know for a fact, and you've stated already, the president never uh, submitted himself to what was characterized as a vital interview, uh, an actual sit-down interview under oath, not once, and that his questions uh, that, that were answered some 30 times, his memory failed him. So to say the White House fully cooperated that, I think, is a general, generous conclusion. On this Office of Legal Counsel, I would refer you to this volume two of the uh, Mueller report, and on page one, he talks about the whole issue of whether or not he was in any way restricted and what he could conclude because of the, pen, or the 
uh, outstanding Office of Legal Counsel opinion on the liability of a sitting president. You dismissed that in your opening statement and said we asked him two or three times, he said that, that had nothing to do with it. Well, how do you explain on the first page of volume two that he says it had a lot to do with it? It's a reason he couldn't reach a binary conclusion on obstruction of justice. No, well, no, it was a prudential reason, uh, one of the backdrop uh, uh, factors that he cited as uh, influencing his prudential judgment that he should not reach a decision, which is different than citing the OLC, uh, uh, saying that but for the OLC opinion, uh, I would uh, indict. I'm just going to stand by what he has written, and I ask others to read it as well. The last point I want to make is about Don McGahn. If you read the section here, 100 pages 113 to 120, on Don McGahn's experience, the president wanted him to state publicly that the New York Times article was, it was untrue, that he had not asked McGahn to fire the special counsel. McGahn refused, and there's some speculation as to whether he risked uh, uh, being dismissed or even resigning over this issue. And for you to suggest that this was some sort of a kabuki dance with Rob Rosenstein, I think the president's intent here was very clear. He wanted this to end. He told Lester Holt, going back to the uh, issue that was raised by the chairman earlier here, the reason to get rid of Comey is because of the Russian investigation. I mean, over and over again, this president was very explicit, and it certainly is very expository in his style. So I don't understand. Let me ask you this. In conclusion, my time is up. Do you have any objections? Can you think of an objection of why Don McGahn shouldn't come and testify before this committee about his experience? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I think that he's, he, he, he's a close advisor to the president. Never, and the president never exerted executive privilege. Excuse me? He may have already waived his executive No, we haven't privilege. waived executive privilege. Well, at this point, do you believe you're saying, Don, what about Bob Mueller? Should he be allowed to testify before this? I've already said publicly. I have no objection to him. And Don McGahn, should he be allowed to testify? Uh, well, that's a call for the president to make. Well, he's a private citizen at this point, as I understand. Well, I assume he'd be testifying about privileged matters. Well, I, I would hope that we could get to the bottom of this with actual testimony of witnesses after we've taken another close look to Hillary Clinton's emails. Thank you. We might do that. Uh, Senator Lee. In his classic dissent in Morrison v. Olson, Justice Scalia remarked that nothing is so politically effective as the ability to charge that one's opponent and his associates are not merely wrong-headed, naive, and ineffective, but in all probability, crooks. And nothing so effectively gives an appearance of validity to such charges as a Justice Department investigation. That observation has, I think, been borne out time and time again over the past two years. Uh, time and time again, uh, the President's political adversaries have exploited the Mueller probe, its mere existence, uh, to spread baseless innuendo in an effort to undermine the legitimacy of the 2016 election and the effectiveness of this administration. For example, on January 25th, 2019, Speaker Nancy Pelosi asked, what does Putin have on the president politically, personally, or financially? Uh, Mr. Attorney General, is, is there any evidence to suggest that Vladimir Putin, quote unquote, has something on President Trump? None that I'm aware of. On February 20th, 2019, former FBI D Deputy Director Andrew McCabe said on national television to the entire nation that he thinks it's possible that Donald Trump is a Russian agent. Mr. Attorney General, is there any evidence that you're aware of that suggests even remotely that President Trump is a Russian agent? None that I'm aware of. Representative Eric Swalwell has repeatedly claimed that Donald Trump, quote, acts on Russia's behalf. Attorney General Barr, is there anything you're aware of to back that up by way of evidence? That the president acts on Russia's behalf. None that I'm aware of. So basically, we've heard over and over again on national TV, in committee hearings, on the House and Senate floor, uh, and in the media. And we, we've heard about the president's alleged collusion with Russia. Um, but what we have heard is as baseless as any conspiracy theory that we've seen in politics, any that I can think of. The only difference here is that the purveyors of this conspiracy were, in many cases, 
prominent members of the opposition party. That's concerning. Now, from the beginning, there were some indications that the Russia investigation was perhaps not always conducted with the absolute impartiality that the American people should expect and have come to hope uh, to find in existence uh, within the Department of Justice, especially given that the track record of excellence that the U.S. Department of Justice has shown. According to the Mueller report itself, the investigation into the Trump campaign began on July 31st, 2016, after a foreign government contacted the FBI about comments made by George Papadopoulos. Is that accurate, uh, or, or were there other precipitating events that helped lead to this? That is, that is the account that is, has been given in the past as to how it got going. Now, you, you've previously said that you think it's possible that the Federal Bureau of Investigation improperly spied on the Trump campaign. I assume that's a reference uh, to the FISA warrant for Carter Page. Is, is that what you have in mind, or are there other circumstances that you've got in mind there? Well, one of the things I want to look, uh, there are people, many people seem to assume uh, that the only uh, intelligence collection that occurred was the, uh, a single um, confidential informant and a FISA warrant. I'd like to find out whether that is in fact true. It strikes me as a fairly anemic effort if that was the counterintelligence effort designed to stop the threat as it's being represented. Was Carter Page under surveillance uh, uh, during his time working for the Trump campaign, which was uh, roughly January 2016 to September 2016? I don't know. Was any other Trump campaign official uh, under surveillance during that time period, to your knowledge? Well, th these are the, the things that I, I need to, to look at. And I have to say that, as I've said before, you know, the extent that there was any overreach, I believe uh, it, it was uh, some a few people in the in the upper echelons of, of uh, the bureau and and perhaps the department, uh, but those people are no longer there. And uh, I'm working closely with Chris Ray, who I think has done a superb job at the bureau, and uh, we're working uh, together on trying to reconstruct uh, exactly what went down. One thing people should know is that. Uh, the Bureau itself has been a little bit handicapped in looking back because of the pending Mueller investigation and the OIG investigation. As we know, the FISA warrant for Carter Page was based largely on the so-called Steele dossier, uh, and in particular on two specific facts about Page's trip to Moscow uh, to deliver a speech in July 2016. First, according to the warrant, Page had a secret meeting with Igor Sechin, the president of Rosneft. Does the Mueller report confirm that Page met with Sechin? Met with who? With, 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 uh, with Mr. Mr. Sechin, with Igor Sechin. Yeah, I, I, can't, I can't recall, but I, I don't remember that. Let me just say that I want to stay away from getting too deeply into the, uh, the FISA issue, because that's currently under investigation by the OIG. Understood. Second, and more importantly, the, the warrant also says that Page met with, uh, with Igor uh, Devyekin in order to discuss uh, what is referred to as compromat involving Hillary Clinton, against Hillary Clinton. Uh, does the Mueller report confirm that Page met with Devyekin? I don't think so. Does it confirm that Page discussed compromat on Hillary Clinton with anyone? Not that I recall. So since the main evidentiary support for the warrant has been discussed by the Mueller report, which is sort of the gold standard of what we're discussing here, I'm, I, I'm glad that you're looking into it. I'd encourage you to look into why the FBI relied on this false information. And, and I hope you'll share the results. The, the public obviously has a right to know what happened here. The U.S. Department of Justice and the Federal Bureau of Investigation have a long history and a long history of success that has been based on respect. They deserve to understand that there's not so much power that's been concentrated in that one agency, that the outcome of, a, of an investigation can depend on the whims of who might be assigned to it. They have a right not to believe that a particular investigation might be struck and paged, might not be tarmacked, not, might, might 
not be influenced by an improper consideration, politically or otherwise. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. Uh, Senator Whitehouse, I'm told we're going to have two votes beginning at 1145. We'll uh, do Senator Whitehouse, and why don't we just come back uh, an hour later. We'll break, break for an hour and do the votes and have lunch. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. Attorney General, you um, had a conversation with Chairman Graham earlier this morning in which you described the importance of, to use Chairman Graham's words, hardening our electoral infrastructure against foreign election interference. Uh, I ask you, is anonymous election funding an avenue for possible foreign election influence and interference? Yes. Um, let's turn to the uh, March 27th letter, which you received and read March 28th, the Mueller letter, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Um, when did you have the conversation with Bob Mueller about that letter that you've referenced? I think it was on the 28th. Same day that you read it? When did you first learn of the New York Times and Washington Post stories that would make the existence of this letter public, the ones that came out last night? I think it could have been yesterday, but I'm not sure. When they contacted you to ask for any comment? They didn't contact me. Contacted DOJ to ask for any comment? I can't actually remember how it came up, but someone mentioned it. So you, at some point you knew that the Mueller letter was going to become public, and that was probably yesterday? I think so. Okay. Uh, when did you decide to make that letter available to us in Congress? This morning. Um, would you concede that you had an opportunity to make this letter public on April 4th when Representative Christ asked you a very related question? Uh, I don't know what you mean by related question. It seems to me it'd be a very different question. I can't even follow that down the road. That, I mean, boy, that's a masterful hair splitting. Um, the... Um, Letter references enclosed documents and enclosed materials, right? Are those the same things as what you called the executive summaries that Mueller provided you? With this letter? Yes. Yes. It's all the same document. I'm sorry. What's when you involved? talk about the executive summaries that Mueller provided you, they are the documents that were the enclosed documents with that letter which we have not been provided. I think they were. The, uh, we have been provided them. They're in the report. They're the summaries in the report. It's the language of the report in the report? There's nothing else that he provided you then? I, I think that's what he provided. Okay. Uh, if there is anything else, will you provide it to us? If it's different in any form, it's odd to be given a letter without the attachments to it when the attachments I think are I think they the were letter. the redacted versions of the we get executive that? summaries that are embedded in the report. Can we get that, just to be sure? Sure. Great, thank you. Um, you agree that none of that material was either grand jury 6E or presented a risk to uh, intelligence sources and methods or would interfere or compromise ongoing investigation there, or affected, were affected by executive privilege? There were redactions made in the... Uh, executive summaries. The, but as I said, I'm, I wasn't interested in putting out summaries, period. Well, you know, we and, can, and frankly, this is another hair-splitting exercise because Bob Mueller, who I think we all agree is fairly credible, actually described your letter as a summary. So you can say it wasn't a summary, but Mueller said it was a summary. And I don't think... I wasn't, really I wasn't interested in summarizing the whole report. As I say, I was stating the, the bottom-line conclusions of the report. Your letter and itself I, and I, says that it's intended to describe... I quote your words. To yeah, describe, describe, the report. describe the report, meaning volume one dealt when with this. When you describe the report in four pages, and it's a 400-page report, I don't know why you're caviling about whether because it's a summary I, because or Because I state in the letter that I'm stating the, the uh, principal conclusions. Um, Let the, me also say that, you know, Bob Mueller is the equivalent of a U.S. attorney. He was exercising the powers of the attorney general subject to the supervision of the attorney general. He's part of the Department of Justice. His work concluded when he sent his report to the Attorney General. At that point, it was my baby, and I was making a decision as to whether or not to make it public, and I effectively overrode the regulations, used discretion to, to lean as far forward as I could, 
could to make that public, and it was my decision how and when to make it public, not Bob Mueller's. With respect to the OLC opinion that informed Bob Mueller's decision, as he describes in the report, um, do you agree that that is merely an executive opinion and that under our Constitution, the decision as to what the law is, is made by the judicial branch of the United States government? I'm sorry, could you? With respect to the OLC opinion that informed Mueller's decision not to make a recommendation on obstruction, as he said in his report, do you concede that that is an executive opinion and that under our constitutional system, what the law is gets decided by the judicial branch of government? Yes. Is there any way for the OLC's opinion to be tested by the judicial branch of government to see if it's correct or not? None that comes to mind. And it could be wrong, could it not? Uh, I guess hypothetically it could be wrong. And certainly o there OLC are respected right. legal minds that disagree with it, correct? Excuse me? There are many respected legal commentators and professors and lawyers who disagree with it, correct? It's very hard to find lawyers that agree to any, uh, well. on, a, on anything. So um, the interesting thing to me is that it goes on to say that because of the OLC opinion, we have to give the president an extra benefit of the doubt because he is denied his day in court where he could exonerate himself. That seems like a fallacy to me because if you are the President of the United States, you can either waive or readily override the OLC opinion and say, I'm ready to go to trial. I want to exonerate myself. Let's go. Could you not? How is this relevant to my decisions? It's Be relevant because, because I, I assumed that there was no OLC opinion. Well, we have a report in front of us that says that this influenced the outcome. And in particular, it says it influenced the outcome because it deprived the president of his ability to have his day in court. And my point to you is that the president could easily have his day in court by simply waiving or overriding this OLC opinion that has no judicial basis, correct? Uh, well, I don't, I don't think that there was anything to have a day in court on. I, don't, I, I, I think that the government did not have a prosecutable case. But part well, Mueller obviously didn't agree because he no, that's left that true. up to you. Well, that, well, He said that he could neither confirm nor deny that there was a prosecutable case here. He left that to you. And when he did, he said, and you apparently have agreed, that this OLC opinion bears on it and that it would be unfair to the president to put him to the burden of being indicted and not having the ability to be charged. I don't want to characterize how, how Bob's thought process on this. I'm not asking you to characterize it. It's in, the, it's in his report. He's put it in writing. I'm not sure what he means by that in the report. Um, with respect to the word, um, can I have a minute? I just want to nail down, you used the word spying mm -hmm. about authorized DOJ investigative activities. Are you talking about my testimony before yes. the House Appropriations? Yes. Okay. In the entirety of your previous career in the Department of Justice, including as Attorney General, have you ever referred to authorized department investigative activities officially or publicly as spying? I'm not asking for private conversation. No, I'm not going to abjure the use of the word spying. I think. Uh, you know, my first job was in CIA, and I don't think the word spying has any pejorative connotation at all. To me, but the, you question, to, to me the question is always whether or not it's authorized and, and adequately predicated spying. Uh, I think spying is a good English word that, in fact, doesn't have synonyms because it is the broadest word uh, in, incorporating really all forms of covert intelligence collection. So I'm not going to back off the word spying, except I will say when did you I'm not suggesting any pejorative, and I use it frequently, when as, do media, as when, do media. When did you decide to use it? Was it off the cuff in the hearing that day, or did you go into that hearing intending it, it to was, use the word spying? It was spying? actually off the cuff, to tell you the truth, and when, when, when a senator, the, the senator, I mean, the, the, uh, the person, Congressman, probably? Well, from Schatz, from Hawaii. Who was here? Shaheen. Shaheen? No, no, no. no. Whoever it was, go ahead. Yeah, when, she, when, when, when he challenged me and said, do you want to change your language, I was actually thinking, like, what's the issue? I, I don't consider it a pejorative. But if, and You're rather, frankly, frankly, we went back and looked at press usage, and up until all the 
the FAW outrage a couple of weeks ago. It's commonly used in the press to refer to authorized activities, such as referring but to the But it's not FISA commonly court used by the department. Court. What? It is not commonly used by the department. My time is Commonly up. used by me. Thank you very much. We'll come back at uh, 10 to 1. Thank you. You're watching Washington Post live coverage of Attorney General William Barr testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Chairman Lindsey Graham just called for a break. The Senate has a couple of votes. I'm Emily Heil. We'll be back with that live and uninterrupted coverage um, when the committee resumes its hearing. In the meantime, I'm joined by my colleague Amber Phillips from The Fix, which is the Post Political Analysis blog. Let's, there's so much to unpack from this hearing this morning. Let's start off at the top with uh, Chairman Lindsey Graham's opening statement. If there was any sense that this wasn't going to be a partisan hearing that went out the window as soon as he opened his mouth, what struck you about his opening statement? Uh, yeah, I have to say everything. Uh, the chairman, <laughs> you know, listen, he's been a friend of Trump's for a while now, so it's not a surprise he'd be a defender of Trump. But the way Lindsey Graham just completely undid all the facts of the Mueller report and misstated key findings, um, was stunning, even for like typical partisanship in the Senate. And you've been at your desk essentially writing a fact check, right? Of, right. of this opening statement. What are, this, what are a couple things that, that you point out um, that he got wrong? Uh, the big, big conclusions of the Mueller report. Number one, Lindsey Graham said Mueller found there was no collusion. That's just not true. Mueller wasn't looking for collusion because mm -hmm. that's not even a legal term. That's a term that's on Trump's Twitter feed. Right. And that's it. Um, and, and Mueller also did say that, you know, Trump's campaign was welcoming Russian help. So for Lindsey Graham to go out there and say, I think his quote was, no collusion, no conspiracy, um, he's all clear, is completely disingenuous. Um, Lindsey Graham also spent a ton of time looking way back before the Mueller report at the 2016 elections and the origin of this entire Russian probe within mm -hmm. the FBI. Um, there is an internal investigation in the Justice Department into this, into how the probe got started, but as of now, there's no indication there was wrongdoing. This is firmly in conservative conspiracy theory land that there were FBI agents out to get President Trump and then created this whole fake reason to surveil one of his former campaign aides, and, and they kept getting the this independent court to agree to yes let's do this surveillance even though there's it's baseless and like it just is conspiracy theories piled upon conspiracy theory we've got some of this tape let's pull that up i think this might actually have an f-bomb so maybe we've leaped it out let's take a listen to what uh senator graham had the to other say campaign. the other campaign was investigated not by mr Mueller, by people within the department of justice the accusation against the Clinton, Secretary Clinton, was that she set a private server up somewhere in her house and classified information was on it to avoid the disclosure requirements and the transparency requirements required of being Secretary of State. So that was investigated. What do we know? We know that the person in charge of investigating hated Trump's guts. I don't know how Mr. Mueller felt about Trump, but I don't think anybody on our side believes that he had a personal animosity toward the president to the point he couldn't do his job. This is what Strzok said on February the 12th, 2016. Now, he's in charge of the Clinton email investigation. Oh, he's Trump's abysmal. I keep hoping the charade will end and people will just dump him. February the 12th, 2016. Page is the uh, Department of Justice lawyer assigned to this case. March 3rd, 2016. God, Trump is a loathsome human being. Struck. Oh my God, Trump's an idiot. Page, he's awful. Struck. God, Hillary, should win 100 million to nothing. Compare those two people to Mueller. 
Amber, what's your take on, on this? And first of all, remind us what we were listening to. It's been a while since we've heard those names, Page and Strzok. Um, what, was, uh, what was the point that the chairman was making here? Sure, he was reading a text from former FBI agents who were texting each other throughout the 2016 campaign. And um, Peter Strzok in particular was integral in a, a part of the team investigating Hillary Clinton's emails and then President Trump and Russian election interference, uh, they criticized the heck out of Trump. They did not like Trump. And so in their private text over FBI phones, they said all the stuff that Lindsey Graham just read out loud. Uh, the implication being here that because these two people privately didn't like Trump, they couldn't do their jobs impartially investigating Trump, and thus the entire FBI can't do its job impartially investigating Trump. And I guess he was trying to draw um, a contrast uh, between them and uh, Mueller, who they who is credible because he's never expressed that kind of animosity. Right, exactly. And and Robert Mueller it should be pointed out when he found out about these private texts, um, basically kicked Peter Strzok off the team. Mm -hmm. he's, they're no longer a part of the FBI. But Lindsey Graham's broader he was sort of building into a broader argument, which is we can't trust back in 2016 the origins of this investigation. In, into Trump election interference. So he's not calling into question, it's a tricky line to walk, as you point out, he's not calling into question the Mueller report um, because, politically speaking, it, it, he, Trump and, and his allies argue it exonerates him. Um, but he is calling into question how this whole thing got started in the first place. That's, like I said earlier, it's a prominent um, conspiracy on the conservative side. It's something that Trump elevates all the time. It's also extraordinarily dated when you step back and look at the reason we're having this hearing, which is a 400-page report by an independent investigator found that the president potentially committed crimes, lied to the American people, and obstructed the rule of law. And yet the chairman is talking about something that took place long before that has been sort of superseded, is what you're saying. Exactly, and, and is arguably way down the totem pole of, you know, prominent questions in, into American democracy. I was also struck by something else he said, uh, Lindsey Graham, I, for me, it, it is over, mm -hmm. is what he said of, of uh, you know, the entire investigation. So for him, this is a closed book. What did you make of that statement? Yeah, this is Lindsey Graham saying, if you guys, House Democrats, want to consider impeaching Trump, it's not getting past the House. It's not getting to my committee because we're t spending all this time talking about Lindsey Graham because he is the chair of the committee that would lead impeachment proceedings against a, a president um, after the House votes to impeach President Trump. And so what he's saying is it stops there. I have no interest in this. I don't even want to talk about the Mueller report anymore. There were no crimes committed. Nobody was charged. So why are we talking about this? Um, uh, and then he went on to say he's going to spend most of his time on this committee focusing at the origins of the FBI probe and specifically how the FBI got those warrants to surveil uh, key people within the Trump administration. And what, what is he looking for there? I mean, what, is the, what will be the focus of, of that investigation? Yeah, he laid it out right, uh, right there. He wants to see if there was any political leanings one way or the other, or actually I should say he wants to see if there was anti-Trump political inclinations that could have exploited the investigation and, and made everything on this house of cards that's going to topple. Um, there's no evidence of that right now, but Lindsey Graham is intent on investigating it. And I think what he showed today is he's intent on doing that because he's an ally of President Trump and wants to defend President Trump against the backdrop of a damaging Mueller report. And, and is there hunger for that kind of investigation beyond Lindsey Graham? On the Republican side, absolutely. Yeah, you see that um, in the House and in the Senate, and he's one of the top figures in the Senate who's going to be leading this conversation. So, yeah, th this is what Trump wants, and therefore it's what Lindsey Graham wants. I mean, he's made himself a lackey of the president today. And uh, we're also bringing in uh, our colleague Roz Helderman. Roz, thank you for joining us. Roz is a reporter covering the Russia investigation. Roz, I'm sure you've been watching this morning too. What were you struck by? Uh, you know, I'm struck by uh, Bill Barr's um, sort of antagonistic uh, tone and, um, uh, you know, some of the parsing he's doing. We had an interesting moment right there at the end uh, where uh, Sheldon Whitehouse at one point sort of said with exasperation, that's a master hair splitting. 
Uh, and I think when you know the backstory of some of these things, he, he's not wrong about that. I mean, this whole issue of uh, was uh, was a uh, uh, special counsel Mueller upset or was he not? And and this letter that we got last night or first indications of last night and then came out this morning from the special counsel expressing his displeasure with the way the attorney general has handled this is really very striking. Uh, and we've only sort of scratched the surface, I think, of the conversations that are going to come in this hearing about that issue. Is that sort of the danger or the just sort of the fact of interviewing a master lawyer is that you're going to get hair splitting? Uh, yeah, I mean, Bill Barr is very is a very talented lawyer, and he's showing himself uh, to be that. You know, you see these moments where, uh, as they start to get into some of the particular episodes described in the Mueller report, and uh, might those or might those not, um, uh, you know, constitute obstruction of justice, you can sort of see the senators who are themselves lawyers and their ability to kind of scrap with him in a way that the senators who are not lawyers, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I think are having a more difficult time. Uh, I've also noticed that, and this is not exactly shocking to anyone who's ever covered Congress or watched Congress, that uh, their factual handle on the exact details of the report uh, is not in every instance perfect. Uh, and I think if they want to kind of engage in a conversation on the details with Bill Barr, it's going to have to be perfect. And so you've seen moments where, uh, you know, he, he is in fact slightly misdescribing the evidence that Bob Mueller found and wrote about in his report, but it doesn't seem as though the senators are familiar enough with the report to be able to tell him so. Is this why, uh, when we're looking at the potential testimony tomorrow before the House Committee, that he's trying to avoid uh, being questioned by a staff attorney rather than members? who, like you said, very uh, politely there, that sometimes they don't always have the exact grasp or can't put their fingers on the exact uh specific details from the the report itself to pin him down. Yeah, I've really been struck watching this morning uh, uh, with a sort of a, an understanding both of why the Democratic congressman would like for him to be questioned by a lawyer, yeah, a lawyer who's both going to have a very strong grasp of the facts, but also a grasp of the law and mm -hmm. be able to, to kind of go back and forth with him at that level, mm -hmm. uh, and also why Bill Barr would prefer not to be questioned in that way. Right, right. Well, I was going to ask yeah. Roslyn, because you've been focusing on this. I feel like uh, Bill Barr came into this very weak, right? On the eve of this, there was a letter saying Mueller was super unhappy with his characterization of all this. And yet there haven't been any punches landed by Democrats on Bill Barr. As you point out, he's super loyally and been able mm -hmm. to deflect a lot of this, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's not been one clear takeaway from me yet. Yeah, I mean, the back and forth on the letter has probably come closest, but it's interesting, you know, over and over again, we get these instances where we have writing from Mueller, and then we have Bill Barr telling us what what Bob Mueller really means. So I do think that the pressure is just going to skyrocket after this to hear directly from Bob Mueller himself. So in the case of the lawyer, uh, I'm sorry, in the case of the letter, uh, we now have this letter that has been released that was written by uh, Bob Mueller to Bill Barr. And the letter from Mueller states very clearly that the reason for his unhappiness was Bill Barr, uh, the letter that Bill Barr put out on March 24th. That is the thing that Bob Mueller is complaining about. But now we're told by Bill Barr that, you know, they had a phone call after the letter happened and actually on the phone, you know, Mueller assured him it wasn't actually his letter. It was us in the media. We're always to blame. You know, it was the media coverage that actually upset him and that he assured him repeatedly that he felt as though his March 24th letter did not misrepresent his report. But that he rather he wanted more information. They, but he wanted just a more information. Right. So there's this there's this sort of conflict there and, and it's it's very difficult to resolve as long as uh, Bob Mueller, you know, maintains this um, this sort of stoic silence as he has all along. I mean, you know, there's nothing really stopping him if he wished to from just putting out a statement today to say what he thinks of Bill Barr's testimony. But that has not been the approach he has taken all along this investigation. I would not anticipate that that would happen, and I wouldn't anticipate that we are unlikely to get any clarity from Bob Mueller about what Bob Mueller thinks and feels unless and until he appears for testimony himself on the Hill. And that's certainly been talked about today. I know members of the committee, the Democrats, are very eager to have uh, Robert Mueller uh, sworn in and, and before them. Uh, one thing, uh, Roz, what did you make of talking about sort of points at which um, Bill Barr was, was kind of slippery here? Mm -hmm. um, the distinction that he made about his testimony before Congress 
previous testimony when he said he wasn't aware of concerns um, from um, from Mueller. Well, he's making the, the distinction now that he he wasn't aware from his, from members of his team. So he's making a distinction between members of Mueller's team and, and Mueller himself. Yeah, I found that a little hard to follow. I think that was the moment where uh, Senator Whitehouse had that had that phrase about, you know, th that's some master hair splitting. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not sure I totally followed uh, the argument that um, that Bill Barr was making. But I, I did get it enough to know that he was trying to say that, you know, he under you know, of course he was aware of the Mueller letter and he had this conversation with Mueller, but uh, he doesn't believe as though the direct and, you know, specific answer that he gave was inaccurate. Right. Uh, and let's also talk about the firing, uh, uh, the, the um, instance where President Trump directed uh, Don McGahn to, to fire Mueller. What did you make of that portion of that testimony? Yeah, that was really a moment where I was struck that um, uh, the senators, you know, need to have the report in front of them. And if they're going to ask a question about very, something very specific, they need to be referring to what the report actually says. Mm -hmm. So as I understood what Barr was saying, uh, he was saying he did not believe there was a prosecutable case uh, around the moment where uh, the president uh, tries to get Don McGahn to say that the press coverage uh, that he had been ordered to fire uh, Mueller was incorrect. Mm -hmm. There's this really striking moment where the president tries to get McGahn to like write a letter to file basically denying uh, these press accounts and, and uh, uh, McGahn refuses mm -hmm. because he believes he was in fact ordered to fire uh, to, to get to get you know to do something that would result in the firing of Bob Mueller, and that's another split hair, right? Fire Absolutely. or get rid of. Well, so so Barr's response to that seemed to be twofold. One was he said is he said that it's not clear from the evidence that the president actually did order uh, McGahn to fire Rosenstein. Um, and you know that's very debatable. Uh, there's a footnote in the report in which uh, the special counsel is sure to tell us that Don McGahn himself absolutely looked at this as an order. That is what he thought he was being asked to do. You know, people might remember there's this really vivid scene in the report that he actually it's a weekend. He actually drives to the White House to pack up his stuff because he thought he was going to have to resign because he was refusing to follow through on an order. And so you know that. What Barr described is simply not the explanation, at least that Don McGahn gave to the special counsel. The other thing he said is that he said that, uh, uh, you know, he, he essentially thought that the president had good reason to believe that the New York Times initial story about that episode was incorrect. And so, in fact, uh, you know, he might have legitimately been pushing Don McGahn to put out a story that the president believed to be true. I mean, this is just so far down the rabbit hole of splitting hairs. Um, but it's not what, you know, ultimately, it's not what Mueller found, right? Mueller refused to make the, a recommendation about whether there was a prosecutable case, but Mueller officially did say, if we believed that the president did not commit obstruction of justice, we would so state. I mean, it's not just that refused to exonerate line. He says, if we believed he did not commit obstruction of justice, we would so state. And uh, Bill Barr just disagrees with that. He, he believes that there is not a prosecutable obstruction of justice case. So these mm -hmm. things are in conflict. Uh, and after, in Mueller's report, he says, hey, I, I can't say the president is as clear of all this. Um, but it's not really my job, because you, I don't know if you can indict sitting president. He goes on to say, Congress, it's your job. Mm -hmm. Like, like, why don't you handle this? Or, or, he, it, it's like very strongly hinted at. Is that a fair way to phrase it? And speaking of Congress, actually, we're going to go. Uh, our, co our colleague Rhonda Colvin is up on Capitol Hill. I, she joins us now to talk about uh, the hearing. What in, stood out to you in that opening session, Rhonda? Emily, what's been standing out to me in the, in the opening portion of this hearing is how much our reporting from last night, where we now learned that Mueller did contact Barr about his concerns of how the AG was rolling out the release of this report, how he was very concerned that it was being mischaracterized. That's been really a, a center point in this hearing, and it's also been part of the subtext that we've seen in some of the questioning. We heard Feinstein mention our reporting, and I really think that that's something that a lot of members are paying attention to, and what might be leading to calls 
calls for Barr to resign. Uh, while the hearing was happening, we caught up with the senator who's not on the committee, but uh, he had some words for us to discuss how he thinks that uh, Barr should resign. Let's take a We've listen. We've now seen a pattern of misleading and deceptive statements uh, from Attorney General Barr, uh, beginning with the four-page letter uh, where he mischaracterized uh, Mueller's findings. Uh, and then in the hearing when I asked him about whether or not Mueller agreed with uh, his conclusions, with Attorney General Barr's conclusions, uh, he said he had no idea, even though he'd received a letter uh, from uh, Mueller indicating uh, concerns uh, with exactly that. So we cannot have an attorney general uh, that cannot be trusted uh, and an attorney general that uh, really has become the chief propagandist uh, for President Trump. Uh, we need somebody uh, who can sort of tell the truth to the American people uh, and be the people's lawyer, not the president's lawyer. So devil's advocate question, say he does step down, doesn't that create a little bit more upheaval in this whole situation, adding a new person, going through another confirmation hearing, all of that? Well, I think we have to establish the principle uh, that when an attorney general misleads the Congress and the public, uh, that they can no longer be an effective attorney general. And that's what's happened here. I mean, when the attorney general loses the trust uh, of a good part of the American population, it's time for the attorney general to go. That office uh, especially uh, needs to be one that's uh, above reproach. Uh, an office where you know that somebody is sort of calling the balls and strikes uh, in a fair way. Their, I, their whole purpose is to make sure that the scales of justice are balanced, not put their foot um, heavily down on one side, in this case for the president, um, against uh, what is the truth. Do you hope Bob Mueller um, comes and testifies to Congress? It's very important that Bob Mueller uh, testify before the United States Congress. Uh, I think that will happen. The only question is when. Uh, there have been some troubling reports that the uh, Justice Department has been slow walking uh, this issue, but I am confident at the end of the day uh, Bob Mueller will testify. And in my view, the sooner the better, uh, because every day that goes by, more misinformation uh, is put out uh, by the Attorney General. Anything stand out to you so far in Barr's testimony? Well, uh, I've seen him sort of trying to explain things that I think uh, are very difficult to uh, account for uh, and explain. Uh, I haven't heard yet a real analysis of how he reached the conclusion that uh, the, uh, the president uh, would not be liable on the obstruction of justice uh, claims, but this is going to be a long hearing, so there's plenty more to go. Now, that was Senator Van Hollen of Maryland, who discussed uh, his desire to see Barr resign. He's not the only one. In fact, just a few hours ago, we found out that uh, House Intelligence Chair uh, Adam Schiff has also asked that Barr resign. So he's one of the highest ranking members of Congress to do so. So there may be more calls to see the Attorney General uh, sit down. Thanks, Rhonda. Um, now tell us a little bit, how has the perception of William Barr changed in the months since his confirmation? Today he sounded an awful lot like a Trump partisan. That wasn't always the case. No, it wasn't, Emily. In fact, he has the distinction of being the AG twice. He was first attorney general under uh, George H.W. Bush. He had a long career in the 80s and the 90s at the DOJ as a deputy attorney general assistant. He even started as far back in the Reagan administration as a domestic policy advisor. So he's been around Washington for a very long time. He was a well-respected legal mind in Republican circles before this. And now that he has come out of retirement and, and inside this uh, investigation, this could kind of rewrite history for William Barr and what his uh, legacy is known as. Thanks so much, Rhonda. We'll be back to you soon. Uh, meanwhile, we're in studio uh, with my colleague Roz Helderin. Um, we're also joined by Aaron Blake, senior political reporter uh, writing for The Fix, which is the Post Political Analysis blog. Thanks, guys, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, so tell me, what, what, what struck you, Aaron? I think the biggest takeaway so far for me is that William Barr has been pretty unrepentant about anything. Obviously the, the report last night that we put out about the letter that Mueller sent to him is not the first instance of his actions being viewed as controversial. There was the, co the comment when 
He was testifying last month where he called it spying. Uh, he said that the, the uh, FBI had spied on the Trump campaign. He stood by that today. Uh, he offered versions of events that differed somewhat from the Mueller report and seemed to spin things in a slightly more pro-Trump direction than Mueller had. Uh, he kept doing that, which is really what he's been criticized for in the past. Uh, you know, it was, and I don't think anybody thought he was going to come up here and be a different person than he has been in the past, but I think just the, the degree of certitude that what he has done is right and correct uh, is pretty remarkable. And, and there was one point towards the end, right before the break, um, where he was talking to Senator Whitehouse about Mueller's concerns and the letter that Mueller had sent him. And uh, William Barr basically said, once William Barr, or once Mo Robert Mueller wrote that report and submitted it, uh, this was no longer his deal. This was my deal. I'm the attorney general. He is the equivalent of a U.S. attorney, which I think for Bob Mueller is probably a little bit difficult to hear. Uh, but he said it was my baby. At that point, I make the decisions about disclosure, uh, and and this is what I did. So I think he, you know, he's really hitting hitting back hard at this criticism, and I think he's a little bit miffed at how this stuff about Mueller, uh, you know, suggesting that he's been misleading people. Uh, it's it's suggested that these guys who are supposed to be friends, uh, there's a little bit of tension between the two of them, and that you know uh, William Barr is really asserting his authority here. So special counsel, not so special <laughs> after all. <laughs> I, I mean, what did you make of that, Roz? I, I, there were instances where you felt during his testimony that he was throwing Mueller under the bus. But oh yeah, I mean the "it's my baby" line, I think, is going to be a headline out of this hearing. That was really um, striking. I was also struck by how sort of dismissive he was of uh, this sort of legal framework that Mueller had arrived at, which really was extremely important to what Mueller did, which was that uh, he determined that uh, because the Department of Justice guidelines said that the uh, sitting president cannot be prosecuted, he believed that therefore he should also not make a recommendation as to whether he would be prosecuted, he should be prosecuted if he could be. And Barr sort of said repeatedly that he just kind of didn't understand that logic, he didn't understand he that surprised reasoning. that he, he was hadn't. surprised. He said the reason why he didn't reference that in his own uh, sort of now controversial four-page letter is because he didn't kind of get it himself and so he didn't want to put words in Bob Mueller's uh, mouth uh, and that ultimately he disagreed with it which is why you know he does come to a conclusion and the conclusion he comes to is that there was no prosecutable case which again you know I, I feel like that line of the report that uses the word exoneration gets a lot of attention and uh, people should pay more attention to the line where Mueller said, if we could conclude that the president did not commit obstruction of justice, we would so state. Mm -hmm. yeah, one, as long as we're on the point about uh, Mueller versus Barr and whether there's some tension here, there was another quote that I uh, read a little bit of that into. He was talking about um, Mueller's letter after the letter, after the Barr letter came out in which Mueller expressed these concerns. And he said that he had actually offered Bob Mueller the opportunity to review that letter before it came out, and he declined. Uh, you could read that as William Barr saying, look, I did my due diligence, I gave him a chance to say something beforehand. Uh, but it could also be read as him saying, well, Mueller kind of lost his chance to have any say over this whole thing. But why do, you, wh why do we think that, that Mueller chose not to review that before it it's, went out? It's a good question. I'd like to see Robert Mueller answer that question uh, if he testifies and if he's willing to answer that question. I, I think we might be, you know, a lot of people are expecting Robert Mueller to take the stand and, you know, give this rapturous, very uh, compelling testimony. I think we might be kind of disappointed by how little he's willing to say. He generally doesn't step outside of the bounds of, of what you're supposed to do. Um, you know, maybe he just decided that like William Barr said, uh, this was not his place to have a say over the release of this report and the details of it. Um, but then the fact that he would come back and then differ with how Barr actually did that, uh, you know, that would even suggest even more that there was a, a significant level of concern there. And Roz, do you get the sense that it was because he's very mindful of the parameters that he was working under, the special counsel was? Yeah, I, I do think that's the case. I think that all along uh, the, the pattern that we've seen from Bob Mueller is that he is exceptionally careful to sort of follow the rules and the regulations. And uh, my guess would be that he believed that was not an appropriate role for him, that in some sense he did agree with uh, Barr's sort of feeling that this was his 
baby, but then was taken aback by how, uh, how Barr chose to proceed with his baby. Uh, but uh, as Aaron said, you know, until we can ask that question in, uh, of Bob Mueller and hear him answer it, we're just speculating. We don't, we don't know why he decided that. And does that put us in a situation where there are two men, Mueller taking a very limited view um, of, of what he's able to say and how far he's able to go, and Barr taking a pretty expansive view of that. And so that's a little bit of the conflict. Do you see that as a case? Yeah, Aaron? and, and it's, a, it's an unusual circumstance here in which Barr essentially has a platform, um, and Mueller is not willing to use what platform he has. He's not willing to go outside the, the channels. Um, the fact that he wrote this letter in the first place, though, is, I think, extremely significant. Uh, you know, w it was mentioned in the hearing, a good politician doesn't write things down and a good Durbin's politician line. doesn't <laughs> throw things away. Uh, if you put something in writing, uh, it's generally because you want there to be a record of it. Whether you're covering yourself uh, against something happening in the future or whether you just significantly, you feel something uh, so strongly. And, and I think that it, it's easy to read that into what Mueller did here, uh, you know, especially coming from somebody who generally is very by the book and, and um, wouldn't necessarily see it as his place to do something like this. And Roz, do you, do you agree? I mean, the, the, the fact that there's a letter now memorializing that, what do you make of that? Oh, I mean, exactly what Aaron said. And in fact, the letter itself refers to the fact that the letter was not his first mode, apparently, of conveying his complaint. Right. Uh, the letter indicates that uh, he had made these complaints known As in I've some said way. Before. <laughs> right. Uh, on the day after the letter uh, was uh, was a uh, Barr's letter was submitted, uh, we haven't yet heard a question to Barr about that. I hope we do because I'd like to understand that a little bit better. I mean, he sort of has sort of hinted or suggested that he was surprised to receive this letter on March 28th, but I'm not sure why that would be if Mueller had in fact already uh, communicated his concerns and one imagines uh, he escalated to the form of a written letter because he had not gotten satisfaction. So at that point he felt as though he needed to commit it to writing so there would be a, a record for the future. So that's one question you would have for the Attorney General. I have to ask you, Roz, this would be a reporter's dream to have the Attorney General under oath before you. Um, what other questions do you have for the Attorney Attorney General, what would you ask if you were in that room? Oh my goodness, you're putting me <laughs> on the spot. I mean, you know, I would I would go through each of these moments, and um, uh, I would also um, force him to address each of the ten obstructive episodes. I mean, mm -hmm. he has mm -hmm. concluded that there was no. Uh, prosecutable case. I would have the report in front of me and describe exactly what Mueller, uh, what Mueller's team found about that case and, and force him to address it. So there's at least a public accounting from him as to why he believes uh, that those things are not crimes, uh, when in some cases it seemed pretty clear that Mueller's team did believe that the elements of the crime of obstruction were present. Mm -hmm. And Senator Leahy kind of got at one of those, uh, maybe it was Leahy or Feinstein talking about the McGahn uh, mm -hmm. instance where Trump tried to get him to deny that he got McGahn to try and fire Robert Mueller. Um, I think one of the, you know, I go back to Barr's confirmation hearings where Democrats almost seemed pleased with the answers that William Barr was giving them, even though he really didn't make any concessions. Uh, it was kind of strange to me at the time, and I wrote about it at the time. Uh, I, I think in some ways he's a very difficult person for them to pin down, and not all the questioners on that podium are doing a very good job of it, mm -hmm. uh, maybe with the exception of Sheldon Whitehouse so far. Um, Barr's response to the uh, Mueller's complaints is basically, I talked to Robert Mueller and he told me that nothing in my letter was inaccurate. Uh, that's not really the question here and that's not what Robert Mueller said in his letter. What he said was effectively that this was allowing people to be misle misled if it wasn't misleading by itself. Uh, it's entirely possible to choose from an entire document and cherry pick things that are strictly accurate but give a misleading picture of the entire document. Um, and that seems to be what Mueller is saying. I don't think I've seen the Democrats necessarily emphasize that point. And, and so when Barr keeps coming back and saying, Mueller didn't say it was inaccurate, Mueller didn't say it was inaccurate, that's not really addressing the central issue here. Right, inaccuracy is, is one thing and, and misleading is another. Right, and, and not including the uh, the actual reason that Mueller did not include, uh, not including the actual reason Mueller decided not to reach a conclusion on obstruction of justice uh, and basically letting people believe that Mueller was conflicted and couldn't decide one way or another, um, I think that's, that's maybe the key element here. And actually Barr acknowledged that at one point. He said that when he talked to Mueller on the phone, that was maybe his chief concern. 
Great, Aaron. We're going to go now to Capitol Hill. While today's hearing may be focused on the Mueller report and Russia's interference in the 2016 election, it could also have implications for the election coming up in 2020. For more on that, we're joined by The Post, Joyce Co. Joyce. Yeah, Emily, well, as you know, every move counts in the lead up to the primaries. And we are still waiting to hear from those three Democratic presidential candidates who are also on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, we'll probably be hearing from them a little bit later on since they are newer members on this committee. But those members being Senators Amy Klobuchar, Kamala Harris and Cory Booker, all expected to really use this time as they're uh, questioning William Barr as a platform to appeal to their voters, to really show their voters that they're holding the Trump administration accountable. And of course, with this Mueller letter to Barr uh, that we're hearing about, uh, kind of the 11th hour here, um, it really does bolster a lot of their questioning and, and it'll give them more content to uh, question the attorney general about. Now, it is worth mentioning as well that the special counsel's report and the uh, aftermath of the report is a huge story here in Washington, but it doesn't quite resonate the same way outside of the beltway with voters as we've seen. Uh, I, I've talked to voters and other campaign reporters have talked to voters here at the Washington Post that have said that these are not the questions that the candidates are being asked. They're really being asked more about issues that are important to them, issues like health care and immigration, jobs, uh, even social issues. They're not really being asked much about the Mueller report or even the 2016 um, uh, the 2016 Russian interference in the election. So um, one thing that we will be looking at is um, more on this uh, 2020 candidates really questioning the attorney general on this. And, and one other thing that's worth mentioning is that the Russian investigation is it was long, right? It was a nearly two years long and more than 400 pages. So uh, it's no surprise that the general public has lost a considerable amount of interest on this. So uh, while Democrats are looking to maybe remove Trump from office, one thing that um, might be easier, one way that might be easier to do that is to do it at the ballot box in 2020 instead of a process of impeachment. Emily? Great. Thanks so much, Joyce. We'll get back to you. Uh, meanwhile, I'm joined in the studio by Matt Zapotowski, reporter covering national security and the Department of Justice. Matt, thanks for joining us. Also, Aaron Blake from The Fix. Um, so, Matt, tell me, w what struck you the most from this morning? So, I hope you guys haven't already got to this, oh, but the robust defense almost that Bill Barr offered for st what I think a lot of people see as the most obstructive episodes was really remarkable to me. I mean, he had this detailed point by point in a in a light very favorable to Trump rebuttal of this episode where President Trump orders Don McGahn to have Rod Rosenstein fire Mueller and Bill, Bill Barr sort of remarkably asserts that isn't necessarily obstruction. I didn't see that as obstruction. Even removing the special counsel wouldn't be obstruction because, well, he could be replaced. I thought that was, you know, among many remarkable moments, that was what stood out to me. A and was that just because, uh, you know, because he could be replaced, also because, you know, he wasn't saying to fire uh, the special counsel, he was saying to look for a conflict of interest. Right. So what did you make of that distinction? It was for a lot of reasons. I, I, what I made was that he generally credits Trump's account and generally credits Trump's public account too, right? Like President Trump never sat down with the Mueller team and laid out, well, I dispute that, I dispute that. Uh, he just answered answered some writ written questions, said he couldn't remember a lot of written questions. So I thought it was remarkable how much he credited President Trump's account and said, look, well, he would have just been replaced. President Trump asserts that he was being treated unfairly and there was no underlying crime. So maybe President Trump was right and it wouldn't be wrong for him to want to remove Mueller in those circumstances. And it was this remarkably favorable interpretation of the facts to the president. And a, and a lot of it ran counter to what the Mueller report says, you know, explicitly. Uh, on, on five of these different areas, Mueller kind of lays out the three criteria for obstruction of justice and suggests there's evidence or substantial evidence that satisfy each of them. Uh, Barr at one point suggested he, he kind of sympathized with the idea that Trump would uh, want to combat this storyline about firing Mueller because he was concerned about bad press rather than actually obstructing an investigation. Well, the Mueller report actually says there is substantial evidence to support the conclusion that the president went further and, and in fact directed and began to call Rosenstein to have the special counsel fired. It went on to say the president's efforts to have McGahn write a letter for our records 
10 days after the story came out, indicate the president was not solely focused on a press strategy and, in fact, likely contemplated the ongoing investigation. There were multiple points at which you could pick out what Barr said and then compare it directly to what the Mueller report said, and Mueller seemed to take a much more, uh, a much dimmer view of the president's actual attention, intentions and actions uh, on some of these key events in the obstruction investigation. A and what, what do you make of that, uh, Matt? I mean, is that just that he couldn't reach the reasonable doubt? Is that the standard that, that he was using? There that is certainly an element of that, and he used that phrase mm -hmm. repeatedly, but I think he just has like a different worldview when it comes mm -hmm. to obstruction than Mueller's team oh. seems to have. Mueller's team would say, look, if you're trying to end the investigation, that's obstruction, right? It's kind of open and shut. Barr seems to think, well, there are lots of legitimate reasons to end the investigation. If the president thought he was being treated unfairly, and he was, then sure, he could end the investigation, no problem. They just have fundamentally, that's one of many fundamental ways that they just view obstruction differently. Oh, would testimony by Don McGahn clarify anything here? It could. I, I think it would be helpful, certainly. Um, he's obviously said a lot in the Mueller report uh, that we've seen. Um, you know, I think there is a sense a desire among some, a wishful desire, that he's going to go up on Capitol Hill and be the next John Dean of this whole situation. I don't, I would not expect that from Don McGahn. I think he would answer questions truthfully, but John Dean had decided at that point that he was going to be the guy who, you know, basically ripped the lid off of this entire thing. That's not Don McGahn. Don McGahn got a lot out of his time in the White House and is probably grateful for that. Uh, just because he told the truth to Mueller and it wound up being damaging doesn't mean that he intended to harm the White House. Um, so, but I, I do think there are many things here that he could speak to and maybe even details that he talked to Mueller about that didn't wind up in the report that he could conceivably talk to Congress about. Uh, and there was some discussion of the possibility of his testimony and uh, Barr indicated that it might be protected by executive privilege. Right, which is kind of an amazing thing to assert now or suggest now because the president let Don McGahn cooperate with investigators. Now, the White House counsel took this kind of weird tack where they said, well, we're cooperating, but don't let that suggest we're waiving executive privilege. We might want to do that later. But then, when it comes time to release the report, Bill Barr lets the president, the White House counsel, and the president's personal lawyers look at it. White House counsel is looking for executive privilege, and they let all the McGahn stuff through, so it's hard for me to see now how that's not sort of out of the bag, you know? It looks, from what I saw Bill Barr say, like he might be willing to testify that. He doesn't believe they have waived executive privilege, um, but that, that was just a remarkably interesting thing to me, that he might be willing to stand up now and say, well, you waived it in the past, but you can reassert it, or maybe like it wasn't a waiver, it was just not asserting it. Um, and it, reinfor it reinforces for me, Barr has an expansive uh, concept of uh, executive power and that comes through both in that and comes through in the the um, the memo that he wrote in 2017 laying out why he thought the obstruction of justice probe in the first place was was misguided and, and potentially damaging I mean this is a guy who believes very strongly in the uh, power of the executive to take a lot of these actions and so if you're President Trump and you want somebody to be handling that those ultimate decisions about obstruction of justice William Barr is that person who you would want in that position. Interesting. Now, switching gears just a little bit, let's talk a little bit about the Russian interference itself. That's getting some uh, traction today in the hearing, particularly among Republicans, who I think w would rather focus on, on that rather than on Trump, uh, you know, involvement in it, but the, the interference it itself. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's something that uh, Hillary Clinton has been talking about. And we actually have a clip, um, one of the names, um, we keep hearing today is Hillary Clinton. She's doing her part to keep attention on the details of the report itself. Um, we've got a Comedy Central who released a video on Saturday of Clinton reading passages of the Mueller report. Let's watch just a bit of that. Simple, I'm raising money to hire Hillary Clinton to record an audiobook of the Mueller report. I have the Mueller report. All right, let me start it. I'll be, I'll be happy Please to. Please do it. Sure. The investigation established that the Russian government perceived it would benefit from a Trump presidency. A couple notes? Yeah. Like you mean it. The investigation established that feel the it. Russian government Secretary received. Clinton, mm. feel it, feel it. Just imagine like you have a history with this. Okay. The investigation established that the Russian government perceived it would benefit from a Trump presidency and worked to secure that outcome and that the campaign expected it would benefit electorally. The president slumped back in his chair and said, oh my God, this is terrible. 
This is the end of my presidency. I'm Really? I'd listen to that audiobook. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, aside from Bill Clinton's face on that video, which is priceless, and Hillary Clinton's impersonation of Trump, which is terrible, but also amusing, um, what do you make of that? What, what is Hillary Clinton trying to do here? It's a good question. I mean, uh, ha <laughs> she's have, going to humor, which is some, not her strong have suit. Have some fun. I mean, I, you know, if I were Hillary Clinton, I'd probably be um, pretty interested in people taking the Mueller report seriously, given that it details an effort that very logically could have cost her the presidency. Foster, uh, we're getting down to <laughs> uh, on the Democratic <laughs> sharpening their knives. Where do you expect things to go, especially given how I think Democrats weren't super effective this morning at really landing a direct punch at Barr, who's been a fairly slippery witness? Where, where could this go this afternoon? So I think Roz said this, but I would be curious. He's addressed the McGahn obstruction episode, but uh, you know, why don't Democrats take him through every one of these? How can that not be obstruction? How can that not be obstruction? If anything, it'll just be a show. I also wish that, that they would sort of ask more detailed and just like yes, no, or pointed questions about Barr's interactions with Mueller. We know about the letter, we know about the phone call, but did they talk after that? Did their stabs talk after that? Eventually, Barr sort of decides, I'm not gonna release these summaries like you say you want me to. What was Mueller's reaction to that? Was there any other pushback in those intervening weeks? Is Mueller happy now? Like, have they had a, a sort of kumbaya moment where he says, well, I was unhappy then, I'm, I'm happy now? Uh, I would be curious to know their interactions outside of what Barr has just been kind of willing to talk talk about today. Aaron, I've asked this of all the reporters who've been here today. If you had Barr in front of you under oath, what would you ask him? It's a reporter's dream. Oh boy, uh, I'd probably come up with a very lengthy list of questions. Um, you know, maybe uh, I would ask him uh, why he decided to come to the, the conclusion on obstruction of justice when Mueller effectively decided that it was not the Justice Department's place to do that. Uh, also, whether he believes that his 2017 memo uh, laying out his opposition to the obstruction of justice probe uh, could logically have any impact on his ultimate decision here. I don't think we've seen uh, a lot of lawmakers talk about that. I mean, this is a guy who, before he was nominated for attorney general, made very clear that he took issue with very significant aspects of the Mueller investigation, and, and uh, d Democrats didn't do a very good job of pressing him that, on that at his confirmation hearings, and I don't see them really pressing that point right now, that, that perhaps he was somebody who was predisposed to clear the president of obstruction, uh, I think is a more effective argument for them than, than a lot of the things they're going through right now. Well, thinking ahead to uh, testimony this afternoon and uh, thinking about how slippery Bill Barr has been, uh, we've got some tape, I think, of uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse um, interrogating or questioning uh, Barr today and talking about how difficult it is for him to pin down. Um, let's listen to that tape. In the entirety of your previous career in the Department of Justice, including as Attorney General, have you ever referred to authorized department investigative activities officially or publicly as spying? I'm not asking for private conversation. No, I'm not going to abjure the use of the word spying. I think, uh, you know, my first job was in CIA, and I don't think the word spying has any pejorative connotation at all. To me, but the you question of spying is a good English word because it is the broadest word uh, in, incorporating really all forms of covert intelligence collection. So I'm not going to back off the word spying, except I will say when I'm, did you I'm not suggesting any pejorative, and I use it frequently when as the media. As when, the media. When did you decide to use it? Was it off the cuff in the hearing that day, or did you go into that hearing intending it, it to was, use the word it spying? It was actually off the cuff, to tell you the truth. And when 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 a senator, the the senator, I mean the the, uh, the congressman from, probably well, from Schatz from Hawaii. Who was here? Shaheen? No, 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 no. Whoever it was, go ahead. Yeah, when, she, when, when, when he challenged me and said, do you want to change your language, I was actually thinking, like, what's the issue? I, I don't consider it a pejorative. But if, and You're rather frankly, frankly, we went back and looked at press usage, and up until all the, the faux outrage a couple of weeks ago, it's commonly used in the press to refer to authorized activities, such as referring to the But it's not FISA commonly court court used the by the court. department. What? It is not commonly used by the department. My time is commonly up. used by me. 
Well, <laughs> as you can see from that exchange, uh, Attorney General William Barr is so tough to pin down. I think that was a very um, illustrative exchange. I think, you know, we learned that spying, there's no synonym for it. It's like orange where nothing <laughs> rhymes with it. It's, it's, you know, he really is going, uh, parsing the meaning. What did, what did you think of that? He's, well, I, I think you're right. There, one, of the, one of my takeaways uh, to this point is that in many ways he's better at this than a lot of the senators who are questioning him. Um, I don't think anybody disputes that William Barr is a very uh, smart person and lawyer, and we saw in his previous hearings how he's kind of maneuvered around some of these questions. Um, as far as the spying thing, though, his his argument that it does he doesn't know it has pejorative connotations. I checked uh, Merriam-Webster, the, the dictionary. I looked at the def definition of spy. The first definition is to monitor somebody, quote, usually for hostile purposes. I think it's generally understood, maybe not to everybody, maybe not to William Barr, that spying on somebody is to, you know, they are your foe, they are your enemy. And I think that's why it has uh, some significance and why people object to its use when it comes to the FBI monitoring Carter Page, uh, because it suggests that he is some kind of an enemy. And I think that's why the president and a lot of his allies have been keen to use that specific language because it does kind of paint that picture that otherwise you wouldn't get from monitoring or surveil. And tell me, um, Matt, what did you think of the uh, anemic counterintelligence uh, phrase? I, I want to visit that. That was an interesting choice of words. Tell us about that. That was a weird one, and I need to go back and rewatch it because it was tough for me in real time to get what he was getting at there. If he was saying, like, only surveilling Carter Page would be kind of just a light response if you're really that worried about anything. I guess that's how I interpreted it. Indicating it, that there might be other uh, counterintelligence right, efforts underway. Right, and he also it. seemed to indicate too, like, and I don't really know, well, you're the Attorney General, how do you not know about what other counterintelligence efforts are underway? The FBI is under your supervision. I guess he wouldn't know about CIA stuff, but really need to go back and kind of rewatch that exchange to use the word anemic a couple different times and it was just difficult for me to assess like what point he was making is he trying to tamp down people's expectations you know a lot of what we've heard in recent weeks particularly from Democrats is like well we have the Mueller report but what about the counterintelligence investigation that's ongoing and I think that's a little bit too simple a way to think about it I don't think there's some secret you know counterintelligence report out there that says Trump is the Manchurian candidate I think that the FBI's ongoing counterintelligence work about Russia continuing to interfere in various U.S. activities. Maybe he's trying to tamp down expectations there. I'm just not really sure. I have to rewatch it. Sure. I think we'll all be rewatching it <laughs> for a lot of different reasons. One thing I wanted to ask you about is um, redactions in mm -hmm. the report. Uh, are we going to get any sense, are there any particular redactions that you're interested in that you would like to see come to light? So there's a couple of lists in there. One is a list of ongoing matters that I guess have been kind of kicked out and many are redacted. They're in alphabetical order help helpfully so we can kind of speculate on who they are. And then um, Mueller has kind of a cast of characters. Me and uh, a colleague and I uh, contributed an introduction to this to the Mueller report the post published the Mueller report as a book and we came up with our own sort of cast of characters not knowing uh, in advance that Mueller was going to come up with his but some of Mueller's are redacted and there are some that are it's alphabetical again like the the list of cases and some are like there's so few letters in the alphabet between them that we've been speculating is that this person is that this person mm -hmm. so I'm curious about that most of the redactions are in the collusion section I'm curious of course behind Behind, you know, Tell us a little bit more about everything. that work when you're trying to figure out those names. How are you doing this? I just want to picture this. Uh, so generally it's Roz walking over to my desk and saying, oh, I have a theory on this. She also had um, like written out on a sheet, uh, just a little, you know, reporter's notebook sheet, all the kind of letter combinations. It's not like, you know, so you'll like have names that'll be like K-A and then the next one is K-A and the, it, the, the varying factor is the third letter, let's say. Well, there's only so many, uh, there's only so many possibilities between those. But then you have like Russian names, so it's maybe not like, um, uh, you know, a vowel. There's, there might not, not be a vowel that follows the consonant, so. But that's how it looks. It's a little bit uh, scattershot and conspiracy theory-ish. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it has resulted in, um, in, in this, uh, this introduction analysis that you and, and Roz Helderman wrote uh, for this. We had editors for this, so it's much more refined than I just described. <laughs> no, it sounds fascinating. So uh, tell me, uh, remind us how we got here. You've been following this story for so long. 
uh, take us back to the very beginnings. Where did this start well, and how do we get here? Yeah, it's so interesting. So the FBI had a sort of ongoing look at various people connected to Trump. Carter Page is one of them, Michael Flynn is one of them, Paul Manafort is one of them. But really Mueller's investigation, this was the FBI, this is before Mueller, is born of President Trump's outrage at this look. He fires Jim Comey, the FBI and the Justice Department are in kind of a state of crisis. All eyes are on Rod Rosenstein, then the Deputy Attorney General, who was in charge of the Russia investigation because Jeff Sessions had recused himself from it. He's in kind of a political hot seat. He pretty much handed President Trump the knife to get rid of Comey. He's facing criticism for that, and he decides, I'm going to appoint Bob Mueller. And it sort of calms everyone down. The public kind of has faith, well, this guy's got it. We're going to get some report like we have now. And then for two years, he kind of methodically does his work. He stays very far under the surface, says almost nothing publicly, except when he sort of emerges to indict people, like Russians for hacking, like Russians for social media influence, like various Trump associates for lying to him mostly. But that's how we got here. It's really President Trump's frustration over this investigation and firing Comey that is the spark that lights this whole thing and brings us to today. And here we are. And I, just taking a look here now, we're looking at pictures live from the Senate Judiciary Hearing Room uh, where Attorney General William Barr is testifying today. Uh, we're on a break right now. The Senate is voting. I understand they had two votes. Uh, Chairman Lindsey Graham is going to be reconvening this hearing shortly. We're about a third of the way through the panel. Um, in the first round of questioning. Um, as we kind of prepare for this hearing to resume, it looks like it might be a few more minutes. Folks are filtering in. Um, guys, what are, you, what are you expecting this afternoon? What are you looking for? Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm looking, one, for the presidential candidates to, to question them. I think those will be big moments, just big moments for mm -hmm. them to shine or to not shine. Um, it does seem like just looking at Twitter in between watching the hearing that s some people feel that the Democrats' performance so far has been lackluster, so do they pick it up, and particularly how do those three do? Um, I, 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 as I sort of just said, I'm also looking for more about Mueller and Barr's interaction. We don't have a window into Mueller, really, which is so unfortunate. Everything we're sort of hearing today is through Barr, so he describes this phone call, he's able to characterize a letter, but knowing more, even from his perspective about about their interactions, I think would be really interesting. How about you, Aaron? Uh, watching Amy Klobuchar and mm -hmm. Kamala Harris, mm -hmm. uh, obviously both 2020 presidential candidates, but also both prosecutors and, and pretty accomplished ones. Um, Klobuchar, uh, I think, had some of the most impactful moments during the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, the confirmation hearings for the Supreme Court. Um, uh, Harris, I've always been pretty impressed with as far as her lines of questioning and actually getting to a point. Uh, and then the, the other 2020 candidate on the uh, panel is Cory Booker, of course, uh, who maybe had some less good moments in the Kavanaugh hearings. Mm -hmm. I think we all remember that I am Spartacus moment type thing was a little <laughs> bit over the top. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, Klobuchar, Harris, and then Chris Coons is another one that I'm watching for. Uh, on the Republican side, uh, ben Sass is, is obviously somebody who generally falls in line with what Republicans are doing, but it's also shown a willingness to critique the president when it comes to certain things, has shown a, a significant concern about Russian interference in the elections. And then John Kennedy is always extremely uh, quotable. quotable and entertaining. <laughs> and sometimes he throws a little bit of a curveball. I, I, don't, I don't expect any of these Republicans to really uh, press bar all that hard on certain things, but you never know if you're, you know, he's the kind of guy who could surprise you in certain ways with, with a line of questioning. Are, are there large substantive issues that haven't come up yet, or are we sort of covered the waterfront and now it's time to drill in? You know, I think we've, I think in a lot of ways we haven't really gotten much into the Russian interference side of this, the collusion side of it. A lot of it's been focused on obstruction. Um, I think that we might see some Democrats try to parse, you know, parse out the difference between um, collusion and conspiracy, which is a difference that uh, Barr has kind of obscured somewhat in his public statements. Certainly the president has obscured in his public statements, but the Mueller report is actually pretty um, uh, specific on that it was not talking about co the broader concept of collusion, but just about the legal concept of conspiracy. Um, so maybe ask Barr, you know, is there, are there instances that maybe aren't illegal, wouldn't be illegal or prosecutable, 
but would raise concerns about alliances between the two sides, even if they weren't tacit or express. Um, I think there are some, some important issues to get at when it comes to that side of things, even if it's not the most troubling for you know, actual criminal activity. And what about the House committee, the possibility that William Barr might be before um, the House tomorrow? Matt, what, what could that hearing reveal that today's wouldn't? Well, you always prefer to go first because the major news is typically made in the, in the first hearing uh, because you hope that senators come up with all the questions that he's willing to answer. Um, it's still unclear, I think, as I came in here, it was still unclear whether he would be appearing before the House. They have this issue of whether he's willing to be questioned by a lawyer. It seems to me the iron is really hot right now given all the recent revelations about Mueller's letter expressing frustration. I can't imagine the House would want to miss this opportunity when everyone is kind of focused on this issue. Um, and you never know what can happen. Like, there's a lot of lawmakers. They mm -hmm. can think of various questions. If you think about his spying comment, that came on the second day of two appropriations hearings. So he can certainly make news. He's an off-the-cuff guy. I do think, to your earlier question, we're in the drilling in stage of this. but. You know, that's a stage where news could be made because he relies a lot on his wit and his charm to get through it, and he runs into trouble sometimes, like when he uses a word like spying kind of off the cuff. Which like he, he said, said was off the cuff. Uh, again, we are looking now at live pictures from the Senate Judiciary Hearing Room. Uh, it looks like the chairman is back uh, after these Senate votes. Uh, we'll be resuming live and uninterrupted coverage. Uh, as soon as this gets underway. Looks like it could be just a few more minutes uh, until then. Uh, here comes the star witness, William Barr, the Attorney General. He'll be seated again and uh, resume uh, testimony, resume questioning, with uh, about two-thirds left of this uh, committee to go. Uh, each will have a few moments to question the Attorney General. Um, let's see, I think we're just going to go live to, to the committee hearing room. And we'll be back if there's another break with more reporting and analysis uh, from my Washington Post colleagues.
been told is on the way, and I'll just, we'll go ahead and start. I think the next questioner is a Republican, uh, Senator Kennedy. Thank oh, you, Mr. Yeah, Chairman. There's something you wanted to say, Mr. Attorney General, about one of your statements. Just briefly, Mr. Chairman, um, Senator Cornyn asked me about defensive briefings before, and as I said, there were different kinds of them, and I was referring to the kind where you are told of a specific tar you're a specific target. Uh, and uh, I have been told at the break that a lesser kind of briefing, a security briefing that generally discusses uh, you know, general threats, uh, apparently was given to the campaign in August. Thank you. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to my colleagues for letting me go out of order. I promise to, to be as brief as possible. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank, thank, or Mr. Or General, uh, thanks for coming today. Um, humans have a universal need, I think, to be, um, to be listened to, to be understood, and to be validated. I think we all share that. I have listened to the Mueller team. I validate them, but I want to be sure I understand them. Has Mr. Mueller or his team changed their conclusions? You mean during, during the course of the investigation? No, today. It's clear, <clears throat> at least according to press reports, <clears throat> excuse me, General, that at one point the Mueller team was unhappy. I think it had to do with your letter. Mm -hmm. What matters to me is, uh, and I'll get to this in a moment, I want to know first, uh, has the Mueller team changed its mind on its conclusions? Its conclusions as to what? As to collusion, conspiracy, not and that, conspiracy. Not that I'm aware of. So the decision not to bring an indictment against the president for conclu collusion, conspiracy, with Russia has not changed. No, it hasn't. And the conclusion not to bring an indictment against the president for obstruction of justice has not changed. No. Okay. Um, I, I take it from your testimony that the Mueller team was unhappy when you received the letter from Mr. Mueller. Uh, I can't speak to the team as a whole. But All right, certainly, Mr. Mueller then. I, when I talked to, to Bob Mueller, he, he, he indicated he was concerned about the press coverage that had gone on the f previous few days, and he felt that was uh, to be remedied by putting out more information. Okay. I understood you to say, and these are my words, not yours, the first concern that Mr. Mueller had, he felt like your letter wasn't nuanced enough. Correct. Okay. That problem's been solved, has it not? Well, it was sort of solved by putting out the whole report. Exactly. Which was the, that's why I think this whole thing is, is sort of uh, mind-bendingly bizarre, because I made clear from the beginning that I was putting out the report, as much of the report as I could, and it was clear it was going to take uh, three weeks or so, maybe four, to do that. And the question is, what's the placeholder? And the placeholder, in my judgment, was uh, the simple... Uh, statement of what the bottom line conclusions were. And I wasn't going to be in the business of feeding out more and more information uh, as time went on to adjust to what the press was saying. And that's your call as Attorney General? Absolutely. Okay, that wouldn't be the call of a U.S. Attorney or a Special Counsel? No, not at all. Okay. Now, the second reason, uh, I mentioned the nuance concern. The second reason that uh, Mr. Mueller was concerned, I don't want to say unhappy because I'm not trying to be pejorative. I say concerned. He was concerned about press coverage. Uh, he indicated, yeah, he, he felt that what was inaccurate was the press coverage and what they were interpreting the March 24th letter to say. And what were you supposed to do about that? Uh, he wanted uh, to put out the full executive summaries uh, that are incorporated in the report. And I said to him, I wasn't interested. And, and by the way, those summaries, even when he sent them, apparently, mm -hmm. they actually required later more redaction because of the intelligence community. So the fact is, we didn't have readily available uh, summaries that had been fully vetted. But uh, I made it clear to him I, I was not in the business of putting out 
periodic summaries because a summary would start a whole public debate. It's by, by definition under-inclusive and I thought what we should do is focus on getting the full report out as quickly as possible, and, and which we did. And that's your call as Attorney General? Of course, of course. Okay. And the news coverage issue, well, none of us can control what the news uh, publishes or prints except the, the media. Um, but, but to the extent that, that an argument was made, they didn't have the full report. That, that's a moot issue too now, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Um, can you, can you briefly go over with me one more time? What, I find it curious that the, the, the Mueller team spent all this time investigating obstruction of justice and then reached no conclusion. Tell me again briefly why Mr. Mueller told you he reached no conclusion or he couldn't make up his mind or whatever. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I really couldn't recapitulate it. I, it was unclear to us. We first discussed it on March 5th. Uh, the deputy was with me, uh, uh, Ed O'Callaghan, the principal associate deputy. And uh, we, we didn't really get a clear understanding of the reasoning. And the report, I'm not sure exactly what the full line of reasoning is. And that's one of the reasons I didn't want to try to put words in, in uh, Bob Mueller's mouth. But he, 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 he did not choose to bring an indictment. We know that much. Right. Regardless of the reason. Right. right. Uh, I'm going to repeat quickly in less than one minute what we talked about the last time you were here. This is one person's opinion. Okay. Um, as I told you before, I think uh, the, the FBI is the premier law enforcement agency in all of human history, and I believe that. I do think there were a handful of people, maybe some are still there, uh, who decided in 2016 to act on their political beliefs. There were, there were two investigations here. One was an investigation of Donald Trump. There was another investigation of Hillary Clinton. I'd like to know how that one started, too. And uh, it would seem to me that we all have a duty, if, if, if not to the American people, to the FBI, to find out why these investigations were started who started them, and the evidence on which they were started. And I hope you will do that and you get back, will get back to us. And there's another short way home here as well. All you've got to do is release, the President can, release all the documents at the FBI and the Justice Department pertaining to the 2016 election. Now, you can redact national security information, but just release them. Instead of us going through all this spin and innuendo and leaks and rumors, let's just let the American people see them. And the final point I'll make, when you're investigating leaks at the Department of Justice and the FBI, I hope you will include the Mueller team as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Klobuchar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Attorney General, I'm going to take us out of the weeds here because I think the American people deserve to know what happened in the election for the highest office of the land. And I'll just give my views very quickly and not ask you about these topics. Uh, I think your four-page letter was clearly a summary, and that's why Director Mueller called it a summary. I think when Senator Van Hollen and Representative Crisp asked you if the special counsel disagreed with you under oath, you had to go out of your way not to at least mention the fact that he had sent you this letter, but you didn't mention it. And then finally, I would say that we must hear from Director Mueller because in response to some of my colleagues' questions, you have said that you didn't know um, what he meant or why he said it, and I believe we need to hear from him. So I want to first start with Russia. Uh, Special Counsel Mueller's report found that the Russian government interfered in the 2016 presidential election in a sweeping and systematic fashion. Later, Director Ray has informed us that 2018 was a dress rehearsal for the big show in 2020. Director Coates, the president's uh, intelligence advisor, has told us that the Russians are getting bolder. Yet for the last two years, Senator Langford and I, on a bipartisan bill with support from the ranking and the head of the Intelligence Committee, have been trying to get the Secure Elections Act passed. This would require backup paper ballots. Uh, if anyone gets federal funding for an election, it would require audits, um, and it would require better cooperation. Yet, 
the White House, just as we were on the verge of getting a markup in the Rules Committee, getting it to the floor where I think we would get the vast majority of senators, the White House made calls to stop this. Were you aware of that? No. Okay, well that happened. So what I would like to know from you as our nation's chief law enforcement officer, if you will work with Senator Langford and I to get this bill done. Because otherwise we are not going to have any clout to get backup paper ballots if something goes wrong in this election. Well, I will, I will work with you uh, to uh, enhance the security of our election and I'll take a look at, at what you're proposing. I'm not familiar with it. Okay, well it is the bipartisan bill. It has Senator Burr and Senator Warner. Its support from Senator Graham was on the bill, Senator Harris is on the bill, and the leads are Senator Langford and myself. And it had significant support in the House as well. Uh, the GRU, the Russian Military Intelligence Agency, targeted the U.S. state and local agencies along with private firms uh, that are responsible for electronic polling and voter registration. Um, the GRU accessed voter information and installed malware on a voting technology company's network. I understand the FBI will brief U.S. Senator Rick Scott and Florida Governor DeSantis on efforts by Russian hackers to gain access to Florida election data. Will you commit to have the FBI provide a briefing to all senators on this? Um, I, I just on the Florida situation? On the entire Russia situation, sure. including the Florida situation. Sure. Okay, that will be helpful. Again, uh, Senator Langford and I are trying to get our bill passed, and I think if everyone hears about this, it may help. Um, also, according to the report, uh, the IRA purchased over 3,500 ads on Facebook to undermine our democracy, as the chairman has pointed out, contrary to what we heard from a high-ranking official at the White House, this was not just a few Facebook ads. I am pleased that Chairman Graham has agreed to be the lead Republican on the Honest Ads Act uh, that I introduced uh, last year with Senator McCain. And will you help us to try at least to change our election laws so that we can show where the money is coming from and who's paying for these ads so that people have access to these ads? In concept, yes. Okay, very good, thank you. We need that support. Now let's go to something I noted in your, um, in the opening, you talked about how the two major concerns at your uh, nomination hearing were about the report and about making the report public. There was a third concern, and it was something I raised, and that was your views on obstruction. I ask you if a president or any person convincing a witness to change testimony would be obstruction of justice, and you said yes. Uh, the report found that Michael Cohen's testimony to the House before it, that the president repeatedly implied that Cohen's family members had committed crimes. Do you consider that evidence to be an attempt to convince a witness to change testimony? No. I don't think that that uh, could, could pass muster. Those public statements he was making uh, could pass muster as subordination of perjury. But this is a man in the highest office, in the most powerful job in our country, and he is basically, I'm trying to think how someone would react, any of my colleagues here, if the President of the United States is implying, tr getting out there that your family members have committed a crime. So you don't consider that any attempt to change testimony? Well, you, you, have, you have two different things. You have the question of whether there's, it's an obstructive act and then also whether or not it is a corrupt intent. I don't think general public statements like that have, okay. Well, our, we could show that they would have sufficiently probable effect to, to constitute. Okay, well then let's go to some private uh, statements. The report found that the president's personal counsel told Paul Manafort that he would be, quote, taken care of. This is in volume two, page 123 to 24. Um, that you don't consider obstruction of justice. No, not standing alone, both for this, on, the, on both the same uh, reasons. And Number I think that is my point here. What? You look at the totality of the evidence. That's what I learned uh, when I was in law school. You look at the totality of the evidence in the pattern here. Look at this. The report found uh, that the president's personal counsel told Michael Cohen that if he stayed on message about the Trump Tower Moscow project, the president had his back. That's volume two, page 140. Right, but I think the, the council acknowledged that it's unclear 
whether he was reflecting uh, the president's uh, statements on that. Okay, the report found that after Manafort was convicted, the president himself called him a brave man for refusing to break. Yes, oh. and that is not, and that is not uh, obstruction because the president's state, the evidence, I think what the president's lawyers would say if this uh, were ever actually joined, is that the president's statements about flipping are quite clear and express and, and uniformly the same, which is by flipping, he meant succumbing to pressure on unrelated cases to lie and compose mm -hmm. in order to get lenient treatment on Again, other cases. That is not, uh, it's a discouraging flipping in that sense is not obstruction. Okay, well, look at the pattern here. That, the report found that after Cohen's residence and office were searched by the FBI, the president told Cohen to hang in there and stay strong. The court found that after National Security Advisor Michael Flynn resigned, the president made public positive comments about him, and then when he cooperated, um, he changed his tune. During your confirmation hearing, I asked you whether a president deliberately impairing the integrity or availability of evidence would be obstruction. And you responded, yes. And this is a different take on um, Senator Feinstein's question. Um, would causing McGahn, the White House counsel, to create a false record when the president asked, ordered him uh, to have the, uh, when McGahn, he told him to deny reports, right? He tells McGahn, deny reports uh, that the president ordered him to have the counsel fired. If you don't see that as, as obstruction and directing him to change testimony, do you think that would create a false record to impair the integrity of evidence? Well, I said there, there, it fails on, uh, the, the evidence would not be sufficient to establish any of the three elements there. First, uh, it's, it's not sufficient to show uh, a obstructive uh, act uh, because it is unclear whether the president uh, knew that to be false. In fact, the president's focus on the fact that I never told you to fire McGahn. Did I ever say fire? I never told you to fire McGahn. McGahn's, uh, M McGahn's. And I'm getting at something, it's about impairing the integrity of the evidence. I just see it as different. This is. Well, the, uh, the second I, thing, there's no, it, it, it's hard to establish the nexus to the proceeding because he already had testified to the, uh, to the special counsel. He'd given his evidence. Mm -hmm. As the report itself says, there is evidence that the president actually thought and believed that the Times article was wrong. That's evidence on the president's side of the ledger, that he actually thought it was wrong and was asking for its correction. It is also possible, the report says, that the president's intent was directed at, at the uh, publicity and the press. The government has to prove things beyond a reasonable doubt, and as the report shows, there's, there's ample uh, evidence on the other side of the ledger that would present, prevent the government from establishing that. Okay, again, I look at the totality of the evidence, and when you look at it, it is a pattern, and that is different than having one incident. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Senator Says. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Barr, I'd like to go back to, um, to Russia, and your opening statement laid out some of what the GRU had done, what military, Russian uh, military intelligence had done in terms of hacking. I'd also like to look at some of the oligarchs and some of the corruption so closely aligned with Putin. Um, volume one, pages 129 to 144, are largely about Deripaska. Can you tell us who he is and what his objectives are? Um, I'd rather not get, get into that in this open setting. Well, I'll, I'll at least quote, um, the Department of Treasury, because this is a public document. So uh, Oleg Deripaska is a designated uh, individual. Um, he's, he possesses a Russian diplomatic passport. He regularly claims to represent uh, the Russian government. Uh, he's an aluminum and other uh, metals billionaire. Um, and he's been investigated by the US government and by other of our allies for money laundering. He's been accused of threatening the lives of his business rivals. He's been charged with illegal wiretapping, taking part in extortion and racketeering schemes. He's bribed government officials, he's ordered the murder of a businessman, and he has many links to Russian organized crime. So I think we can, in an open setting, at least agree that he's a bad dude. 
right? This is a, this is a bottom feeding scum sucker. And he has absolutely no, uh, I'll take your laugh as agreement. Uh, he has absolutely no alignment with the interests of the US people and our public. So the, the section of volume one that deals with nominally Paul Manafort, but is really about Deripaska, I would like you to help us have an American public 101 understanding of what is and isn't allowed. So Paul Manafort is hired by Deripaska ostensibly for things related to the Ukraine. They have a bunch of failed business ventures together, it looks like, over time. But he's on the payroll of a Russian oligarch that has interests completely misaligned with the American government and the American people and with the interests of NATO. And he's on his payroll. Is it permissible for someone to be paid by somebody who's basically an enemy of the United States? And then could that individual just volunteer and start to donate their time and talent and expertise to a campaign in the US? And I, I, I mean this, uh, let me interrupt for a second and say, one of the things that I think is painfully tragic about a hearing like this, I think the vast majority of the American people are gonna tune it out, uh, and those that pay attention are gonna think the only two takeaways you need to know is a bunch of people were pro-Trump before they came, and they stayed pro-Trump, and a bunch of people were anti-Trump before they came, and they stayed anti-Trump, and we didn't dig into any of what the report actually says. I think these 448 pages say a whole bunch of really important things about intelligence operations against the United States people and our public and our government and our public trust, and I think it isn't just about 2016. There are important questions about 2016. Lindsay, uh, Chairman Graham, summarized at the beginning how much uh, money and time was available to the special counsel and his team to do their work. So there are a bunch of factual matters about 2016 that matter, but if one of the most important things we take away from this isn't that we're gonna be, it needs to be that we're going to be under attack again in 2020, and it isn't just gonna be Russia, who's pretty dang clunky at this stuff, but it's also over time likely gonna be China, who's gonna be much more sophisticated about this stuff. Can you help us understand what is legal and illegal about foreign intelligence services being involved in US elections, and what should American people, and the American public, and especially American campaign operatives, know about what's appropriate and not appropriate to take in the form of help from foreign intelligence agencies? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a very broad topic, what is legal and illegal. I mean, could, could you refine it a little bit? You're talking about what kind of, uh, what kind of propaganda, that kind of thing, coming into the country? Could, could you, obviously you make, can't, you make can't, up a you country. You can't put money into, into a, foreign money, obviously, into a campaign. Yeah, but, but you could, you, could you take, could Russia, China, I'm making up a country, uh, decide to come into the United States and look at all the political talent, make a database. By the way, the OPM hack in 2014 tells us the Chinese government is actively involved in creating databases of people they can potentially use as leverage against American citizens. More than 20 million people are already in the spy recruitment database of the, China, of the Communist Party of China. Could they come in and build a database of all campaign operatives in the US and some foreign entity just decide to hire all of them and then say, why don't you go and volunteer for this campaign and you go and volunteer for that campaign? Could we have campaign chairmen and women running around the US, US citizens who have US campaign talent and experience paid for by foreign entities just choosing to volunteer on campaigns going forward? Is that legal? Uh, if, their, if, if their time is paid for for the purpose of participating in a campaign, I wouldn't think it's legal. But given how sleazy so much of the city is and a whole bunch of people live on retainers of 15 and 20 and $30,000 a month, is it always obvious what you're paid for versus what you do? So some Russian oligarch just decides to start putting American campaign personnel on retainer payments and say, we may need you to lobby for something somewhere in the future. They've got views about uh, oil pipelines and, and natural gas pipelines into Germany. We just hold you on retainer. And by the way, the fact that you're a person who likes to work for specific campaigns and certain parties and causes, feel free to go and all vocationally do whatever the heck you want whenever you want. Is that, is, is that a place we should head? Is that, is that allowed under U.S. law today? Well, I mean, it depends on, on the specific circumstances, the nature of the agreement, what the per, what the, who the person is representing. Are they representing the interests of a foreign government? Are they a foreign agent? Uh, who, are they registered? Uh, you know, I mean, we could, 
it, it's a slippery area, and we could sit here all day and, and, and without specific. I only have seven minutes. I don't, I don't get all day, but uh, you're the chief law enforcement officer of the United States government, and I think it would be helpful for us to have a shared understanding as we head toward the 2020 election of what campaign operatives should well understand is beyond the pale. So if, if the Chinese government decides to start hacking into 2020 campaigns, I would hope there's clarity from the Department of Justice about whether or not Democratic campaign, presidential campaigns and whether or not the Trump re-election campaign are allowed to say, hey, we're interested in this hacked material going forward. I think we need to have clarity about a question like that. And I think as somebody who sits not just on Judiciary but on the Intelligence Committee, I think there are a bunch of counterintelligence investigations happening right now in the United States where campaigns don't really understand what the laws are. And I think we need a lot more clarity about it because I'm nearly at time. Let me at least give it to you as a, this version as a precise question. Um, under the Presidential Transitions Act, once you have a Democratic nominee for president and a Republican nominee for president, one of the things that we do is we start to brief them on in the event that you would become the president-elect, um, you will need to know where we are in different national security issues. Should we be adding to the Presidential Transition Act um, counterintelligence briefings for campaigns as they become the nominee in a much more detailed way than the the response you had about the Bureau's uh, efforts when Senator Cornyn asked if defensive briefings were given. Should we, the Congress, be thinking very intentionally about authorizing the ability of the Bureau, and in a shared broader IC context, but with the Bureau or Homeland Security probably being the interface entity, should nominees for the highest office in the land heading into 2020 be receiving regular counterintelligence briefings on the fact that foreign intelligence services are going to surround people that are likely going to be people of influence and principal officers of the United States government should they win? Absolutely. I think the, the danger from uh, countries like China, Russia, and so forth is far more insidious than it has been in the past because of non-traditional collectors uh, that they have operating in the United States. And I think most people are unaware of how pervasive it is. And, how, and, and what the risk level is. And uh, I think it actually should go far beyond even campaigns. More people involved in government have to be uh, uh, educated on this. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm at time, but I would love to work with you uh, in the broader ICE intelligence community on that more. I think there are a number of members of the SISI of the Senate Intelligence Committee who know what you're saying, particularly about the Chinese government and their attempt to encircle lots of people who are going to have influence in the future. And I think we, not just a whole of government effort, but as a whole of society effort, have to become much more sophisticated about what foreign intelligence services, and especially the Chinese, are plotting for the future. Yeah, if I could just say that you know, the pattern is whenever there is an election, foreign governments and their operatives frequently descend on the people who they think could have a, a shot at winning. And it's, it's common and, and, and uh, tip, the most typical scenario is that they do try to uh, make contacts and uh, so forth. So. And, and in a digital cyber era, you don't need a, a bar and a hooker anymore. Um, you can surround people digitally much easier. And we know that we're going to be having these kinds of attacks in the future, and we need to up our game. Thanks. Uh, minus the bar and the hooker, we'll have uh, hearings about all this stuff. Uh, <laughs> Senator Coons. Thank you, Chairman Graham. Thank you, Attorney General Barr. Uh, and I want to follow up on some of that line of questioning from Senator Sass and Klobuchar. Uh, the special counsel was appointed uh, first to investigate Russia's attack on our 2016 election uh, and potential coordination with the Trump campaign. And I'm glad the chairman um, started this hearing by recognizing we need to focus on that demonstrable assault on our democracy and to protect our elections going forward. And I look forward to working with my colleagues, whether it's on sanctions bills uh, or it's on the Langford Klobuchar bill. Uh, but we genuinely need leadership from you, Mr. Attorney General, and from the White House and our president um, to make sure that we are doing everything we can to protect our next election. Uh, but frankly, we also can't ignore volume two of this report, uh, which I think details unacceptable conduct by the president and his campaign. Um, and that includes trying to fire the special counsel without cause. Uh, I appreciated uh, the leadership of Senators Graham and Tillis, uh, Booker and I, in a bill to try and protect the special counsel, something I think is still worth doing for future special counsels. Uh, we were told by many of our colleagues there was nothing to worry about because the president wasn't going to fire the special counsel, but I was particularly struck by some uh, reports in the second volume that the president attempted to do exactly that. And I frankly, Mr. Attorney General, have concerns that your March 24 letter obscured that conduct 
and as a result work to protect the president for several weeks rather than give the full truth to the American people, as I now believe Special Counsel Mueller was urging you to do, as reflected in the letter we just received today. So I'm going to ask you some questions about the report, but the bottom line is that I think we need to hear more about the Special Counsel's work from the Special Counsel. According to Special Counsel Mueller's report, in June of 2017, President Trump called White House Counsel McGahn and directed him to have the Special Counsel removed. And I quote, and this is from about page 85, 86. McGahn recalled the President called him at home twice and on both occasions directed him to call Rosenstein and say that Mueller had conflicts and could no longer serve as Special Counsel. There were no credible conflicts. McGahn testified that he had shared that these conflicts were silly, were not real, and Chris Christie advised President Trump about the same time there were no substantive bases, no good cause to fire the special counsel. Um, in one call, the president said, call Rod, tell Rod Mueller has conflicts, can't be the special counsel, quote, Mueller has to go. And I assume he didn't mean go to Cleveland or go to Seattle, he meant go, be fired. Call me back when you do it. I think the president's demands to fire Mueller without cause are alarming and unacceptable. And Mr. Attorney General, not one bit of what I just described was in your March 24th letter to this committee, was it? No, because but it I, I wasn't But speaking. it was in the summaries that were offered to you by Special Counsel Mueller and his team, which you chose not to release. Is that correct? They were, they were, in, the fi they were in complete form in the final report, which I was striving to make public and which I did make public. Uh, which I respect and appreciate. But a critical three weeks passed between when you delivered the letter with the um, focus on the principal conclusions and when we ultimately got the redacted report. And what I take from the Mueller letter to why, you... Why were they critical? Well, I think that the volume two summary would have revealed to the general public um, a whole range of inappropriate actions by the president and his core team. I'll go to a second episode that I think is important. On February 5th of 2018, over a week after the story broke publicly that the president ordered his White House counsel to fire the special counsel, investigating the president, the president demanded that McGahn create a false record, saying the president never directed McGahn to fire the special counsel. The president wasn't looking for a press statement here. He wasn't looking to correct the record. He wanted a fraudulent record for White House records, a letter that wasn't true. McGahn refused to do it. Again, there's nothing about the president's request to create a false record in your March 24th letter, is there? Well. That's your characterization of it, and I've been through it a couple of times, and, okay. I, and I think it would be difficult for the, uh, the government to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. I think, and an important I point think there, here is there are very plausible alternative explanations. But uh, the, what I was trying to get out was uh, the final report and, and have one issuance of the complete uh, report. I made it clear in the March 24th letter that uh, Bob Mueller didn't make a decision, but that he f felt he could not exonerate the president. That's right. I wasn't hiding the ball on, on where Mueller was, and, and that he was presenting both sides of the issue, all the evidence, but he was not making a call, but he felt he couldn't exonerate the president. And then I briefly described the process we went through to make a judgment uh, internal into the Department of Justice and uh, as I say, from the public interest standpoint, I felt there should be only one thing issued and it should be the complete report, as complete as it could be. And I know we differ in our conclusions about what that meant, but my concern is that that gave President Trump and his folks more than three weeks of an open field to say I was completely exonerated. When had you released the summaries of it, the first and second volume, we would have been more motivated than ever, based on the first volume, to work cooperatively to protect our next election, and more concerned than ever about misdeeds, about inappropriate actions by the president and by some of his core team as a result of the summary of the second volume. And at the end of the day, you've had a number of exchanges with colleagues where you've said, I can't tell you why Mueller chose not to charge. I want to hear that from Bob Mueller. I think we should hear from special counsel Mueller. Let me move on to a point that Senator Sass was just asking, but that I think is worth revisiting about foreign intelligence and their role in our elections. The reason we had this investigation in the first place was George Papadopoulos was told the Russians had dirt on Hillary Clinton. The Russians had a direct contact to Donald Trump Jr. and offered to give 
dirt about his father's opponent. Donald Trump Jr. said, I love it, and invited the campaign chairman uh, and president's uh, son-in-law to a, the campaign chairman to a meeting with the right, Russians who, to who get it. You, who did you say offered it? Who did you say offered it? Uh, in the second instance, it was um, Russians made an offer to Donald Trump. I have 30 seconds. Okay. Let me get to a question if I could. Going forward, what if a foreign adversary, let's now say North Korea, offers a presidential candidate dirt on a competitor in 2020? Do you agree with me the campaign should immediately contact the FBI? If a, a foreign, foreign intelligence service, foreign intelligence service? a representative of a foreign government yes. says, we have dirt on your opponent, yes. should they say, I love it, let's meet, if or should they contact the FBI? If a foreign intelligence service does, yes. Okay, here's my core concern. The president ordered the White House counsel to have special counsel Mueller fired. He fabricated evidence to cover it up. And whether or not you could make a criminal charge of this, it is unacceptable. And everyone who said we didn't have to worry about President Trump firing the special counsel was flat out wrong. The Russians offered the Trump campaign dirt on Hillary Clinton, and the Trump campaign never reported that to the FBI. Instead, they tried to conceal the meeting and misled the American people. And I think we have to work on a bipartisan basis going forward to protect our elections from a repeat of this, and we need your leadership and the president's. You somehow concluded the president didn't obstruct justice, and you announced that you had cleared the president 25 days before the public could read the Mueller report for themselves. I think it's no wonder Special Counsel Mueller thought your four-page letter created public confusion about critical aspects of the results of the investigation and that that threatened to undermine the central purpose for which he was appointed. I think we need to hear from Special Counsel Mueller. I think we need to hear from Don McGahn. And I think we need to review how we are going to handle going forward the fact that you are supervising 12 ongoing cases that came out of the Mueller investigation and have been referred. This body has a central role in oversight that I believe we need to exercise given your recent record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Bart, I commend your candor in calling what happened in 2016 what it is, which is spying the Trump campaign and spying on the President of the United States. I'd like to talk a little bit more about spying. Uh, Counterintelligence investigations like the one that we now know the FBI launched against maybe candidate Trump and President Trump, those are designed to thwart spying and sabotage. Is that correct? That's correct. To your knowledge, has the FBI ever launched a counterintelligence investigation of another president that you're aware of? Not to my knowledge. It, so it's safe to say that to your knowledge, this move was completely unprecedented? To my knowledge. Would it be unusual in your experience and to your knowledge for FBI agents to hide the existence and results of an investigation, such an investigation, from their superiors? Uh, would, did you say would it be typical? No, no, would it be unusual? For Very them? unusual. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, that is, that is indeed what press reports suggest happened here. When FBI officials hide investigators, investigations from superiors, is there anybody to hold them accountable? I mean, what, what happens in that instance? There is no accountability. Um, have you looked into the decision uh, by the FBI into why they launched a counterintelligence investigation? I am looking into it, and I have looked into it. And you will, will you commit to, to telling us what you find as the result of your, of your own review and investigation? Right. Well, at the end of the day, you know, when I form conclusions, I intend to share it. Um, I'll take that as a yes. Let me uh, ask you about the 25th Amendment, if I might, for just a moment. Uh, we know that former acting director of the FBI, Andy McCabe, he's publicly confirmed that he contemplated forcing the president from office using the 25th Amendment. To your knowledge, have FBI officials ever contemplated forcing any other president from office against his will using that provision? Not to my knowledge. Uh, the, the 25th Amendment contemplates the vice president taking over as president uh, when the president is unable to act. Would you agree that that text contemplates physical ailments like a coma, uh, mental incapacitation, not just political differences of opinion? Yes. Have you ever doubted, since you have been in your current position, whether this president is physically able, in a constitutional sense, to discharge the duties, his duties as president? No. Would you agree that discussions within the FBI of forcing the president out of office for political reasons gives the public, at best, reason to question uh, what the FBI is doing and to 
fear that there may be abuses of power in that organization. I, I think it gives reason to be concerned about those particular individuals that were involved. I, I don't attribute it to the organization. Speaking of particular individuals who are involved, I have to say, I, I've listened to this testimony all day today, and to me, maybe the most shocking thing I've heard is this. The chairman read it earlier, August 26th, 2016. This is a text message from Peter Strzok, a top counterintelligence investigator who we now know helped launch this counter-spy investigation of the President of the United States. Peter Strzok says, just went to a Southern Virginia Walmart. I could smell the Trump support. Smell is capitalized. Just went to a Southern Virginia Walmart. I could smell the Trump support. My view, you want to know what's really going on here. You want to know why the counterintelligence investigation really happened. You want to know why we're all really sitting here today. That's why, right there, is because an unelected bureaucrat, an unelected official in this government, who clearly has open disdain, if not outright hatred, for Trump voters, like the people of my state, for instance, I could smell the Trump support, then tried to overturn the results of a Democratic election. That's what's really gone on here. That's the story. That's why we're here today. I cannot believe that a top official of this government with the kind of power that these people had would try to, to exercise their own prejudices, and that's what this is. It's open, blatant prejudice. Would try to use that in order to overturn a democratic election. And to my mind, that's the real crisis here. And it is a crisis, because if there's not accountability, if this can go on in the United States of America, well then my goodness gracious, we don't have a democracy anymore. So I appreciate your leadership, uh, Mr. Attorney General. I, I look forward to hearing the results of your investigation. And I look forward to this committee continuing its constitutional responsibility to find out what is going on here and making sure that the will of the people is vindicated and established. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Blumenthal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Attorney General Barr, for being here today. Uh, you've been very adroit and agile in your responses to questions here. But I think history will judge you harshly and maybe a bit unfairly because you seem to have been the designated fall guy for this report. And I think that conclusion is inescapable in light of the four-page summary and then the press conference you did on the day it was released knowing that you had in hand a letter from the special counsel saying that he felt that you mischaracterized his report. And you were asked by one of my colleagues, uh, Senator Van Hollen, whether you know, uh, whether you knew that Bob Mueller supported your conclusion, and you said, I don't know whether Bob Mueller supported my conclusion. You were asked by Representative Chris. Excuse me, Senator. That conclusion was not related to my description of the findings in the March 24th letter. I, that conclusion refers to my conclusion on the obstruction well, cases. So it's, it's a it different was exactly conclusion. exactly the same it's a different word, conclusion. conclusions that was used by Special Counsel Mueller. And on the obstruction issue, at page 8 and 182 of the report, I don't know whether you have it in front of you, the special counsel specifically said, at the same time, I'm quoting, if we had confidence after a thorough investigation of the facts that the president clearly did not commit obstruction of justice, we would so state. He said it again at page 182, and yet in your summary, and in the press conference that you did, you, in effect, cleared the president on both so-called collusion yeah, the and difference, The difference is I used the, the proper standard. Um, that statement you just read is actually a very strange statement for on, a, on for a four prosecutor. four of the specific obstruction episodes, Robert Mueller concluded that there was substantial evidence on four, on the three necessary 
element of obstruction. Well, you're, you're on. You're a prosecutor. I, I have to finish my question. Okay. Well, you haven't questions. let me finish my answer. Well, uh, let me just finish the we question. We can do both. All right, good. Uh, you ignored in that press conference and in the summary that Robert Mueller found substantial evidence, and it's in the report. And we have a chart that shows the elements of that crime, intent, interference with an ongoing investigation, and the obstructive act. So I think that your credibility is undermined within the department, in this committee, and with the American people. And I want to ask you whether on those remaining investigations, the 12 to 14 investigations, whether you have had any communication with anyone in the White House? No. And will you give us an ironclad commitment that you will uh, in no way By the way, I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, the laundry list of investigations, but I certainly haven't talked the substance or been directed to do anything on any of the cases. Well, but. let me give you an opportunity to clarify. Yeah. Have you had any conversations with anyone in the White House about those ongoing investigations that were spawned or spun off by... I don't, I don't recall having any discuss, substantive discussion on the investigation. Have you had any non-substantive discussion? I mean, it's possible that the, a name of a case was mentioned. And have you provided information about any of those ongoing investigations? Any, invest, any information whatsoever? I don't recall, no. You don't recall? I don't recall providing any. Wouldn't you recall about whether you gave information to somebody in the White House about an ongoing criminal investigation in the Southern District of New York or the Eastern District of New York or the Eastern District of Virginia or the Department of Justice? Yeah, I mean, I, I just don't recall providing any substantive information about a case. Is there anything that would refresh your recollection? If I probably looked over a list of cases and thought about it. But, but I, I don't recall discussing You know what those investigations are. We've discussed them at your confirmation hearing, correct? Well, there are, I think you're 12 or 18 cases, right? You don't know what those investigations are, Mr. Trent? I do generally, but I, I, you know, I can't remember each of them. And let me ask cases. you one last time. You can't recall whether you have discussed those cases with anyone in the White House, including the President of the United States. My recollection is I have not discussed those. But cases. you don't recall for sure. I just. Let me move I, on. I, I, could, I can say very surely I did not discuss the substance of anything. Will you recuse yourself from those investigations? No. Let me uh, ask you about a couple of quotes from the president, since a number of my colleagues have raised the Russia investigation. Uh, and these are from the report, untruths recited by the report from the president in December of 2016, when President Trump was asked about the intelligence community's conclusion that Russia interfered in our election to boost Trump's chances. He said he had, quote, no idea if it's Russia, China, or somebody. It could be somebody sitting in a bed someplace. 400-pound person. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman? 400-pound person sitting on a bed. That isn't what the president said. He referred to it as somebody. Uh, he also at Helsinki denied Russian attacks in 2016 on our election. Another lie. Two days after President Trump was elected, Russian officials told the press that the Russian government had maintained contacts with Trump's, quote, immediate entourage, end quote, during the campaign. When President Trump was asked about it, he said, quote, there was no communication between the campaign and any foreign entity during the campaign. That's at page 21 of volume two. The first quote I gave you was from page 21 of volume two. The president initially denied playing any role in shaping his son's statement 
to the press about the now infamous June 9th meeting. The Mueller report established that the president dictated a misleading statement about that meeting through his communications director, Hope Hicks. That's at page 101 and 102 of volume two. After news organizations reported that the president ordered McGahn, Mr. McGahn, to have the special counsel removed, the president publicly disputed these accounts. The Mueller report establishes that, quote, substantial evidence supports the conclusion that the president, in fact, directed McGahn to call Rosenstein to have the special counsel removed. That's at volume two, page 88. In your view, did President Trump on those occasions and others recited in the report lie to the American people? Well, I'm not in the business of determining when lies are told to the American people. I'm in the business of determining whether a crime has been committed. So he may have lied. But, but I'd like an opportunity to answer some of these questions, okay? Um, you started by you started by by citing this thing uh, in, in volume two about how uh, the report says that they could not be sure that they could clearly uh, say that he did not violate the law. As you know, that's not the standard we use in the criminal justice system. It's presumed that someone is innocent, and the government has to pr has to prove that they clearly violated the law. We're not in the business of exoneration. We're not in the business of proving they didn't violate the law. But so you I, effect, I found that whole you passage in very exonerated bizarre. him in your press conference and in your four-page summary. Me. How did that start? I didn't hear the beginning of the question. You, in effect, exonerated or cleared the president. No, I didn't exonerate. I, I said that uh, we did not believe that there was sufficient evidence to establish an obstruction offense, which is the job of the Justice Department. And the job of the Justice Department is now over. That determines whether or not there's a crime. The report is now in the hands of the American people. Everyone can decide for themselves. There's an election in 18 months. That's a very democratic process. But we're out of it. And we have to stop using the criminal justice process as a political weapon. My time has expired. I apologize, Mr. Chairman, but I would just say that the four-page letter and the press conference that you did left the clear impression, and it's been repeated again and again, that you cleared the president. Th thank you. Senator Ernst. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Attorney General Barr, for being here today and, and visiting with all of us. Um, uh, the special counsel's investigation and and all of the ripples that came from the 2016 presidential election have really permeated the country. I mean, there is great interest in this. And as I'm touring the, the 99 counties of Iowa, I am asked about this at town halls and other interactions with my constituents just as much as any other issue uh, at hand. And I'm sure many of the other senators here have had the same experience. And I'd like to start today by visiting with you about the actions of Russia during the 2016 presidential election. I think that's where a lot of us would like to see the focus go. Uh, we need to focus on what happened in the 2016 election and then look ahead and make sure we are safeguarding our practices. Um, so I think it's natural to think of acts of aggression uh, by a foreign state in terms of um, bullets, terms of bombs. That's what we typically thought of as acts of aggression. Uh, after all, up until just recent days, acts of aggression or warfare has been a symmetrical operation by a foreign adversary. Uh, in the past, it's been practiced by boots on the ground or various bombing campaigns. But that's not what we are facing today. And I do believe what we saw from Russia was an act of aggression. Uh, other adversarial foreign states, not just Russia, but I think a number of colleagues have mentioned uh, China as well, perhaps North Korea, Iran. We could go on and on. Not only do they practice direct hostile military action, just as Russia did in Ukraine with its illegal annexation of Crimea, um, but as was detailed in the special counsel's report, they seek to influence the elections of our free states through cyber means. And it is an objective fact that Russia attempted to influence our election. We know that, folks. 
All of us admit to that. We see the evidence that Russia tried to influence our election. Uh, the hacks, the disinformation, and social media cyber attacks by Russia were done with the intent to sow discord among the American people. Russia will show no hesitation. They have not in the past, they won't in the future, in using these types of acts of aggression in an attempt to undermine our elections process and our way of life. And it doesn't matter if the attack is coming from the end of a barrel of a gun or the click of a mouse. Um, we have to get uh, to the bottom of it. And so, uh, General Barr, the past two years, we've been talking about this investigation in terms of what happened and now we have the opportunity to decide how to do better. Uh, so the special counsel's report is the end of the road. I think many have stated that. The end of the road when it comes to the question of the Trump administration's intent, but it is just the beginning of the conversation on how we counter Russia and other foreign adversaries in their attempts to undermine our republic. So. If we can talk about that 2016 presidential election, do you see vulnerabilities or weaknesses that existed at, at that time that left us open to foreign uh, aggression, foreign influence in the election system? And then how do we move forward through the Department of Justice and making sure we're shoring up some of those avenues of approach of our foreign adversaries? <clears throat> yes. Um the FBI, you know, has a very robust uh, program, the Foreign Influence Task Force, which is focused on this problem and uh, is working to uh, counteract and prepare for the kinds of uh, interference that we so have seen. Um, and it's a very dynamic program. I've been uh, briefed on it by, by Chris Ray, and I'm very impressed with what they're, what they're up to. Um, I think that the way I, the way I view this general problem is there has always been efforts by Russia and other hostile countries mm -hmm. to influence American elections and public opinion, but it was uh, more easily detectable and it was sort of a cruder operation in the past. And what we have now is with technology and the democratization of information, uh, the danger is far more insidious. Um, and it, it enables not only them getting into effectively our whole communication system here in the United States, and I'm just, I, I mean just the way we uh, communicate with each other and, and into our business systems, our infrastructure, uh, but it also allows them to do exactly what we've seen, which is because of our robust First Amendment uh, freedoms, they're able to come in and pretend they're Americans and, and uh, affect the dialogue and the, and the social dynamics in the United States in a way that they've never been able to do before. And it's a huge challenge uh, to deal with it, but uh, I think the intelligence community is responding to the challenge and the threat. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I had this discussion with Bob Mueller on, on March 5th when he was briefing me on his work. and discussing lessons learned, what he has seen in dismantling the, the threats that he you know, was able to detect and how we can start using that approach uh, across the board. So I see we've accomplished a lot through our federal agencies and through the Department of Justice then. Are we able to work with different social media giants, other uh, private organizations to help counter some of this? Do you see that they are actually stepping up to this challenge, taking this on and, and making sure that they are pushing back as well against what they might determine as a, a foreign adversary? Yes, I think the, the private companies are uh, you know, stepping up their game and, and being more responsible in addressing it. I think, and, it's and, yeah. I think that's important. I'm sorry, yeah. go ahead, please, uh, General. Um, I, I just think it's important that we really focus on why we're here today, and that's because we did see Russian influence in our 2016 presidential election. What we need to make sure, as many of 
of our other colleagues have, have noted is that this doesn't happen to us again and that we are aware and as a public we are aware of what has been happening not just in our own uh, elections process here in the United States but to many of our allies around the globe as well yes. and making sure that we are adequately pushing back against that and, and even overmatching uh, in making sure that, that we keep that type of influence out of our election cycle. So I appreciate your time today. Thank you very much, Chairman thank you, Barr. Thank you. Senator Hirano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barr, now the American people know that you are no different from Rudy Giuliani or Kellyanne Conway or any of the other people who sacrificed their once decent reputation for the grifter and liar who sits in the Oval Office. You once turned down a job offer from Donald Trump to represent him as his private attorney. At your confirmation hearing, you told Senator Feinstein that, quote, the job of attorney general is not the same as representing, end quote, the president. So you know the difference, but you've chosen to be the president's lawyer and side with him over the interests of the American people. To start with, you should never have been involved in supervising the Robert Mueller investigation. You wrote a 19-page unsolicited memo, which you admit was not based on any facts, attacking the premise of half of the investigation. And you also should have insisted that Deputy Attorney General Rob Rosenstein recuse himself. He wasn't just a witness to some of the president's obstructive behavior. We now know he was in frequent personal contact with the president, a subject of the investigation. You should have left it to career officials. Then, once the report was delivered by the special counsel, you delayed its release for more than two weeks. You let the president's personal lawyers look at it before you even deigned to let Congress or the public see it. During the time you substituted your own political judgment for the special counsel's, counsel's legal conclusions in a four-page letter to Congress. And now we know, thanks to a free press, that Mr. Mueller wrote you a letter objecting to your so-called summary. When you called Mueller to discuss his letter, the reports are that he thought your summary was giving the press, Congress, and the public a misleading impression of his work. He asked you to release the report summaries to correct the misimpression you created, but you refused. When you finally did decide to release the report over a congressional recess and on the eve of two major religious holidays, you called a press conference to once again try to clear Donald Trump before anyone had a chance to read the special counsel's report and come to their own conclusions. But when we read the report, we knew Robert Mueller's concerns were valid and that your version of events was false. You used every advantage of your office to create the impression that the president was cleared of misconduct. You selectively quoted fragments from the special counsel's report, taking some of the most important statements out of context and ignoring the rest. You put the power and authority of the Office of the Attorney General and the Department of Justice behind a public relations effort to help Donald Trump protect himself. Finally, you lied to Congress. You told Representative Charlie Crist that you didn't know what objections Mueller's team might have to your March 24th so-called summary. You told Senator Chris Van Hollen that you didn't know if Bob Mueller supported your conclusions, but you knew you lied, and now we know. A lot of respected nonpartisan legal experts and elected officials were surprised by your efforts to protect the president. But I wasn't surprised. You did exactly what I thought you'd do. It's why I voted against your confirmation. I expected you would try to protect the president, and indeed you did. In 1989, this isn't uh, something you hadn't done before. In 1989, when you refused to show Congress an OLC opinion that led to the arrest of Manuel Noriega. In 1992, when you recommended pardons for the subjects of the Iran-Contra scandal. And last year, when you wrote the 19-page memo telling Donald Trump as president can't be guilty of, of obstruction of justice and then didn't recuse yourself from the matter. From the beginning, you were addressing an audience of one, that person being Donald Trump. That's why before the bombshell news of yesterday evening, 11 of my Senate colleagues and I called on the Department of Justice Inspector General and Office of Professional Responsibility to investigate the way you have handled the Mueller report. 
I wanted them to determine whether your actions have complied with the department's policies and practices and whether you have demonstrated sufficient impartiality to continue to oversee the 14 other criminal matters that the special counsel referred to in other parts, to other parts of the Department of Justice. But now, we know more about your deep involvement in trying to cover up for Donald Trump. Being Attorney General of the United States is a sacred trust. You have betrayed that trust. America deserves better. You should resign. I have some questions for you. Is the White House exerting any influence on your decision whether to allow Special Counsel Mueller to testify in Congress and when? No. Now, you've been clear today that you don't think that any of the 10 episodes of possible obstruction that the Special Counsel outlined is a crime. I disagree. But you seem to think that if it's not a crime, then there's no problem. Nothing to see here, nothing to worry about. So with apologies to Adam Schiff, do you think all of the things that President Trump did are okay? Are they what the President of the United States should be doing? For example, do you think it's okay for a President to fire an FBI director to stop him from investigating links between his, his campaign and Russia? It may not be a crime, but do you think it's okay? Well, I, I think the report is clear that that no, I'm not talking about the report well, and well, its analysis of whether a crime occurred. I'm asking you. I don't this think is not a crime, but do you think it's okay for the president to do what he did, to fire the special counsel to okay keep them from the investigating? I think it's okay for what he did, and I don't think the evidence supports the proposition so I guess you he did think it it's okay. to stop the investigation. Do you think it's okay for a president to ask his White House counsel to lie? Um, well, I, I'm willing to talk about what's criminal. But no, but we've already acknowledged that you think it was not a crime. I'm just asking whether you think it's okay. Even if it's not a crime, do you think it's okay for the president to ask his White House counsel to lie? Which Look, event? if you're just going to go back to whether no, or not it's a crime, you you're telling about? me that which it's okay. Let me ask you about? the last question that I have in 17 seconds. Do you think it's okay for a president to offer pardons to people who don't testify against him to threaten the family of someone who does? Is that okay? Uh, what? When did he offer a, a pardon to someone? I think you know what I'm talking about. Please, what do you please, mean, please, Mr. Attorney General. You know, give us some credit for knowing what the hell is going on around here with you. Not really. To this line of questioning. So, no, no, we're gonna, listen. You've slandered this man. Yeah. What Every I sort of want to know is how do we get how do we get to this point? Yeah, I do not so, think so that I'm slandering get to the point anyone. All, all I can we, say, Mr. Chairman, I am done. Thank you very and much. And you slandered this man from top to bottom. So if you want more of this, you're not going to get it. If you want to ask him questions, you can't. You certainly have your opinion. Thank you, I Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, General Barr, for being here today. We really appreciate your time. Uh, I, I want to talk with you just a little bit about some of your bottom line conclusions, because I think there's one that we need to kind of circle back to uh, a little bit. And as I've listened to a lot of the conversation here today, one of the things we've not discussed is what seems to be the culture at DOJ and the FBI. And I know there are a lot of good people that work there, and we're grateful for their service. But every organization has a culture. And whether it's a corporate culture or uh, a church or schools or, or whatever, and what seems to have happened at the FBI is there is a seedy, cynical, political culture within a group that developed. And these individuals collectively seem to think that they could work within the power of their jobs and their roles with the federal government. There was an elitism and an arrogance there, and it speaks to a very unhealthy work culture within that agency. And I will tell you this, when I talk to Tennesseans, they talk a lot about what they want to see with uh, the Department of Justice and the FBI post 
all of this and a restoration of trust and integrity and accountability. And really in Tennessee, they'll talk to me about four, four things. They talk a lot about health care, jobs in the economy. They're going to talk about getting federal judges confirmed and about reigning in government and holding it accountable. And there's been a lot of hysteria. This is something that grew within the ranks of the FBI. What are you doing and what is your plan for rebuilding that trust and integrity so that the American people can say, when the FBI does its job, when the DOJ does its job, we know that is a job done right? Uh, I, I don't think there is, there is a, a bad culture in the FBI, and I don't think the problems that manifested themselves during the 2016 election are endemic to the institution. I think the FBI is doing its job. I mean, just this recent case out in California where they interdicted this, uh, you know, would-be bomber. Um, they do great work around the country every day, and it's a, it, I agree with Senator Kennedy who said, you know, it's the premier law enforcement institution in the world. I believe that, and I say to the extent there was overreach, I don't want to judge people's motives and come to a conclusion on that, but to the extent there was overreach, what we have to be concerned about is, it, 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 you know, a, a few people at the top, uh, what, uh, Get, getting it into their heads that they know better than the American people. And, and that is the problem. And that is what we hope that you are um, yep. you're addressing. Let's go back to this because to, repeat, um, to the report, to produce it, I think that Mr. Mueller assembled what would be called a dream team, 19 all-star lawyers, a Watergate prosecutor, a deputy solic solicitor general, a fluent Russian speaker, who cloaked for two Supreme Court justices, former head of the Enron Investigative Task Force, chief of the Public Corruption Unit in the Manhattan U.S. Attorney's Office, federal prosecutors who have taken down mob bosses, the mafia, and ISIS terrorists. Do you consider these lawyers to be the best and the brightest in the field? Not necessarily. Are they the warriors you would want on your side in the courtroom? I mean, uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of great lawyers in the Department of Justice. Uh, okay. You know, he assembled a, a very competent team. Are they meticulous investigators who will hunt down every witness and every piece of evidence? I, I think they are tenacious investigators. Are they devoted to finding the truth? Uh, yes. Are they masters at taking down hardened criminals, foreign and domestic? Yes. If there were evidence to warrant a recommendation for collusion charges against the president, do you believe the special counsel team would have found it? Yes. And if there were evidence to warrant your recommendation for obstruction of justice charges against the president, do you believe the Mueller team would have found it? Uh, I, I think that they had an exhaust, they canvassed uh, the evidence exhaustively on, uh, they didn't reach a decision on it. But the question you've just been asking raises a point I wanted to say when Senator Hirono was talking, which is, it's, you know, how did we get to the point here where the evidence is now that the president was falsely accused of colluding with the Russians and accused of being treasonous and accused of being a Russian agent, and the evidence now is that was without a basis, and two years of his administration uh, have been dominated by the allegations that have now been proven false. And, you know, to, to, to listen to some of the rhetoric, you would think that the Mueller report had found the opposite. And, uh, you know, Mr. Attorney General, I will tell you, that is what Tennesseans say. They say, how did we get here? How is there this allowance and acceptedness of saying, that's okay, because it's not? And people want to see government held accountable. They want agencies to act with accountability to the American people. And they don't want to ever see this happen again. It doesn't matter if a candidate is a Democrat, a Republican, or an Independent. They never want to see this happen again because they know that this was pointed 
at using the power that they had to try to tilt an election or to achieve a different outcome. And the American people want equal justice, they want respect for the rule of law, and they want fairness from the system. I have one other question uh, dealing with social media. Tennessee Republican Party had a uh, 10 underscore GOP account that was set up by the Russians. And, you know, either, I think as we look at social media, either they were willing to turn a blind eye and allow these accounts to go up because they knew they were being paid in rubles on some of these accounts, and or if there was just negligence. So my hope is that with all the bad actor states, whether it is Russia or Iran or North Korea or China, that you all have a game plan for dealing with these platforms in a way that you're going to rein them in for the 2020 election. I yell back. Thank you. Uh, Senator Booker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Barr, as I take a step back at this, I, I just really think we're at a very sobering moment in American history that there is a considerable amount going on when you actually take time and read this whole report that shows that we're sort of at a crossroad, and I fear uh, that we're descending into a new normal that is dangerous for our democracy on a number of levels. And I fear, unfortunately, I hope we have a chance to discuss this, that, that you've not only put your own credibility into question, but seem to be giving sanction to behavior through the language you used in that press conference you held, the language you used uh, in your summary that, that stimulated Mueller to write such a strong rebuking letter. I, I fear that you are adding normalcy to a point where we should be sounding alarms, as opposed to saying that there's nothing to, to see here. Um, and so one, this 448 page report that has a deep litany of lies and deceit and misconduct of President of the United States instructing people to lie and be deceitful, uh, evidence of people trying to cover up behavior that on its face is morally wrong, whatever the legal standard is. Uh, I found it, number one, uh, to by saying that this kind of obstructive conduct was acceptable, not only acceptable, but your sentence literally saying that the American people should be grateful for it, that is the beginning of normalization that I want to explore. Be but the second thing I want to explore, and we'll explore this, but I want to make my two th statements at the, at the top. One, that's problematic. And, and General, the second problem I have is that you seem to be excusing a campaign that literally had hundreds of contacts with a foreign adversary that I think there's a conclusion amongst, and a bipartisan conclusion, that there was a failure to even report those contacts, that we engaged in behaviors that the folks knew that, that were wrong, that they tried to actively hide. They seem to capitalize, seek to capitalize on this foreign interference. I mean, in our country, we know it is illegal for a campaign and wrong for a campaign to share polling data with an American super PAC. But we have here documented a level of coordination with a foreign adversary sharing polling data. And, and, and we seem to be, and your conduct seems to be, trying to normalize that behavior. And that's why I think we are in such a serious moment that, could, that is eroding the cultures uh, of this democracy and the security of this democracy. And so let's just get into some of this specifically. Um, you said, quote, we know that the Russian operatives who perpetrated these schemes did not have the cooperation of President Trump or the Trump campaign. That is something that all Americans can and should be grateful to have confirmed. The things I just mentioned, uh, a, a willingness to meet with Russian operatives in order to capitalize on information. I don't think that's something that should be grateful. Uh, I, I find your, your choice of words alarming. I think it, it calls into question your objectivity when you look at the actual context of the report. And so should the American people really be grateful that a candidate for president sought to benefit from material and information that was stolen by a foreign power in an effort to influence an election? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by seek to benefit. 
there's, there's no indication that uh, they engaged in the con either the conspiracy to hack or that they engaged in any action with respect to the dissemination that was criminal. Well, again, sir, you're using the word conspiracy, which is a legal term. In that press conference, you used President Trump's words, obstruction, over and over again. Uh, pulling Obstruction's a legal term. Well, well sir, you, you pulled into his words, and I, I'm asking you specifically, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, collusion was the word I was looking for. Okay. You use the word no collusion over and over again. Um, and, the, and you said the American people should be grateful that the president sought to benefit from material and information. But you know they did seek to benefit from that material. Donald Trump Jr. in his own email seemed to celebrate that he might have access to information from a foreign adversary. Is that correct? Uh, Is that something the American people should be grateful in, for? Apparently, according to the report, he was Uh, apparently, uh, he was interested in seeing what this uh, Russian woman had in the way of, quote, and, and, and did not report it as I think everybody who's in politics knows it's something you should do. Should the American people be grateful well, that in the face of our attack on our democracy by a foreign adversary, that the President of the United States made several documented attempts to thwart an investigation into the links between his campaigns and Russia? You use that word grateful again, that the American people should be grateful. Is, should, is that something we should be grateful for? I'm not sure what, what you're talking about. Well, uh, sir, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the attempts that this president made that, that Mueller pointed to at least 10 attempts to thwart an investigation into the links between his campaign and Russia. Should we be grateful for those 10 well-documented attempts by Mueller? You, are you talking about the obstruction part of the uh, report? Yeah, you I'm talking thwart? about the, the second volume, but, okay. but I'm, let me continue. Should the American people be grateful that the Trump had more than 215 documented contacts between Russian-linked operatives and then lied about them and tried to hide them? Is that something the American people should be grateful for any president, this one or any down the road? The, 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 as I s mentioned earlier, uh, during a campaign, foreign governments make and, and, and foreign citizens frequently make a lot of attempts to contact different campaigns. If we were right now to go and look at, for example, Hillary Clinton's campaign during the same time Sir, frame, I, I, wait, I, time frame it, then, then you would see a lot of uh, foreign governments sir, like Chinese trying to establish. And, and that's, I guess, what I'm trying to say to you, sir, is that we right now have a new normal in our country. We have a document that shows over 200 attempt, uh, connections between a, a presidential campaign and a foreign adversary. Sharing information that would be illegal if you did it with a super PAC, we know that. But what sharing, information was shared? Uh, polling data was shared, sir. It's in the report, I can with, cite with, you the page. With who? And I, and I guess my point is, is that your willingness to seem to brush over this and, and use words like the American people should be grateful, what's in this report? Nobody should be grateful. Concerted efforts for deception, for misleading, inappropriate action after inappropriate action that, that is clear. And then on top of that, at a time that we all recognize that we had a foreign power trying to undermine our election, you, the chief law enforcement officer, not only undermines your own credibility as an independent actor, when there's ongoing investigation still, using the word president's own words, having it criticized by the Mueller himself, but, but the, the challenge we now have is that we are going into an area where you seem to not even be willing to be in the least bit critical in, in your summarizations. I, I believe that calls in your credibility, uh, and again, uh, my time is up. Senator Tillis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Barr, thank you for being here. On the, in the last sentence on page one of your uh, four-page memo, it states that the special counsel issued more than 2,800 subpoenas, executed nearly 500 search warrants, obtained more than 230 orders for communication records, issued almost 50 orders authorizing the use of pen registers, made 13 requests of foreign governments for evidence, and interviewed approximately 500 people. That seems like a pretty extensive investigation to me. It took about 22 months, right? Right. Um, and it was summarized in about a, a little over 400 page document. Volume two was just under 200 pages as I recall. I've read volume two word for word and I've read most of uh, volume one. Um, the new normal that seems to be created here is even after all of this investigation and you haven't found any conduct worthy of indictment that you can just bounce back for political reasons and indict somebody. That's a rhetorical 
statement or right. question, not a statement. Now I want to go back to the other part that I find interesting here. The New York Times already issued a headline that says, um, Mueller pushed in letter for Barr to release the report's summary. So now the, the narrative, because I've had a lot of people in the press coming out, and the narrative is, well, doesn't this undermine the, uh, the attorney general because Mueller wanted the executive summaries issued? Now I want to go back to what you said in your opening statement. You said that, I believe, using your words, the, the body politic was, it was unrestful. You'd gotten the report. You didn't get the 6E information. You had to do the redacting. You knew that that was going to take time. It would have been helpful if you'd gotten that when the report was transmitted to you, and it took however long it took. Um, you issued the summary. You used the analogy of, of, of announcing the verdict and waiting for the transcript. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever at any point say, you know, what I really want to do is issue this letter and then let the news media play with it for three or four weeks, and then we'll get the redacted version out? Did that ever cross your mind? No, we were pushing uh, to get it done as soon pushing, as possible. Uh, to get the report out as soon yeah. as possible. And at any point in time, when the president had the opportunity to issue their own advice on redactions or, or assert executive privilege over the course of the weeks that you were doing the review of the report, did you ever get advice from the president or from anybody in the White House to assert executive privilege or to redact any portion of the document? No. None. And so the narrative between the letter and the redaction process was, we're going to get a report that's 80% redacted. Now, would you give me the, the numbers again on the version that's available to the leadership of Congress? The, the numbers again. I think you said one-tenth of one percent. We're, we're, we're skipping over volume one, and we're spending time on volume two. Yes, Did I hear you say that the legislative leaders have access to all but one-tenth of one percent of the entire report? Approximately, right. yes. So, guys, you can go out and spend this any way you want to, but the data is there. There was no underlying crime, and there was insufficient evidence to indict the president on obstruction of justice. You said something else that's interesting to me in the report about that we found no evidence that was sufficient to indict. Uh, but then they went on to say, nor can we exonerate them. What is a special counsel in the business of exonerating a subject of an investigation? They're not. They're not. So why would somebody put something like that in the report? I don't know. And, and so would it, it, would, it would follow, if that's uncommon, that you would not have actually included that in a summary before the full context of the report could be produced. Is that a fair statement? That's a fair statement, but I did put in the sentence about not, I did put in the sentence about not exoneration. Yeah. Um, I, I think that the, the, the thing that frustrates me, number one, I should have started by saying this, the vast majority of people in the Department of Justice and the FBI are extraordinary people. The chairman is right. Uh, starting with uh, Strzok and Page and everybody else leading up before the investigation, I hope they're being investigated. I have a, qu I have a question for you. The scope of the OIG, um, where does, do, do you understand or do you know what the scope of that report will be? Will it be purely on this investigation or would it extend to all other acts that may have in some way influenced this investigation? Well, I, I don't want to be too specific. Uh, I talked to, uh, to Mike Horowitz a few weeks ago about it, and it's focused on the FISA, the basis for the FISA and the handling of the FISA uh, applications. But by necessity, it looks back a little bit earlier than that. Um, the people I have helping me with my review will be working very closely with Mr. Horowitz. Now, I want to go back again because we have other people talking. I'm sure it's going to come up again. I'm clear in this report there was no underlying crime. Is that correct? Yeah. That uh, Yes. Right. And, and I mean, there was that's, that's the conclusion of the report. And there was insufficient evidence or, or insufficient evidence to assert that the president obstructed justice. And a lot of that evidence was in the public eye because we've talked about tweets and public statements and a number of other things that we're trying to use to assert as evidence for obstruction of justice. It seems odd to me that people on this committee that pound and pound over and over again that you're innocent and proven, until proven guilty with the extent of this report, with the number of resources, nearly $30 million, when the facts don't lead to the outcome that you wanted, the one that the marketing department wanted, to use this as a political tool for the next 20 months. It seems odd to me that we'd go down the, uh, the path of 
uh, saying that, well, in spite of all the work, we're going to indict them anyway, and if we can't indict them, then we're going to impugn your integrity and call you a liar. I find that behavior on this committee despicable. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Harris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Attorney General Barr, has the President or anyone at the White House ever asked or suggested that you open an investigation of anyone? Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh... Yes or no? Could you, could you repeat that question? I will repeat it. Yeah. Has the President or anyone at the White House ever asked or suggested that you open an investigation of anyone? Yes or no, please, sir. Um, President or anybody else. Seems you'd remember something like that and be able to tell us. Yeah, but I'm, I'm trying to grapple with the word suggest. I mean, uh, there have been discussions of, of matters out there that uh, they have not asked me to open an investigation, but. Perhaps they've suggested? I don't know. I wouldn't say suggest. Hinted? I, I don't know. Inferred? You don't know. Okay. Um, in your March 24th summary, you wrote that, quote, after reviewing the special counsel's final report. But I will say that no one. Sir, I'm, not, I'm asking a question. In your March 24th summary, you wrote that, quote, after reviewing the special counsel's final report, Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein and I have concluded that the evidence is not sufficient to establish that the president committed an obstruction of justice offense. Now, the special counsel's investigation produced a great deal of evidence. Um, I'm led to believe it included witnesses' notes and emails, witnesses' congressional testimony, witnesses' interviews, um, which were summarized in the FBI 302 forms, former FBI Director Comey's memos, and the President's public statements. My question is, in reaching your conclusion, did you personally review all of the underlying evidence? Uh, no, we took and accept did, 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 we accepted did Mr. Rosenstein? No, we accepted the statements in the report as the factual record. We did not go underneath it to see whether or not they were accurate. We accepted it as accurate and made our- So made you our, accepted it, the report as the evidence? Yes. You did not question or look at the underlying evidence that supports the conclusions in the report? No. Did uh, Mr. Rosenstein review the evidence that underlines and supports the conclusions in the report, to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge. We accepted the statements in the report did and the characterization your, of the evidence is true. Did anyone in your executive office review the evidence supporting the report? No. No. Yet you represented to the American public that the evidence was not, quote, sufficient to support an obstruction of justice the evidence offense. Present, the evidence presented in the report. This is, not a, this is not a mysterious process. In the Department of Justice, we have pros memos and declination memos every day coming up. And we don't go and look at the underlying evidence. We Sir, take, would you we support- We take the characterization of the evidence as true. As the Attorney General of the United States, you run the United States Department of Justice. If in any U.S. attorney's office around the country, the head of that office, when being asked to make a critical decision about, in this case, the person who holds the highest office in the land, mm -hmm. and whether or not that person committed a crime, would you accept them recommending a charging decision to you if they had not reviewed the evidence? Well, that's a question for Bob Mueller. He's the U.S. attorney. He's the one who presents the report. But it was you who made the charging decision, sir. You made the decision not to charge the president. No, in a pros memo and in a declination memo. You said it was your baby. What did you mean by that? It was my, it was my baby to, to let to decide whether or not to disclose it to the public. And whose decision and we, was and, it? Who's, and, who had the power to make the decision about whether or not the evidence was sufficient to make a determination of whether there had been an obstruction of justice? Prosecution memos go up to the supervisor, in this case it was the, you know, the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General, who, who decide on the final decision. And that is based on the memo as presented by the U.S. Attorney's Office. I think you've I've made seen, it clear that of, you've not looked I've at the evidence. We can move on. I think it, you've made it clear, sir, that you've not looked at the evidence, and we can day. move on. Will you agree to consult career DOJ ethics officials about whether your recusal from the 14 investigations that have been discussed by my colleagues is necessary? 
Uh, I, I don't see any basis for it. I already consulted with them, and, and you it, have consulted it, with them about the 14 other investigations about the, uh, about the uh, Mueller case. Have you consulted with the career DOJ ethics officials about the appropriateness? of you being involved or recusing yourself well, what, from the 14 other investigations that have been referred basis? out. On what basis? Conflict of interest, clear conflict of interest. Conflict, what's my conflict of interest? I think the American public has seen quite well that you are biased in this situation and you've not been objective, and that would arguably be the conflict of interest. Well, you know, interest. I haven't been the only decision maker here. Now, let's take the Deputy Attorney General, Rod Rosenstein, who was approved by this Senate 94 to 6 with specific discussion on the floor that he would be responsible for supervising the Russian investigation. I'm glad you brought up that. Okay. That's and a great topic. He has 30 topic. years experience, and we had a number of senior prosecutors in the department involved in this process, both career and non-career. Yes, I've, who, I've, who I've, were, I've read the process, on the sir. I have another question. And I'm glad you brought that subject up, because I have a question about that. Earlier today, in response to Senator Graham, you said, quote, that you consulted with Rosenstein constantly, unquote, with respect to the special counsel's investigation and report. But Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein is also a key witness in the firing of FBI Director Comey. Did you consult well, that's with D I'm not finished. Yeah. Did you consult with DOJ ethics officials before you enlisted Rod Rosenstein to participate in a charging decision for an investigation, the subject of which he is also a witness? My understanding was that he had been cleared already to participate in it by the So you had theory. consulted with them and they cleared it? No, I think they cleared it when he when he took over the investigation. Did That's you consult? My understanding, I, 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 I you I don't, don't know whether he's been cleared of well, a he, conflict of interest. He would be participating if there was a conflict of interest. So you're saying that it did not need to be reviewed by the career ethics officials in your office. I believe to I believe it, it was. was well, I believe it was reviewed, and I and what would was also point out this seems to be a bit of a flip flop because when. The president's supporters Sir, the were challenging Rosenstein. flip-flop, I think, in this case is that you're not answering the question directly. What? Did the ethics officials in your office, in the Department of Justice, review the appropriateness of Rod Rosenstein being a part of making a charging decision on an investigation which he is also a witness in? Yeah, my, so as I said, my understanding was he had been cleared and he had been cleared before I arrived. By in making a decision on the Mueller report? Yes. And, and the findings of whether or not the case would be charged on obstruction of justice? He had he, been cleared on a, that? He was, he was the acting attorney general on the Mueller investigation. Had he been cleared he had been, to make, I, I am, it, by your side, a I am decision? Informed, I am informed that before I arrived, he had been cleared by the ethics officials. Of what? Of serving as acting attorney general on the Mueller case. How about making a charging decision on obstruction of justice, that is the what underlying the offenses which include him as a witness? You know, he, he, that's what the acting attorney general's job is. To be a witness and to make the decision about being a prosecutor? Well, no, but to make charging decisions. I have nothing else. My time is right out. Thank you. Uh, Senator, uh, let's see, we got Senator Cruz. I'd like to do short second rounds. I've got to go to another hearing at 240. We're going to take four votes, but to my colleagues on the other side, I would like to do a very short second round and uh, wrap it up. So, oh, I'm sorry, Senator. Senator Crapo, I apologize. All right, thank you. Attorney General Barr, uh, I know you've gone through almost everything that could have been asked so far today, but and I'm going to go over a few things that you've already talked about, but I appreciate your willingness to get into it with me. Uh, first, I want to talk about the letter of uh, March 27th that's been talked about a lot from Mr. Mueller. Mm -hmm. uh, first, could you tell me who released that letter to the public? Um, who released it to whom? Uh, yes, I mean, how did it get released? Was that a decision that you made to release that letter? Yeah, I think the department provided it this morning. Okay. Oh no. Excuse me. I mean, went to the Washington Post. How did the Washington Post get the letter? I don't know. That's what I thought. Um, so, well, let's talk about the letter for, for a moment. Uh, you indicated that. Uh, I assume the Washington Post got it from the Department of Justice. Yeah. Well, I think but we need to find that out. 
but we can get into that later. If, if you're not aware, then let's move on to other aspects of the, of the issue. Uh, you indicated that uh, you did not feel you needed to release as much as Mr. Mueller thought you needed to release at the outset. You gave a summary of the conclusions, and he apparently wanted to see a, uh, the summaries of each section that he had put together released, correct? Yes. Could you go over again the reason why you responded to him when he asked you to release portions of the report before you released it in its entirety? Yes. Uh, this was on the conversation on Thursday, the day I got his letter. And uh, I said that I didn't want to put out, it was already several days after we had received the report and I had put out the four page letter on Sunday. And I said, I don't, I don't want to put out summaries of the report that would trigger all kinds of frenzy about what was said in the summaries. And then when the more information comes out, it would recalibrate to that. And I said, I just want to put it out one time, everything together. And uh, I told him that was, that was the game plan. All right. And, and I just think it's important to point that out again, because there's been a lot of spin about the letter and uh, what what right. what it was that was being requested and what your response to that was. Right. I think it was important to help get that get out again and get clarified. The reason I ask who released the letter is because uh, there have been a lot of releases of documents from the FBI that were basically leaks. And I was just curious as to whether that letter was a leak. I'm not asking you that to go no, into I that. I think now. what happened, I mean, I hope my people jump me if I'm wrong on this, but I think the fact of, uh, I mean, the information about Mueller's concerns were leaked, and I think some news organizations were starting to ask about that. And so then the letter and that, was And in released. that context, I think the letter was provided. Is that accurate? So there were leaks, at least, about the concerns that, and the conversations yes. that you had had. Yes. Uh, that gets back to the broader question of leaks that, that I want to get into now. And you've had a number of people, senators, have asked you about the perceived bias at the FBI, that, that, and I, I heard your responses earlier that uh, you believe the culture at the FBI is strong and solid, and I agree with that. Um, I do believe, however, that it's been pretty clearly shown in a number of different ways that there are some individuals at the FBI at high levels who in the past few years have um, not been uh, holding up the standards of the FBI that, that the American people expect of them. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the report of the uh, DOJ's Inspector General Michael Horowitz, where he looked at uh, bias in the FBI. And uh, in fact, he found it. And he indicated in a hearing in this room before us that he did in fact find that there was F bias at the FBI. And that, uh, but, but he said that he wasn't able to prove that the bias affected the employee's work product because as in, in questions that I asked him, um, he said, I found that there was clearly bias, but in order to prove whether that affected the work output of those who were biased, I had to ask them whether it impacted it, and they of course said no, and I didn't have other evidence to prove otherwise. Uh, this is, gets back to a conversation you had earlier about whether the FBI's business or whether his business was to prove uh, a negative or whether it was to find uh, some actionable conduct. Uh, my, my reason in going through this with you is uh, that I want to get at what we can do. Well, first of all, whether you agree that there is a problem of bias in the FBI in some parts of, or in some individuals at the FBI, and whether you are undertaking activities to address that. Well, <clears throat> you know, I, I, you mean political bias? Yes. Uh, whether, the, whether there is political bias that is resulting in biased conduct by FBI agents. I haven't, I haven't seen that since I've been there. I think that Chris Ray, the new director, has changed out uh, the people who were there before and brought in, uh, not brought in from outside, but promoted and uh, developed a new leadership team that I think is doing a, a great job. And I think he's uh, focused on, in, on um, uh, ensuring that the, the Bureau isn't biased and that any of the problems from before are addressed. So 
Do you believe that it's inappropriate conduct for an FBI uh, employee to leak politically sensitive information to the public for purposes of impacting political yes. discussion? Yes. And, and uh, I think some leaks, some leaks are, are for maybe for political purposes. Uh, I think probably more leaks are because uh, people handling a case don't like what their su superiors or supervisors are doing and they, and they leak it in order to control uh, people up the chain. And I understand you have some investigations into that type of conduct underway. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, just another couple of quick questions. When did the DOJ and the FBI, if you know, when did the DOJ and the FBI know that the Democratic Party paid for Christopher Steele's dossier, which then served as the foundation for the Carter Page FISA application? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, are you investigating to determine that? Yes. And then lastly, uh, did the Department of Justice, the FBI, and other federal agencies engage in investigative activities before an official investigation was launched in July 2016? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, but that's one of the... Uh, You're also investigating yes. that. All right. Thank you very much, Attorney General. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Barr, thank you for your testimony. Uh, and let me start by just saying thank you. You've had an extraordinarily successful legal career. You didn't have to take this job. And you stepped forward and answered the call yet again, knowing full well that you would be subject to the kind of slanderous treatment, the Kavanaugh treatment, that we have seen of senators impugning your integrity. Uh, and I, for one, am grateful that you answered that call and are leading the Department of Justice both with integrity and fidelity to law. That is what the nation rightly expects of our Attorney General, uh, and I believe you are performing that uh, very ably. I think this hearing today has been quite revealing to anyone watching it, although perhaps not for the reason some of the Democratic senators intended. One thing that's revealing in the discussion and questions that came up, a word that occurred almost none at all is the word Russia. For two and a half years, we heard Democratic senators going on and on and on about Russia collusion. We heard journalists going on and on and on about Russia collusion, alleging, among other things, some using extreme rhetoric, calling the president a traitor. We heard very little of that in this hearing today. Instead, the principal attack that Democratic senators have marshaled upon you concerns this March 27th letter from Robert Mueller. And it's an attack that I want people to understand just how revealing it is. If this is their whole argument, they ain't got nothing. So their argument is as follows. And let me see if I understand it correctly. You initially, when you received the Mueller report, released to Congress and the public a four-page summary of the conclusions. Then on March 27th, Mr. Mueller asked you to release an additional 19 pages, the introduction and summary that he had drafted. And indeed, in the letter, what he says is, quote, I am requesting that you provide these materials to Congress and authorize their public release at this time. And the reason he says it is, to, is that it is that to fully capture the context, nature, and substance of the office's work and conclusion. So you did not release those 19 pages at that time. Instead, a couple of weeks later, you released 448 pages, the entire report, which includes those 19 pages. Do I have that timeline correct? That's right. So their entire argument is... General Barr, you suppressed the 19 pages that are entirely public, that we have, that we can read, that they know every word of it, and their complaint is it was delayed a few weeks. And that was because of your decision not to release the report piecemeal, but rather to release those 19 pages along with the entire 448 pages 
produced by the, the special counsel. Yes. If that is their argument, I have to say that is an exceptionally weak argument. <laughs> Because if you're hiding something, I'll tell you right now, General Barr, you're doing a very lousy job of hiding it. Because the thing that they're suggesting you hid, you released to Congress and the American people. And so if anyone wants to know what's in those 19 pages that are being so breathlessly, oh, Bob Mueller said release the 19 pages, you did. You did it a couple of weeks later. But we can read every word of the 19 pages along with the full report. In your judgment, was the Mueller report thorough? Yes. Did they expend enormous time, energy, and resources investigating and producing that report? Yes. And the Mueller report concluded flat out on the question of Russian collusion, the evidence did not support criminal charges. That's right. And indeed, the Mueller report, if I have these stats right, was compiled by 19 lawyers who were on the team approximately 40 FBI agents, intelligence analysts, forensic accountants, and professional staff. The special counsel issued more than 2,800 subpoenas, nearly 500 search warrants, more than 230 orders for communication records, almost 50 orders authorizing the use of pen registers, 13 requests to foreign government for evidence, and interviewed approximately 500 witnesses. Is that correct? That's right. So we have investigated over and over and over again and the substance of the accusations that have been leveled at the president for two and a half years have magically disappeared. Instead, the complaint is the 19 pages that we can all read that is entirely public could have been released a few weeks earlier. Oh, the calamity. Let me shift to a different topic, a topic that has been addressed already quite a bit. I believe the Department of Justice under the Obama administration was profoundly politicized and was weaponized to go after political opponents of the president. If that is the case, would you agree that politicizing the Department of Justice and weaponizing it to go after your political opponents is an abuse of power? I think it's an abuse of power regardless of who does it. Of course. Yeah. Um, to the best of your knowledge, when did surveillance of the Trump campaign begin? The position today appears to be that it began in July, but I uh, do not know the answer to the question. It is an unusual thing, is it not, for the Department of Justice to be investigating a candidate for president, particularly a candidate from the opposing party of the, of the party in power? Yes. Do we know if the Obama administration investigated any other candidates running for president? I don't know. Do we know if they wiretapped well, any, any I'm sorry, other? I guess they were investigating Hillary Clinton for the, the email. The email Do we know if there were wiretaps? I don't know. Do we know if there were efforts to send investigators in wearing a wire? I don't know. So, General Barr, I would urge you have had remarkable transparency. You promised this committee you would with regard to the Mueller report. You promised this committee and the American people you would release the Mueller report publicly. You have released the report. Anyone can read it. It's right here. I appreciate that transparency. I would ask you to bring the same transparency to this line of questioning about whether, whether and the extent to which the previous administration politicized the Department of Justice, targeted their political rivals, and used law enforcement and intelligence assets to surveil them improperly. Thank you. Uh, so that's the end of the first round. We have votes, I think, at three. I think there are four votes. But what I'd like to do is just, can you go for a few more minutes here? You're okay? Mm -hmm. You're all right? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, Senator Leahy, uh, you're next. We'll Thank do you. three minute second rounds. Uh, Senator Feinstein noted that she felt the FBI would be derelict of duty if it did not investigate after learning from Australia, not the Trump administration, but Australia. The Trump campaign knew Russia had stolen Democratic emails before the victims knew. And they were told the Russians could assist in a campaign with the, uh, with the uh, stolen emails. 
the FBI was right to look into it. That resulted, of course, in 37 indictments. But let me ask you, uh, Mr. Barr, in your March 24 letter, you claim that the lack of evidence of an underlying crime bears on whether the president had the requisite intent to commit obstruction of justice. Well, there are numerous reasons. One, somebody might interfere with investigations. Most critically, any interference may prevent the discovery of an underlying crime. Uh, so interfering, you might not know if there's a crime. But the special counsel did uncover evidence of underlying crimes here, including one that directly implicated the president. And didn't we learn due to the special counsel's investigation that Donald Trump is known as Individual One in the Southern District of New York, directing hush payments as part of a criminal scheme to violate campaign finance laws? That matter was discovered by a special counsel referred to the Southern District of New York. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. And um, we have the Mueller report references a dozen ongoing investigations stemming from the special counsel's investigation. Uh, will you commit that you will not interfere with those investigations? Sorry. Can you say? Do you commit that you will not interfere with the dozen ongoing investigations? I, I will supervise those investigations as Attorney General. We let them reach natural conclusions without interference from the White House. Let me put it that way then. Yes. Thank you. Did you yeah. I, as I said when I was up for confirmation, Part of my responsibility is to make sure there is no political interference in cases. Well, and you testified a number of things, and that's why I'm, I'm double checking uh, you. In the Appropriations Committee, I asked you whether Mr. Mueller expressed any expectation or interest in leaving the obstruction decision to Congress, and you testified he didn't say that to you. Actually, as you said, he did, didn't say that to me. Right. But then he has numerous references in his report to Congress playing a role in deciding whether the president committed obstruction of justice. So I know you testified many times, but that well, I, I, testimony I, I, was not correct. That's not correct. I, I think it is correct. I mean, I don't – he has not said that he conducted the investigation in order to turn it over to Congress. That would be very inappropriate. That's not what the Justice Department well, does. He, he included numerous references report to Congress playing a role um, in it. Volume 2, page 8, conclusion that Congress may apply the obstruction laws to the president's corrupt exercise of the powers of office in accordance with our – constitutional system of justice. Uh, yeah, I don't think Bob, Bob Mueller was suggesting that that uh, the next step here was for him to turn this stuff over for to Congress to act upon. That's not why we conduct grand jury investigations. And President Trump, I am correct in my earlier statement, uh, never allowed anybody to interview him directly under oath. Is that correct? I think that's correct. Even though he said he was ready to testify. Thank you. Well, could I – Sure. A point, a point you raised about the absence of an um, uh, underlying crime. One point I was trying to make earlier is uh, the absence of an underlying crime doesn't necessarily mean that there, were, that there would be other motives for obstruction, although it gets a little bit harder to prove and more speculative as to what those motives might be. But the point I was trying to make earlier is that in the situation of the president, who has constitutional authority to supervise proceedings, if in fact a proceeding was not well-founded, if it was a groundless proceeding, if it was based on false allegations, uh, the president does not have to sit there constitutionally and allow it to run its course. The president could terminate that proceeding and it would not be a corrupt intent because he was being falsely accused and he would be worried about the impact on his administration. That's important because most of the obstruction uh, claims that are being made here or, or episodes 
do involve the exercise of the president's constitutional authority, and we now know that he was being falsely accused. I don't, I don't agree with that, but that's okay. Thank you. General Mueller, I have two questions, if you don't mind. The Mueller, uh, pardon me, General Barr, <laughs> I have two questions. Uh, the Mueller report re describes the reasons why the FBI opened a counterintelligence investigation in July 2016 into Russian election interference. There have been many references to why they would do such a thing. By that date, the Democratic National Committee server had been hacked and Russians had been deemed responsible. Some of the stolen emails had been released by WikiLeaks. A foreign government, the Australian government, had told our FBI that Trump foreign policy aide George Papadopoulos said he'd been contacted by a person on Russia's behalf offering to assist the Trump campaign by releasing information damaging to Hillary Clinton. That was all in the Mueller report. Do you believe that it was an appropriate predicate for opening a counterintelligence investigation to determine whether Russia had targeted people on the Trump campaign to offer hacked information that might impact a presidential election? I'd have to see exactly what the report was from uh, Downer, the Australian Downer, and exactly what he quoted Papadopoulos as saying. But from what you just read, I'm not sure what the correlation was between the Russians having dirt and jumping to the conclusion that that suggested foreknowledge of the hacking. According to Mr. Mueller and his report, this involvement of Trump foreign policy aide George Papadopoulos had something to do with their conclusion. I'd like to ask you a separate uh, issue. It's been reported that on April 16th, you received a waiver to participate in the investigation and litigation of the so-called 1MDB matter. This is an investigation into a Malaysian company for alleged money laundering. According to news reports, as part of this investigation, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of New York is investigating whether a Malaysian national illegally donated to the Trump inaugural committee with money taken from 1MDB. You sought a waiver to participate in this matter even though your former law firm, Kirkland & Ellis, represents an entity involved in the investigation, namely Goldman Sachs. How many waivers have you received to allow you to participate in matters or investigations involving Trump businesses, the Trump campaign, or the Trump inaugural committee? None. You did seek a waiver in this case? I, actually, the impetus, as I recall, and People should jump me if I'm wrong, but it di didn't come from me. I was asked to seek a waiver in this case. Do you, do you see the problem if the issue is whether or not a money laundering operation in Malaysia is in sending money to the Trump inaugural committee that as Attorney General of the United States, you may not want to in involve yourself in this? I, well, no, I don't. I don't because I was not involved with the inaugural Why committee. would you seek a waiver then to participate in this? The waiver was, I guess the conflict was not because of any relationship I had to the inaugural committee, which I didn't. No, it's the Goldman Sachs, your former client no, it's, Kirkland it's, Ellis. No, it's Kirkland Ellis, the law firm. Right, and their yeah. client Goldman Sachs. I just don't understand why you would touch that hot stove. Well, that's a good. You sought the waiver, that's why I'm asking the question. The, attorney, uh, the uh, criminal division act actually asked me to get a waiver because of the importance of this investigation overall. I was requested by the uh, criminal division. I didn't seek it. I, the impetus did not come from me. And who would that be that made that recommendation to you? I am told it was the criminal division. Mr. Benchkowski? Uh, yeah, it would, uh, he was the head of the criminal division, but before, apparently they discussed it with the career ethics official and they made the recommendation. Thank you. Uh, Senator Whitehouse. Uh, Mr. Bart, a couple of timing questions. You said that on um, March 5th, uh, Mr. Mueller came to you and said that he was going to uh, not make a decision on obstruction, leave that to you. He didn't, he didn't say he was leaving it to me that he was not going to make an obstruction. Right. Uh, on March 24th, you set out the letter uh, describing your decision. Somewhere between March 5th and March 24th, you made that decision. When was that? Uh, we started talking about it uh, on March 5th, and uh, 
there had already been a lot of discussions prior to March 5th involving the deputy, the uh, principal associate deputy in the Office of Legal Counsel that had dealings with uh, the special counsel's office. So they had knowledge of, of a number of the episodes and some of the thinking uh, of the special counsel's office. So right after March 5th, we started discussing what the implications of this were and how we would view, how we and you made the decision when uh i probably on sunday the uh, 24th that was the day the letter came out yes you we made the decision didn't make the decision until the letter came out you must no, have told no. somebody how to write the letter you couldn't when did you actually decide that there was no obstruction the 24th okay um when did you get the first draft of the Mueller report? The, the, the first, it wasn't a draft, we got the final. The first version of it that you saw? Well, the only version of it I saw. Okay, was, the only version of it you saw. When you do first The 22nd. Yeah, the 22nd. Now, you told Senator Harris that you made your decision on the obstruction charge, you and Rosenstein, based on the Mueller report. That's do I correctly right. infer that you made that decision then between the 22nd and the 24th? Well, we had had a lot of discussions about it before the 22nd, but the final decision was made on the 24th. And you didn't. We had more. We had more than two and a half days until the 22nd. We had more than two and a half days to consider this. OLC had already done a lot of a lot of thinking about some of these issues even before uh, the we got the report, and even before March 5th, they had been in regular contact. Uh, the uh, department had been in regular contact with uh, Mueller's people and understood. You know, so they were, the OLC was looking into the Mueller investigation while it was going on and witting of the evidence that they were gathering on obstruction uh, the, before you saw the Mueller. I, it, my understand, you know, I wasn't there, okay, but my understanding is that the deputy and the, uh, what we call the PADAG, the principal associate deputy, were in regular contact with the Mueller's team and we're getting briefings on evidence and uh, some of their thinking and some of the issues. Did and they know enough to know? And OLC what was brought into some of those discussions. Did they know enough to know what might be, need to be redacted before they saw the 322 No, we did, the problem we had is we could not identify the 6E material when when the report came over. We needed the help of Bob Mueller's team to do that. And lastly, can you assure me that nothing related to obstruction or the Mueller report was discussed at your Office of Legal Counsel brown bag lunch on June 27th? No, nothing about what? Nothing about the obstruction issue and nothing about the Mueller report itself was discussed when you had a brown bag lunch on June 27th with OLC? Um, yeah, I mean, we didn't discuss uh, anything having to do with the Mueller report or Mueller's eventual position on obstruction. Did you discuss your obstruction memo? I, I forgot if it was then, but I think I've previously said that uh, I, I mentioned that uh, I had a memo and, and was sending it to uh, you, you, have not, you have not yet said that it was mentioned at this OLC. I, I, don't, I don't think, well, it was not at the brown bag lunch, no. My time is up. Okay, uh, we're, the vote has started. Uh, we're going to split the time between Senator Klobuchar and Senator Blumenthal. We'll try to go, they won't hold the vote open too long, but let's start with Senator Klobuchar and see if we can do this. Thank you. <laughs> Um, Mr. Attorney General, on April 27th, President Trump stated, Mueller, I assume, for $35 million, he checked my taxes and he checked my financials. Yeah, Is that accurate? Did the special counsel review the president's taxes and the Trump organization's financial statements? I don't know. Can you find out if I ask later in a written question? Uh, I, yes, or you could ask Bob Mueller when he comes here. Okay, well, I'll do that too, but I think I'll also ask you. Um, and then obviously we would want to see them as underlying information. 
during my earlier questions, we went through a number of actions by the president that the special counsel looked into. Uh, my point was that we should be looking into the totality of the evidence and the pattern that the report develops. On page 13 of volume two, the special counsel instructs that we do something similar. The report says, and this is a quote, circumstantial evidence that illuminates intent may include a pattern of potentially obstructive acts. On this point, the report cites three U.S. cases, um, U.S. v. Frankenhauser, or Frankhauser, U.S. v. Arnold, and U.S. v. Sintolo. Do you agree that obstruction law allows for intent to be informed by a pattern of potentially obstructive acts? Well, intent eventually has to be est uh, established by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Obviously, uh, some inferences can be drawn from circumstantial evidence that can contribute to an overall determination of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. But that's one of the problems with this whole approach uh, that's suggested in the uh, the uh, uh, special counsel's report, which is it, it is uh, trying to determine the subjective intent of a facially uh, lawful act, and it permits a lot of uh, uh, selectivity on the part of the prosecutors, and, and, and uh, it's been shot down in a number of other contexts. So one of the reasons uh, that we are very uh, uh, skeptical of this approach is that uh, uh, in you mean instruction you and, cases you and Director Mueller or you the Justice the Department? Justice Department uh, is that uh, in, in this kind of situation where you have a facially innocent act and uh, a fa you know that's authorized by the Constitution. Uh, okay. I just it, it's hard to, it's it's hard to establish beyond a reasonable doubt that it's corrupt. Okay, I just want to get in just a few more questions like Senator Whitehouse did. At your confirmation hearing, you testified that in the absence of a violation of a statute, the president would be accountable politically for abusing the pardon power. How do you reconcile your suggestion that political accountability is available when the administration is refusing to comply with subpoenas and asserting executive privilege to stand in the way of that very accountability? As to a pardon? No, this was about in your confirmation hearing, you said in the absence of a violation of a statute, the president would be, quote, accountable politically, end quote, for abusing the pardon power if he did. But, basically. but your question really is abusing any power, not just the pardon power? Mm -hmm. is, that, is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, president. I mean, it's hard to evaluate that. Presidents have been held accountable before, and, and as have other office holders. Okay. Last question. Are the president's actions detailed in this report consistent with his oath of office and the requirement in the Constitution that he take care that the laws be faithfully executed? Is, is what consistent with that? I said, are the president's actions detailed in the report consistent with his oath of office and the requirement in the Constitution that he take care that the laws be faithfully executed? Uh, well, the, the evidence in the report is conflicting and, and there's different evidence and, and they, don't, they don't come to a determination as to uh, how they're coming down on it. And so you made that decision. Yes, and and as as you know, if, if it's if we, we all right, we we got okay, two Thank minutes you. left, Senator Blumenthal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Attorney General Barr, I wonder if you could tell us about the conversation between yourself and Bob Mueller shortly after your summary was issued. He called you. No, I called him. What prompted you to call him? The letter. Your letter, or his, his, le letter. his letter. His letter. So you called him. Yeah. And how long did the conversation last? I don't know, maybe uh, 10, 15 minutes. There were multiple witnesses in the room. It was on the speaker phone. Who was in the room? Uh, among others, the deputy attorney general was in the room. Anyone else? Uh, several other people who had been working on the project. Members of your staff? Yes, and, and the deputy staff. And as best you can recall, 
in the language that was used? Who, who said what to whom? Um, I said, Bob, what's with the letter? You know, why don't you just pick up the phone and call me if there's an issue? And uh, he uh, said that they were concerned about the way the media was playing this and felt that it was important to get out the summaries, which they felt would put their work in proper context uh, and uh, avoid some of the confusion that was emerging. And I asked him if he uh, felt that my letter was misleading or inaccurate. And he said, no, that the press, uh, he felt that the press uh, coverage was, and it was, and that a, a completer, a, a more complete picture of his thoughts and the context and so forth would, would deal with that. And uh, I, I suggested that I would rather just get the whole report out than just putting out stuff uh, seriatim and, and piecemeal and uh, but I said I would think about it some more and uh, the next day I put out a letter that made it clear that no one should read the March 24th letter as a summary of the overall report and that a full account of Bob's uh, Mueller's thinking um, w was going to be in the report and everyone could, would have access to but there's nothing in Robert Mueller's letter to you about the press. His complaint to you is about your characterization of the report, correct? Well, the letter speaks for itself. It does. And in fact, in response to your question, why not just pick up the phone? This letter was an extraordinary act. A career prosecutor rebuking the Attorney General of the United States, memorializing in writing, right? I, I know of no other instance of that happening. Do you? Uh, well, I, I don't consider Bob at this stage a career prosecutor. He's had a career as a prosecutor. Well, he's he was a very head, eminent he, prosecutor. He was the head of the FBI for 12 years. Um, he's a career he's had a, he's had a law enforcement career, yeah. professional. Right. Yep. I know of no other instance of. But he was also political appointee, and he was a political appointee with me at the Department of Justice. I don't, I, you know, it, the letter's a bit snitty, and I think it was probably written by one of his staff people. Did you make a memorandum of your conversation? Huh? Did you make a memorandum? No, I didn't. Or make did a anyone memorandum. else? What? Um, did anyone, either you or anyone on your staff, memorialize your conversation with Robert Mueller? Yes. Who did that? Uh, there were notes taken of, of the call. May we have those notes? No. Why not? Why should you have them? I'll tell you, we got to end this, but I'm going to write a letter to Mr. Mueller, and I'm going to ask him, is there anything you said about that conversation he disagrees with? And if there is, he can come and tell us. Right. So the hearing is now over. And if, if Senator I may Blumenthal, just... I promise you that if there's any... Mr. Mueller will have a chance to make sure that the conversation relayed by Attorney General Barr is accurate. And I'm going to give him a chance to correct anything you said that he finds misleading or inaccurate, and that will be it. Okay. Five seconds. Attorney General Barr, I uh, just want to thank you for your service to our country, and I especially today, want to thank you for your civility in your composure uh, amidst what has been a needlessly and unfairly hostile environment. Your professionalism has been remarkable. I'm grateful. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, my point of view is pretty interesting, and it got off in a ditch every now and then, but generally speaking, the committee did pretty good, and this is what democracy is all about. Thank you for being our Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
You've been watching live coverage of Attorney General William Barr's testimony to the Senate Judiciary Committee. The hearing just wrapped up. I'm Emily Heil. I'm joined in studio by Eugene Scott, a writer for The Fix, the Post Political Analysis blog. Eugene, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So the hearing closed with just a little bit of drama there over sure. the transcript of this phone call. It sounds mm -hmm. like there's more to be uh, heard on this. But tell me, what do you think were the standout moments from this hearing? Well, the closing, for one, certainly uh, is something I think uh, people who've stayed uh, abreast this long will remember. I think it will be an example of what many Americans perceive as a lack of transparency uh, from this administration, uh, not trying to make records available, information available that can help uh, people increase their confidence in the integrity of this administration um, in terms of trying to figure out if anything, uh, you know, in, criminal or uh, just suspect was done, uh, Barr did not leave people with ideas or the confidence that uh, he would make things available and, uh, you know, solve some of the uh, chaos and confusion that we're seeing a lot of people um, have about what may have happened between uh, the Trump campaign and Russia when it comes to interference in the 2016 election. Um, but I found quite a few um, other exchanges very interesting. One specifically between uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar and uh, the taxes related to Donald Trump, which is something that we've seen a lot of Democratic lawmakers um, continue to express concern about. Uh, Barr said that uh, he could not say whether or not uh, Mueller, Mueller had revi reviewed Trump's taxes mm -hmm. uh, before he made a, a conclusion about um, just uh, inappropriate behavior or interaction between the Trump campaign um, and uh, Russia. And that's been a major concern of many lawmakers and voters who want to know more about Trump's finances. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What did you make of uh, the Attorney General at the very end there describing this letter that we've been talking about all day? It's been the focus of a lot of this hearing. Um, this letter from, from Mueller uh, complaining about uh, Barr's characterizing of his work. Um, and <laughs> just at the closing of this hearing, uh, Barr called that letter just a little bit snitty. Yeah, yeah. What, what did you make of that? Well, you know, there's been much made about the friendship between Mueller and Barr and what uh, the handling of this uh, letter and uh, report could do to it um, because both men, uh, their legacies are on the line and the integrity of what they do professionally is, uh, um, you know, being questioned and will go down in history. And so I saw Barr as trying to um, defend his work and his ethics and his team. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that Mueller did not appear to be pleased with how Barr characterized his findings. Um, and as a result, um, some of the conclusions that people have made about Mueller um, in terms of his relationship with the Trump administration and his review of their um, behavior in the past couple of years. Um, Barr, you know, this is not the last we're going to hear about him. And so many of these uh, uh, lines of question coming, questioning coming from Democratic lawmakers were really about the integrity of um, his professionalism. And, and so, the process. And the process and his ability to do what it is that the American people uh, expect their attorney general to be able to do. And so I thought that jab was him trying to cover for himself. Interesting. Now we've had correspondents up on Capitol Hill covering the hearing. Let's go live to the Post, Rhonda Colvin. Rhonda? Emily Eugene, uh, for me, the takeaways today, it, this hearing was another moment where we saw the partisan differences about this investigation. On the Republicans' end, we heard from Lindsey Graham at the beginning when he said, for me, it's done. So it was really for the Republicans done before it even began stuck to the questions about the Russian interference. They stuck to questions about the Steele dossier. They did not really get into uh, obstruction of justice question like the Democrats did. During the hearing, uh, shortly after he uh, questioned Barr, we spoke to Senator Blumenthal, who told us he was disappointed with the Attorney General's performance today. I think the Attorney General was unfit when he was first appointed. That is what I said at the time. I voted against him. He has lost credibility within the Department of Justice and, in fact, with the American people. So I think that he has an obligation to correct the record and tell the American people whether he has had conversations with the White House about the ongoing investigation spawned by the Mueller investigation, which he refused to do, saying he couldn't recall. He must recall and his failure to give 
a straightforward answer, I think, speaks volumes. Interesting, that moment that he just talked about where, uh, where Barr wouldn't or couldn't say whether he'd had contact with the White House about any of these sort of spin-off probes. Right. That was a very pointed moment. Any other pointed moments that you noticed this afternoon? Yeah, that came, you know, from the questioning uh, from Kamala Harris, right? And I think a lot of people were paying attention to her entire questioning because obviously they're looking at her regarding 2020 and wondering what she would do uh, regarding so many of the concerning things that people have seen come out of this White House if she were successful enough to uh, win the Democratic nomination and move forward with replacing Trump uh, in the Oval Office. Uh, and so that was uh, fascinating. But also I thought um, Blumenthal um, couldn't say whether or not um, uh, he was questioning Barr, who could not say whether or not uh, he had had any conversations with the White House about ongoing investigations, which I thought we mentioned earlier. And mm -hmm. I think um, that's really important for people to uh, keep in mind because uh, there's been some concern and doubt about what uh, Barr's job exactly is. Is he the president's attorney or is mm -hmm. he the attorney for the American people? Mm -hmm. um, and his uh, lack of... Uh, recollect, being able to recollect correctly, uh, recall whether or not he's been in these conversations with President Trump, I think will be concerning for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And Kamala Harris, too, had a moment where she uh, pressed him to a moment where he couldn't recall conversations with the White House as well. She was asking, you know, did uh, did Trump or did the administration suggest you open an investigation to someone? And right. there, there was sort of a pause and she said, well, you know, did they hint? Did they, did they infer? You know, so mm -hmm. that was a, a moment for her as well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, was this sort of a moment for 2020 hopefuls, and, and did she or did uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar or Senator Cory Booker, did they have their moment? I think so, and I mean, I think that was something that was really um, important to get out of bar or, you know, attempt to, because we know that this is a president who people within his administration have said uh, can be a bit vindictive and really zoom in on people that he has trouble with, um, with the hope of doing harm or, or you know, creating some type of discomfort, um, including possibly Democratic lawmakers like Kamala Harris, like Cory Booker, like Amy Klobuchar. Um, and so, uh, what the value of that to the American people, I think, uh, you know, Kamala Harris was trying to get to the bottom of and try to uh, reveal or expose the Trump administration if that actually happened for the harm they could um, cause people, uh, you know, who may be under investigation for reasons that just are not, um, you know, uh, fair or respectful or just. I think with uh, Klobuchar, Booker, and uh, Harris, when we think about um, some of the polling that has come out this week, uh, neither of them is doing as well, I would guess, as they would like to be doing. They were right? looking for a breakout moment. Absolutely, and it's really important because, you know, for many people, um, these hearings are when they were introduced to Kamala Harris. Uh, mm -hmm. We had some polling that came out, I think, like last September, that said about like 50% of the American public did not even know who she was. And so it's these type of moments that go viral online that can be used in, you know, these um, campaign ads that help people get an idea of who is Klobuchar, who is Cory Booker, who is Kamala Harris, and what can they do uh, if given the chance to represent the American people in the Oval Office. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the the attorney general may be in front of a House Judiciary Committee tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, they, the, the, that committee has said that they want a staff attorney to question the attorney general. Um, what threads, it's not clear whether he's going to be there, what threads do you think will get pulled in that hearing tomorrow, maybe that have been previewed today, if the yeah. attorney general does in fact uh, attend that hearing? Yeah, I definitely think that concerns about investigations, uh, whether or not the White House has instructed Barr to open investigations into people um, or, you know, teams or organizations that um, Barr did not make clear today. Um, perhaps just more about what Barr just does not know about the report um, mm -hmm. related to what Mueller didn't ask, specifically taxes. Mm. Um, and so what people are trying to do, I think, uh, on the left, is trying to reveal just how much Barr's letter and uh, summary of the report just cannot be trusted by forcing him to reveal how little he actually knew mm -hmm. um, and just how perhaps his own uh, biases may have led him to protect the president. For more on that House hearing, um, let's go back up to Capitol Hill to post Joyce Coe, who's looking ahead at that hearing. Joyce. 
Yeah, Emily, well, as you know, the Democrats hold majority on the House side, so they can play their cards a bit differently than the Democrats here on the Senate side. Uh, Congressman Jerry Nadler has not really shied away from using his power as the committee chairman of House Judiciary. You'll remember he was the chairman who made that sweeping request for the tens of thousands of documents um, of the, the individuals and the organizations surrounding President Trump. One of those individuals, Don McGahn, who we heard uh, his name tossed around a lot today during the hearing. He was a big player in the possible obstruction episodes outlined by Robert Mueller. Now, one thing to mention is that this hearing might not happen at all. There is a standoff right now between Democrats, uh, specifically Chairman Nadler and the Department of Justice over the terms of tomorrow's hearing. Um, there are two things that Nadler wants of William Barr tomorrow, one of those being he wants uh, the staff attorneys, as you said, to question Barr instead of the committee members themselves. And in addition to that, he wants to see the unredacted portions of that report, two things that are not sitting well with William Barr as he has threatened to not show up at the committee. Now, Democrats today behind closed doors, they discussed sort of their response to all of this. They have discussed possibly holding William Barr in contempt of Congress if he doesn't show up tomorrow. So there's a lot that could happen between now and tomorrow's scheduled hearing. We'll have to wait and see what happens. But one thing that we can expect, Emily, is that if Barr does show up, there could be some fireworks. We will stay posted. Thanks, Joyce. I'm actually told that uh, Senator Graham was asked uh, after the hearing today, he came to the microphones and he finished with the same sentiment that he started with um, at the beginning uh, in his opening statement, and he said, it's over. Mm -hmm. So that was indicating that he's not going to be calling uh, Mueller to testify, that as far as the judiciary chairman is concerned, it's over. Mm -hmm. um, so now, Eugene, I'm gonna give you the honor of giving us your parting thoughts on this. After a whole yeah. day of testimony, what's your what's your last thought? Well, I think uh, those, sta those last words from Graham uh, are a reminder that it is over for one side of the aisle. I think in not allowing a mother to come forward and answer questions from uh, lawmakers on both sides of the aisle, he is putting uh, Mueller and Trump, who Graham obviously supports, in the position to have not uh, to not have the cloud as removed as possible uh, from this investigation as he would like. And I think the 2020 candidates on the uh, dais are going to go ahead and move forward with questions and, and campaigns um, that that point to that. Thanks so much, Eugene. I'm Emily Heil. On behalf of my colleagues at The Washington Post, I want to thank you for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to The Washington Post to receive notifications on the Mueller investigation. And please be sure to watch again tomorrow. Our live coverage begins again at 8.30 a.m. if Barr does indeed appear for his, for his House session.